a duvid here. <coughs> Pardon me, we are live, starting a few minutes early. Haven't done a stream in uh, sure. <coughs> quite a while, and uh, want to advance some of my research. So basically, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to read through uh, my uh, essays. I have eleven essays that I've uh, published now. So uh, I'm going to read through my essays. I'm going to discuss the current state of my research. And uh, specifically today, I'm going to focus on self and identity formation, my, my last essay. But I'm going to start by uh, going through all my essays and how it relates to uh, the multiple truth hypothesis in the last essay on uh, the self. So uh, John, yes, yeah, so no, no chance I'll mention. I'm trying to stay serious. Um, from uh, Mishle, I think it's one seven Bini Al Talik Bederak Itam, uh, the Bub of Tune. I, I've chanted quite a few times. Bini, Bini, Bini Al Talik Bederak Itam. Just saying, my son, don't go in the way of the times. So I'm going to focus on my research, my studies, and wisdom that lasts generations, not just uh, temporary uh, wisdom. And uh, I'm trying to be exhaustive, like a streamer like Luke, uh, Charles Moskowitz. Charles Moskowitz has written over 30 books, a lot of authors. I want to write scientific paper quality stuff, and I actually want to advance new research. So I'm trying to be exhaustive. I've done a whole bunch of research. I'm writing some essays. And uh, you know, my first book is probably going to be on the multiple truth hypothesis. So why don't I get uh, started? And if uh, I also did an AMA, so if anyone wants to uh, ask me questions, I'll, I'll uh, answer questions between uh, essays. So you can see I put uh, my essays here on the chess server. I have on my Twitter also. So, uh, let me just, yeah, I don't even think anyone's watching. So, you know, unfortunately, Duvid is so unpopular that, you know, we'll see. I actually have, you know, over 2,000 subs. So, we'll see who, who, uh, tunes in. So, I started, uh, Review, uh, to post my blog, but it looked like I had more success on the chess server. So, I, you know, I published, uh, 11, 11 blog posts and, the first one on my birthday, March 31st. So uh, I've been uh, almost five months now, 11 essays, about one every two weeks. So I sent Jennifer the link. You don't need to join right away. I mean, you can if you want, but I'm going to try to uh, read some of my papers, and then I'm going to go over my notes again on identity <laughs> formation if you want to, I, I sent you the link. If you want, you could join. But uh, I just want to uh, um, forward my own thoughts. So on uh, the essays I've been writing and the future of my research and kind of tie it together so I could make progress on uh, my book. So here is my folder of my writings. So let me start with the very first one that I did which was the hero's journey. And uh, my essays have gotten longer and you know, more focused on uh, various subjects. There's the one on identity. Just my notes for my last one are, is over, is like almost already 15 pages. So, uh, you know, like I'm moving forward to writing larger, more substantial stuff. Stephen James, thanks for tuning in. Um, okay, the hero's journey in music and chanting. So this was my first essay because I thought it was more popular. It still might be more popular uh, just talking about my analysis of music. I still might do some streams analyzing music. I got to start streaming more to uh, get back an audience, like a, like a, just a handful of people probably going to watch this. And uh, I'm going to try to start doing more regular streams with the, you know, the politics or speaking to people is difficult to, you know, everyone's controversial so to find people that really want to talk about ideas um so we'll see so this was my very first essay the hero's journey 
and music and chanting. For the last few years, when we can review with Church of Entropy, I've opened the program with a chant, usually Hebrew or Sanskrit, but more recently analyzing popular music. music. Along with the chant, I've given the translation, meaning, histories, and use of the chant in prayer services. Starting week in review with a chant to help the show's focus on consciousness, science, and spirituality. With the encouragement of Church of Entropy, I've decided to turn some of my thoughts into a series of articles on the deeper meaning of music, congregational chanting, and music's relationship to consciousness, specifically focusing on the relationship of music to the monomyth, the hero's journey. So actually, this is the only essay I've written on music. The, the next 10 ones had nothing to do with music, but uh, this is a subject I hope to return to, and it may, it probably won't be part of uh, my book on multiple truth hypotheses, but a topic I hope to return to, and probably something I could pump out short essays quickly if I had an audience on or demand for. For those familiar with Jewish music, the majority of Hebrew synagogue chants have a four-part structure meant to align with the four-letter name of God, Tetragrammaton, the yud heh vav -Heh, which musically meant means a four-part structure, A, B, C, B, with the second part repeating, serving to not only add pleasant musical accompaniment to the prayers, but also facilitate a meditation on the divine name, the spiritual journey understood to be starting in the material realm in part A, connecting to the heavenly realm in part B, and then entering the heavenly realm in part C, and returning to the connected material and heavenly realms by repeating part B. In the similar way, I've noted the structure of the Hare Krishna. Temple tunes are three-part ABC, very similar to Hebrew chants, having a mostly Western audience unfamiliar with Judaism in order to express this concept. I've expound explanatory power in the hero's journey <coughs> Pardon me. as laid out by Joseph Campbell, 1949. Campbell's monomyth has a general structure of departure, initiation, and return as a framework for the narrative arc of all heroes, myths, and legends. Similarly, majority of music has a simple three-part structure that mirrors the hero's journey, utilizing techniques preferred to in music theory as theme and variation and distance and resolution. I found this hero's journey extremely useful to help explain the meaning behind music and has allowed me to even analyze the direction of popular music, including the degeneration of Western culture from the hero's journey to the loser's journey and the general love song to the lust song. In this essay, essay I will explain the connection of the hero's journey to the musical structure and a deeper analysis to the meaning of music and hope in the future to continue with a series of essays and YouTube videos analyzing various songs and eras of music to see how the hero's journey, although always the same in structure, has changed over time, mirroring larger changes in society. But first, a further spiritual note on Hasidic philosophy important to the interpretation and meaning of music. The Baal Shem Tov taught a process of self-improvement similar to the hero's journey, consisting of submission, separation, and sweetness. The Siddic teaching follows the basic laws of repentance as laid out by the early sages, consisting of recognition of sinful behavior, regret and amends for the sin, and reframing from committing the sin in future similar situations. However, the Kabbalistic interpretations of repentance is more intricate as Kabbalah proposes, in addition to making amends a rectification of society through the three-part process of submission, recognition of sinful behavior, separation, avoidance, avoiding the associations that's in situation that elicit sinful behavior to a personal transformation and sweetening, post-personal transformation, being able to re-enter re the previous situation in society at large without sinning and transforming, rectifying the world. For Hasidim, music is a tool to help people transform ourselves and take part in the self-improvement process. Due to Weekend Review's audience being largely unfamiliar with Jewish theology, I express this concept in more general terms of Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, which in reality is almost the exact same Kabbalistic concept. Campbell's Hero's Journey has 17 parts divided into three main sections, departure, initiation, and return, further divided into 17 steps. The first step, departure, consisting of call to adventure, refusal of call, supernatural aid, crossing of first threshold, belly of the whale. Second part, initiation, road of trials, meeting with goddess, woman of te as temptress, atonement with the father, apotheosis, ultimate boon. And third part, return, refusal of the return, magic flight, rescue from without, crossing the return threshold, master of two worlds, freedom to live. 
for the sake of musical interpretation, only the three main parts of departure, initiation, and return are important, and detail of the intermediate steps are somewhat fluid and laid out with some variation among scholars, usually in a circular form showing a repetitive process in the hero's journey. But the main key to the hero's journey is the hero starts in society facing all the challenges that the rest of humanity faces, then is separated from society and given some sort of special knowledge or ability, allowing the hero to eventually triumphantly return to and transform society. Hence, the hero is a hero because the hero changes and transforms the struggles most of humanity succumbs to, but first must be transformed into a hero through the journey consisting of the first two steps of departure and initiation in order to help deliver humanity from the common challenges facing us. The hero's journey provides a structure and generic process, hypothesizing that all myth can be understood to take this form, hence the monomyth. All stories develop characters, and the narrative arc will follow some form of the structure of the hero's journey. Got Aquarian TV, thanks for tuning in. If you want to uh, talk a little bit, you're welcome to hop on. I'll uh, even put uh, the link in the chat. So I'll be doing an AMA, but I'll be going essay through essay, hopefully, and uh, talking about how this is going to lead into, hopefully, my book. Back to musical structure and how the hero's journey fits into the narrative arc of music. Without getting too much into musical theory, which I hope to develop over a series of more in-depth articles and videos with examples, musical compositions also have generic structures that all music can be broken down into. The simplest form of music is one melody repeated. Many simple songs, chants, synagogue music take the simplest form with the melody repeated throughout all the song's verses. Music takes this, uh, uh, the next simplest form is the minuet that has two parts, A, B, form, usually with B being a variation of A, with simple changes, usually a higher key. The AB form is especially popular for congregational chanting and in popular music with lyrical verse and chorus where the B part is the repetitive chorus. Society's most popular songs have this verse and chorus structure, some simple AB, but most with a three-part ABC structure is building up in two parts to the chorus utilizing the two main musical techniques of theme and variation and consonance, dissonance and resolution. So the A part introduces the theme that represents the introduction of the hero, normalizes potentially any of us and the normative struggle we all face. The B part of variation on the theme introduces musically dissonance on the A part to represent the departure and initiation, the struggle needed to turn someone ordinary into a hero, and the C chorus is the return and resolution where the hero reemerges triumphant, usually the chorus. Musically, this is done through techniques of melody, rhythm, and harmony, tone, time signatures, and more, as the hero's theme is introduced in A, and in B is slightly changed, usually in a way that increases dissonance, and then the dissonance is resolved in part C, usually in a higher key. In congregational chanting, the congregation is literally taken on the journey, as most people on trained in singing have a hard time hitting the high notes, but together with the congregation getting carried along, and with the congregation, will sing together the high part in C, hence being taken along for the journey by the power of congregational chanting, collectively resolving each other's dissonance and prevailing over collective struggles together. Here I laid out the framework of my theory of the hero's journey music, taking from the Kabbalist general music theory and using the language of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. Like the monomyth can be used to understand all narratives, the three-part structure of the hero's journey, departure, initiation, and return, can also be used to understand all songs. Much Hasidic music has no words and is purely a meditation on the tetragrammaton, but a majority of popular music has lyrics, verse, and chorus to connect the narrative of the hero's journey to the music itself. Over the next few essays, I will analyze some popular music using the hero's journey structure. Also, I will advance my hypothesis of the decline and degeneration of Western culture in what refer, uh, in what, sorry. I refer to as the transformation of the hero's journey to the loser's journey and the transformation of the love song to the lust song. So actually, I didn't do that. And as I said, uh, I didn't end up doing any further uh, essays or work on that. Um, I did do the Ask the Rabbi um, number... Sorry, just looking here. Um, I asked the rabbi number 13, meaning 
of Jewish music and uh, Hasidic uh, philosophy and, and asked me anything and covered some of this perspective from the Jewish angle. So uh, if people want more of that, so hopefully, you know, I'm going to try to start streaming more. Maybe I, I will do this analysis of uh, the hero's journey to, uh, you know, to further that. So, uh, uh, Aquarian TV, Liam. So maybe we still haven't talked. Uh, see you on Adam Green or something like that. But may, hopefully we'll talk at some point in the future uh, about uh, spiritual topics. So let's jump to my next essay. So you know, just, just interesting thinking about this. That uh, my first essay I wrote on. Um, music and then i didn't end up doing anything in music so hopefully that's something i'll return to um i've still been analyzing songs on week in review um you may be at some point if someone wanted to uh, or myself you do like clip all these uh music from like 160 episodes of week in review and uh you try to make a compilation and then think about it and structure that uh, that would be you know, something interesting, I have to see my value proposition if there's an audience that's interested in that or someone that I speak to about music. Um, Oswald in the chat had given me John David Ebert's contact information and said that Ebert, uh, you remembered and would probably talk to me again. So maybe um, I'll reach out, you know, at some point to John David Ebert and we'll have a conversation. You know, Ebert, uh, I interviewed on my channel and he worked for the Joseph Campbell Foundation, uh, you know, popular streamer and uh, author. So uh, we'll see about that. Uh, you know, a lot of plans. So I'm trying to get more into uh, streaming. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of connections to music. And, you know, the hero's journey is a basic format. And, you know, astrology, you'll see in all my papers, I usually take a long historical arc of uh you know, the origin of ideas and how it's transformed over time into uh, you're different uh, to the form and it built on. And, uh, you know, so music is a large sign of the change of culture. And a lot of times, like, you know, what, what is an error epoch uh, most sign? It's probably the music. You know, they say that, uh, you know, what was it like to be alive in the 80s or the 60s? or uh, you, uh, 100 years ago, uh, you could learn the history, the names, the ideas, uh, but to a large extent, the music of the time signifies the time. So if uh, you know the popular songs of today or the 60s, if people grew up, they know those songs, they, they mean something to them. And if you didn't grow up with them, you're from a different era. Um, so, so you could connect like Kabbalistically uh, ages, astrology and various things music is very related uh, but uh, i didn't go any further with that so it's ironic my first essay i said i was going to do more on that and didn't do uh, more so uh, you know that's something interesting to look forward to in the future your know, time is limited but uh, you know we'll see and we'll see what type of uh, reaction a lot of this is uh, you know really the only person i'm working with is church of entropy jennifer so uh, and she's not that musical so you kind of need positive feedback and uh, people to work together with. So uh, right now, basically, with the majority of my feedback is from Jennifer. So I've been focusing on multiple truth hypothesis, science, and consciousness. But if I get more feedback on the music, I'd be more likely to produce more content on that. So this was my second essay um, on the origins of the multiple truth hypothesis, which uh, is what my book is going to be on. And, you know, so this was my second essay. I didn't even put this on uh, the chess server. And uh, you, this was still when the essays were first getting started. And the only people looking at it were probably like week in review readers, uh, watchers. So, uh, you know, just putting out some of my thoughts. Uh, all of these we went over on week in review, all these essays. 
Um, but, uh, you know, I'm going to try to go through all of them in this stream today and uh, you know, explain how these are fitting into a greater whole and will be part of my book. And it's largely also for myself just as a working stream. And, you know, so it's an AMA. So, uh, you know, if, if someone wants to join intermittently between papers, that's fine or ask me something. Origins and basics of the multiple truth hypothesis. I've been mentioning talking about the elusive multiple truth hypothesis for a few years now, but an exact explanation still eludes me as I have much higher hopes for the idea than the current state of my ability to express. MTH derives from my personal mental struggles and in interfaith combined with a lifetime of thinking about paradoxes and challenges in science, mathematics, politics, religion, culture, spirituality, cosmology, eschatology, and more. In order to clarify my thoughts and share with others, I will briefly describe the origins, why I felt compelled to forward the multiple truth hypothesis, a basic understanding of what uh, MTH is, and the practical uses of MTH to understand complex ideas in a world full of apparent contradictions. Biographically, I'm self-identified as a Hasidic Jew, spent many years of my life studying in Yeshiva in Jerusalem and New York City, both Talmud and Hasidus. But I always had a wide array of intellectual interest, including a love of physics and mathematics, including formal study at university originally intended to prepare for medical school, the path of my father, a medical doctor. I was always a voracious reader. My whole life, everywhere I go, I carry books with me. I've always had a large and constantly growing library with a hunger for all forms of knowledge in basically any subject. The largest factor in my thought is my identity as a Hasidic Jew, something hard for others to understand, leading to constant debates and conversations, both friendly and unfriendly, about theological and religious issues, from evolution to proof of God, proof of the soul, Zionism, the Holocaust, scripture, Jewish sectarianism, as well as more spiritual topics like the nature of prayer, miracles, transcendence, messianic movements, eschatology, eventually leading me to interfaith. Due to my large number of affiliations and pursuits, it has always been difficult to hold everything together, uh, usually not even mentioning most of my interest to family, friends, and colleagues who share only a few common interests. Many of these pursuits have been the main focus of my life and energies for a brief period of time, sometimes relegated to the back of my mind for years. After about 10 years of living as a Hasidic Jew, I became formally involved in various forms of communal leadership, including event organization promotion, community liaison, and interfaith. Interfaith is the most powerful motivation in the creation of my multiple truth hypothesis. My first interfaith experience was with Muslims while at Stony Brook State University of New York. I read multiple versions of the Quran, visited mosques, read tens of books about Islam, and spoke countless hours with Muslim friends and colleagues about the similarities and differences between Judaism and Islam. After a few years, I felt comfortable enough knowing the points where Judaism and Islam converge and diverge, which axioms are shared, and where we appear to have irreconcilable differences. Due to popular demand, I started to represent the Hasidic community to our Muslim neighbors. Concurrently, being American, I have always had regular dealings with Christians and quickly added Christians to my interfaith circles, although the Hasidic community has more people expert at dealing with Christians than Muslims. I found most interesting what I call comparative eschatology, understanding the various beliefs we share about what will happen at the end of days. Having a systematic mind, I understood the many beliefs about what will happen at the end of days that are the same and are different, and facilitated countless conversations on the subjects with all types of people, eventually including basically all people from any belief system. The early experiences of interfaith with the Muslim community formed the precursors of to the multiple truth hypothesis. Interfaith and communal activities for the Hasidic community laid the mental foundations for what has become the multiple truth hypothesis, even though at the time I never framed it that way, but had in my own head systematically worked out the major axioms of various religions and how the beliefs compare, what is similar and what is different, patterns for how people look and understand different issues. The mental framework was not only useful for interfaith and representing the Hasidic community, but personally useful for living in New York City and dealings with all different types of peoples in diverse communities. Simultaneously, I always read books on science. My former academic study was in science, although I almost minored in psychology and linguistics. However, after leaving university for the next five years in New York City, my study of consciousness of science was limited to occasionally reading books or thinking about the nature of consciousness. Later, when I returned to Michigan and ended up finishing my degree in University of Michigan, I continued to focus mainly on physics and engineering. Back in Michigan, I continued to help represent 
the Jewish community, including active involvement in interfaith networks. Of course, I'm always learning new things about different belief systems and trying to synthesize new information, at least in my own head. What has become the multiple truth hypothesis was simply the method in my head to remember large amounts of data and understand complex multifaceted issues without getting them mixed up, mostly as a mental or memory technique. Then a few years ago, I started YouTube streaming and through the power of the internet and social media was able to reach a much larger audience and have global dealings while remaining in one place. Streaming was also my first major experience in public speaking, many times speaking to large active paying online audiences. Although I academically studied science and worked as a civil engineer, it was my debate with jean Francesc Greppi on evolution that rekindled my passion for science and philosophy and opened me to a larger network of people familiar with the full Western canon of science and philosophy. Online, I was constantly in front of large audiences arguing about all sorts of topics. Although Judaism was always the most common topic, mostly to non-Jewish audiences largely unfamiliar with Judaism, many times even hostile. To understand Judaism, one needs to understand Pilpul and the Talmudic approach, where every question has multiple answers. And to understand one an issue, one must understand various schools of thoughts with competing understandings on the issue. I often quote Sir Isaac Newton, the definition of intelligence is to hold multiple conflicting ideas in your head at one time, something very difficult for most people without training. Regularly debating cultural commentary, explaining Jewish concepts, concepts sometimes trying to explain complicated concepts, People notice and call out contradictions in my answer. Like in yeshiva studies, I would attempt to explain that the contradictions are not actually contradictions, minus my mistakes, because there are multiple ways to look at the issue, and the contradiction is between various schools of thought on complicated multifaceted issues that remain unsolved. I started to formalize the multiple truth hypothesis to explain how people, uh, to people how I grapple with complicated issues and as a method to teach others to develop a deeper understanding. I teamed up with... Church of Entropy for a week in review, giving me a venue to delve deeper into science and spirituality and have someone to bounce my ideas off of. I noticed that the type uncertainty around interfaith and comparative eschatology also exists in philosophy and science, and my template for dealing with interfaith might have use in formal philosophy, even science and mathematics. On week in review, Church of Entropy and I mostly discussed the science of consciousness, but also mathematics and physics, and I saw that MTH was useful. Then came COVID-19 and the shutdown of society gave me substantial free time to return to my studies and catch on, uh, catch up on my reading and study all sorts of subjects, but mostly the science of consciousness. Without the COVID-19 lockdowns, I would never have found the time. With the encouragement of Church of Entropy, I started to formally develop the multiple truth hypothesis as a, thir- as a theory, constantly referring to the multiple truth hypothesis in conversations, made some streams on my channel about MTH, even though I've not even fully formalized what MTH is. But basically, the multiple truth hypothesis is a method to deal with uncertainty and search for truth, even in situations of high uncertainty. The general structure of multiple truth hypothesis is simple and can be used for any mental pursuit with multiple competing options. The premise is simple, like my early experience in interfaith, break the various ideas into the axioms, recognize the axioms are the same, similar, different, and even contradictory. And from the various axioms, see the type predictions that the axioms make and the differences in conclusions that the different axioms, difference in axioms make, understanding where competing theories will produce the same or different conclusions. Generally, all theories with adherence have explanatory power, at least narrow areas where the specific theory appears to have the best explanatory power. The multiple truth hypothesis presumes there's some amount of truth to most theories that provide explanatory power to certain phenomena better than or equal to competing theories, enough truth to allow theories to retain at least some following. Using the multiple truth hypothesis, we can have a deeper understanding of any idea that has multiple competing theories, even with certain a certain amount of explanatory power. So also these first two essays, I did not ask my mom to proofread them. So later I started having my mom proofread my essays. And so you can see, you know, like it run on sentences and uh, um, not not as many paragraph divisions. And so my, my later writings were better with the help of my mom. Um, I think I had my mom look at this one, but it could be this one also. 
I was the, the first three I did without my mom. So this was the first one I put on the chess server and uh, I got better results on the chess server. So 360 views, 25 hearts. And so I started using the chess server for my blog as review was not really that great of a server. You can't even edit it. Um, it you know, it, it's the Twitter's free blogging service. So just thinking about multiple truth hypothesis, multiple truth hypothesis will probably be most popular used in relation to identity and self, theories of self and identity. And you'll see the multiplicity of selves and how we understand self and role playing where in narrative identity, which when I get into up to present and the work on the current uh, essay I'm trying to write, uh, the multiple truth hypothesis will probably be most useful. And from there, I'm going to go into the expertise, which is actually a subfield of self and identity because it's the self that's the expert and being an expert is an aspect of identity. And then from there, I'll probably pivot back around to physics and mathematical logic. I still have all these books on my table and uh, you know, studying uh, science and math. So uh, uh, th that will probably be less popular, but it will also be an important aspect of the multiple truth hypothesis in physics, the multiverse, the Schrodinger equation, and a formalized logical representation. Um, but uh, so there you have it, you know, the multiple truth hypothesis, which I said in my first book is probably going to be called multiple truth hypothesis. And it's going to cover, you'd see I made early YouTube videos and I had pillars and now that I'm doing more research, it's changing. But, you know, I'll lay out the theory. I'll talk about the history of science and logic and uh, epistemology and where multiple truth hypothesis comes in as a philosophical theory. And, uh, um, you know, within uh, logic or science, and then the practical uses of multiple truth hypothesis, namely for consciousness studies and uh, for consciousness studies um i'll look at the practical psychology of the self and identity um the hard problem of consciousness the neural correlates of consciousness and then the spiritual approach so you know duvid's a dualist and believes in the soul and the spiritual realm and uh, you know, so comparative spiritual systems that are dualistic, you know, like uh, Judaism, Hinduism, uh, Christianity, pagan systems, uh, or New Age, a lot of them are dualistic and have a material and spiritual realm versus the material uh, scientific fields that are almost all materialistic. So the multiple truth hypothesis will become extremely useful in terms of navigating these complex ideas, especially related to self and identity. Well, who am I? And, you know, what is the origin of myself? How did my identity form? And trying to hold these complex competing theories in, in uh, at the same time. Like, am I uh, a soul and have a non-physical essential, uh, you know, does thought and forms and ideas operate in a separate realm, information theory? So uh, multiple truth hypothesis, uh, you know, so in the book, I'll probably give like in my paper is a historical overview of the ideas, and then I'll relate it to how the multiple truth hypothesis. So first I'll develop the multiple truth hypothesis as an idea. I'll frame it in a logical mathematical structure. And then I'll go on to show how the multiple truth hypothesis could be used driving forward um, areas of mostly consciousness studies the self and identity formation, and also uh, straight math and physics and maybe other uh, related fields. Um, and possibly I'll include in it um, memory techniques, like a chapter on the multiple truth hypothesis as a memory technique for, uh, as a pure memory technique. Okay, so this was my third essay. And I think, you know, because I have uh, 
a lot of followers on the chess server. Um, you know, chess is a big part of my identity. And Jennifer encouraged me to, you know, like in practical terms, as you know, at that point, I was talking about packaging the multiple truth hypothesis as how it's going to benefit somebody in the most way it benefits somebody as a memory technique to help someone improve their memory. So for, you know, deep theoreticians who are trying to advance the sciences and work on extremely complicated uh, multidisciplinary fields, they might uh, use the multiple truth hypothesis or they might already have similar techniques and be useful, uh, but that's a minority of people as opposed to everybody could benefit from improving their memory, although it's also a minority of people that would actively do something to improve their memory. And a lot of times people who try to improve their memory are gamers. So, you know, memory improvement, there's actual, you know, like memory competitions. Uh, but, you know, a lot of times for games like chess or uh, various competitive gaming, uh, people will actively try to improve their memory. Also, academic students, when, you know, people are taking uh, tests or um, in a competitive academic field where uh, memory plays a big role in uh, test scores. So I, I thought to market, so to say, or, or put the multiple truth hypothesis as also a straight memory technique. And uh, you'll see in this, I, I have more research. I'm going to return to memory, but uh, I ended up uh, you know, moving in different directions. So even just for myself, this is useful to uh, you know, review now four and a half months of writing and you know, just to uh, share with uh, people who follow my work, uh, you know, friends, fans, foes on uh, YouTube, where I'm holding and, and where this is going to the future. And also I'll, I'll watch this back myself and uh, you know, hopefully I'll clarify my thoughts of how I'm going to structure all this together in, in a book. Oswald, yep, I mentioned you earlier, I still mean to reach out to John David Ebert. Uh, I haven't got around to that. Do I speak of speak your truth, New Agers? Yeah, I think it was, that's why I said that multiple truth hypothesis could probably benefit anybody, even of extreme low intelligence. Maybe even people who have uh, mental uh, incapacities, uh, your know, retarded level intelligence. That uh, you, you know the basic concepts of multiple truth hypothesis. You don't need to be highly intelligent for as almost uh, anybody with cognitive abilities could appreciate that there's multiple ways of looking at the same thing. Um, it might be more intelligent people who are trying to uh, do extremely intellectually demanding things that would be more interested in the multiple truth hypothesis. But I say the multiple truth hypothesis hopefully would be useful as a mental technique that would help people's cognitive processes at any level. So aquarium, pilpul literally means pepper. And pilpul comes from like the 1600s Poland, uh, Polish, Lithuania, yeshiva, Jewish learning institutes, and was a specific Judaic related learning style. I've discussed this many times, but it's kind of like, you know, like the two Jews, three opinions. And like every question has multiple questions asked and uh, you know, like a, uh, um, like a form of deconstructionism uh, in more modern terms. But it's just like, well, well, this school says this, and this school says this, and according to this, and uh, to uh, counter Semites, you know, like, or, or people aren't familiar with talking to a Talmudic mind, people could be very irritating. It's just like, what's the answer? And it's like, well, there's no answer like that because there's this school and there's this school. And if you're looking at it from this angle, and, uh, you know, so literally the word means pepper. Uh, but, uh, you know, just refers to this Talmudic uh, method of analysis. Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll, maybe over the next few weeks, um, I'm still like, you know, God forbid the construction of my house, I'm in like a bathroom remodel. It's been dragging on um, and uh, hopefully it's finally going to finish up. And, uh, you know, so I'll, I'll try to stream more. But, uh you know, so let me go over this essay and memory techniques. And then, uh, you know, said I, I put the link in the chat if uh, 
Liam, you want to come on and talk event or introduce yourself, and we could talk about uh, your ver various uh, subjects. But uh, let me first read this memory technique essay. Memory techniques and chunking theory. Chunking theory is not well known, but a very powerful idea. Memory in general is not well understood. However, many aspects of memory are understood as memory is one of the most important mental faculties. From ancient history till today, a good memory has been recognized as a crucial aspect of success. Great minds not only shared thoughts on the subject of memory, but also developed techniques to improve memory as performance in most activities can be enhanced through improved memory. Related to memory and general mental functions, chess has been referred to as drosophilia of artificial intelligence, sometimes extended to human cognitive research in a similar way the fruit fly has been to the mainstay of genetics research. Many of the studies on chunking theory have been conducted on chess players due to the simultaneous simplicity and complexity of chess, allowing research and theorists to use chess to test mental functions. I will give a brief overview of the history of memory techniques from ancient times, the history and basis of chunking theory, and the power of chunking theory, especially how chunking theory is at the center of all memory techniques. The earliest recorded memory techniques are mnemonics, or a mental device that chunks multiple pieces of information into one piece of information that can be easily recalled from a single mnemonic. Mnemonics have been utilized in all cultures from the earliest of times as a method to help remember important information. Another ancient technique still popular today is the method of Loki, attributed to pre-Socratic Simonides of Ceos and the famous tragic story of the collapsed banquet hall. Simonides, having stepped outside, was later able to remember who was inside by mentally visualizing traveling table to table to recreate who was at each table. Roman Cicero and Quintilian, writing on the importance of memory to rhetoric, mentioned the method of loci, mnemonics, and other visualization techniques to help facilitate recalling by attaching memories to well-known images. Both quote rhetorica ad perennium, of unknown origins that describe natural and artificial memory, positing the ability to train the mind to increase artificial memory through various techniques. Both Plato and Aristotle wrote on memory, Plato understanding memory to be awaking pre-existing forms and Aristotle a more rational approach. In future essays, I plan to return to more detailed history and explanation of memory, including a de more detailed historical review of memory techniques. From the ancients till modern, era, there was not much advancements on understanding memory. In the late 1800s, the field of psychometrics grew with Darwin and Gelton as scientists started to measure and test the output of mind, including memory, but the main progress does not start until the 1950s. Without being able to explain the working mechanisms of mind and dualistic models still dominating models of the mind, but research and theoreticians with psychometrics actively started studying and the output of mind. Chess performance was a popular field for cognitive research attempting to explain performance differences. In the 1950s, famous promoter of speed reading techniques, Evelyn Woods and others started popularizing memory and mental techniques to enhance the performance of the mind. Shortly after, researchers started making advancements in a scientific understanding of memory, largely through the development of chunking theory. In 1953, Bosbill wrote occurrences of clusters in the recall of randomly arranged associates first noticing the role of chunking memory. But the main break breakthrough came in 1956 with George Miller's magic number seven plus or minus two and the development of the concept of short-term memory, specifically that short-term memory being limited to about seven items. The limitation on short-term memory can only be overcome through chunking together units of memory. Since the 1956, chunking has been well-known concept among cognitive psychologists, but not reaching general popularity. Chess being one of the main testing grounds of psychometrics, the Drosophila of AI, we will return in future essays to discuss artificial intelligence and computers and cognitive research. Chess was used for many of the first studies on chunking theory. In 1973, Chase and Simon in Perception of Chess used chunking theory to explain the difference between performance of chess players until today is an important research paper explaining cognitive performance. In future essays, I plan to delve deeper into the famous chess studies, but today just want to introduce chunking theory Although largely developed in chess studies, chunking theory has much wider implications for memory and thought in general. Chunking is broadly defined as a process by which individual pieces of an information set are broken down and then regrouped together in a meaningful whole. The chunks by which the information is grouped are meant to improve 
short-term retention of the material, thus bypassing the limited capacity of working memory and allowing working memory to be more efficient. In future essays, I will go more into detail on chunking theory. I plan a thorough history of chunking theory, a review of current models of how the mind chunks information, and the neural correlates of chunking theory. Then it will show the relationship of chunking theory to the multiple truth hypothesis and how chunking theory can help understand the heart problem of consciousness. Chunking theory will prove to be a great benefit as just with the basics of chunking, we can understand the secret to basically all mental techniques. As Cicero noted in ancient Rome with the method of Loki, the visual memories are the strongest form of memory and to aid memory, one should chunk concepts with images as modern neuroscience estimates up to 40% of brain activity is used for visual processing. Also, mnemonics are pure chunking, where one chunk a mnemonic can be unlocked into the pieces of information coded within the mnemonic. Stay tuned for more on chunking theory and also some of the famous studies related to chess and how we can all use chunking as a practical mental technique that can immediately produce results in improving mental functioning. I also plan to show how chunking theory can help explain many psychological theories like cognitive dissonance as chunking theory is the main pillar and precursor knowledge to understand the multiple truth hypothesis. So this was the first of my three essays that I did not have my mother look at. So you could see uh, a lot of errors, a lot of uh, your revisions that could have been used. So the next one on the Science of Consciousness conference, I started having my mother look at. And so the writing quality, you know, just, I mean, one, my mother, you know, was a, a lawyer, a very good writer, uh, so, uh, but uh, you're just having anyone review your writing uh, makes it better. So uh, the first three essays are pretty uh, coarse and need some editing. And uh, you were, were just, you know, Jennifer, thank God, nagged me and got me to start writing. So I started writing. I think I was trying to do like one essay a week. And... Uh, So, your know, chunking theory is something I'm going to return to very shortly, especially when I get into expertise. And, uh, you know, we'll talk more about memory, hopefully, in the future. It's an interesting topic that I have more research on and uh, will return to. Okay, thanks for tuning in, Liam. Um, blessings. Uh, let me know if you want to, uh, you know, talk. Uh, sometimes we could arrange a stream. So, unlike my usual self, I decided to kick out some money, and me and Jennifer attended the Science of Consciousness conference this year, and it was like over $300, um, <clears throat> and it was just online, and they released the videos afterwards, and you know, we didn't even know if there was going to be an open chat. There was. It wasn't that active, but... Uh, it was probably worth it and got you know involved in uh, you know putting some money up forward saying I want to be an intellectual I want to be in a community of intellectuals and so we need to uh, attend this conference so uh, so we did and I wrote a paper uh, overview on uh, the count on the conference as my fourth paper um, the yeah, multiple truth hypothesis is useful for understanding on any complex issue. You know, God forbid, like Holocaust studies, if you're talking instrumentalism versus uh, essentialism, um, looking at different aspects, like where you have multiple perspectives, it will be useful. Or high levels of uncertainty, where you're analyzing different uh, schools of thought uh, based on uncertainty. Science of Consciousness Conference in Penrose Hammer of Hypothesis. This week was the Biennial Science of Consciousness Conference in Tuscan, Arizona. Jennifer, Church of Entry, and I attended remotely. Our first stream over three years ago covered the Penrose Hammer of Hypothesis, and the Science of Consciousness has been the main topic of our Sunday Night Week in Review. Although my interest in consciousness is mixed between spirituality and science, I've always tried to ground my beliefs in science, recognizing that spiritual and scientific approaches don't always lead to the same conclusions, necessitating a multidisciplinary approach. As I mentioned in my essay on the multiple truth hypothesis, interfaith was the main motivation in my formulation, 
wrestling with various traditions, understanding of the end of days, comparative eschatology, and cosmology. Many of the same problems of conflicting theories exist in science, especially consciousness studies requiring an interdisciplinary approach. Historically, consciousness studies were part of a theolo the the theology and philosophy only in the last century. Advancements in physics, biology, computer science, and technology allow a more scientific approach, leaving us with thousands of years of understanding of consciousness coded into religious and philosophical language, not always corresponding with the latest scientific developments. In this week's essay, I will give a brief history of the Science of Consciousness Conference, the Heart Problem of Consciousness, Orchestrated Objective Reduction, or COAR, the Penrose Hameroff Hypothesis, and how multidisciplinary studies are advancing our understanding of consciousness, hopefully justifying the need for Jennifer and my approach on Week in Review. Stuart Hameroff, an anesthesiologist with a fascination about the nature of consciousness, is the main driver behind the conference. Although the conference travels around the world, it is regularly hosted by the University of Arizona, where Dr. Hameroff is the head of the Center for Consciousness Studies. In 1987, Dr. Hameroff wrote Ultimate Computing, detailing biomecular mechanisms that may give rise to consciousness, most notably microtubules. In 1991, Hameroff helped organize the conference on consciousness with mostly academics from Arizona. In 1994, he created the now biennial Science of Consciousness Conference, recruiting some of the greatest thinkers and researchers on consciousness around the globe. Early participants include David Chalmers, Benjamin Liebet, Roger Penrose, and more. Over the decades, a wide array of experts has joined, discussing research related to consciousness to an even wider way of attendees interested in the subject, including an appeal to people with more spiritual leanings and topics, such as the effects of psychedelics. 30 years later, the conference is still growing and as the interest in the subject, leading me to sign up and join the conference myself. I will briefly go over the heart problem of consciousness and then the development of the hammer of Penrose hypothesis, David Chalmers in the 1995, facing up to the problem of consciousness, and 1996, Conscious Mind outlines the difficulties in producing a scientific understanding of how consciousness can arise from the physical, referred to as the heart problem of consciousness, questioning why and how we have qualia or phenomenal experiences. Easy problems of consciousness deal with how the brain integrates information, categorizes and discriminates environmental stimuli, focuses attention on the various qualia, individual aspects of consciousness. Many study, most study of conscious centers around explaining various single aspects of consciousness referred to as qualia as a full model of consciousness far beyond the ability of the current state of science to explain and more difficult than solving a bunch of easy problems of consciousness. An explanatory gap exists between our understanding of the biological mechanisms and the phenomenon of our experiences even for single qualia. There are many approaches to the easy problems of consciousness, approaches that propose all conscious experiences can be reduced to physical mechanisms, mainly of the brain, are referred to as reductionists, where non-reductionists like Chalmers hold that consciousness is more complex than can be simply explained to arise from physical mechanisms. One extreme school of reductionism is eliminative materialism, which holds that consciousness and most mental states don't actually exist, just illusions of the mind. Possibly supporting a limit of materialism in the 1980s, Benjamin Leavitt's ingenious studies showing unconscious neural processes proceed and potentially cause volition retrospectively felt to be conscious motivation. Most leading experts in the science of consciousness are materialists, but not a limit of materialists. Francis Crick in 1994 wrote the astonishing hypothesis positing a person's mental activity are entirely due to the behavior of nerves, glial cells, and the atoms, ions, and molecules that make them up and influence them, proposing that further scientific investigation will discover how the physical gives rise to consciousness. The majority of research in consciousness studies is searching for and explaining the physical mechanisms of consciousness. The two main schools of materialism are neural correlates of consciousness and integrated information theory. The neural correlates of consciousness is an empirical approach using a minimal set of neuronal events and mechanisms sufficient for specific conscious precept. Research centers around the correlating various conscious phenomena with neural activity using latest technologies to measure brain activity, multiple tests correlating specific conscious events with neural events using the specific process gives rise to models of 
consciousness, aiming to answer some of the easy problems. A leading proponent of neural correlates of consciousness is Christoph Koch, the president of the Allen Institute of Brain Sciences. Institutes around the world continually produce new studies of various neural correlates to facets of consciousness. Integrated information theory is another popular framework for why physical systems are conscious, working backwards, trying to understand consciousness through the minimal biological building blocks required to produce conscious experience. All materialist schools face the explanatory gap explaining how physical properties give rise to the way things feel when they are experienced. Other schools include new mysterianism, including Flanagan and Chomsky, as opposed to the old mysterians who are dualist and thought consciousness cannot be understood scientifically because it operates according to non-natural principles, framing consciousness not as a hard problem that might eventually be solved, but a mystery that will always cause wonder. I also want to give a brief overview of the orchestra objective orchestrated reduction, or COR, the penrose hameroff hypothesis. That is one of the main areas of study related to the Science of Consciousness Conference. As mentioned in 1987, Stuart Hameroff wrote Ultimate Computing, giving an overview of biomolecular mechanisms for consciousness, specifically microtubules. Concurrently, Roger Penrose in 1989 wrote The Emperor's New Mind, discussing how quantum effects might give rise to consciousness. Quantum mechanisms is complicated by the famous measurement problem related to the Schrodinger's equation and the collapse of the wave equation. Diossi and Penrose had forwarded an objective collapse theory to the measurement problem centering around gravity as opposed to the multi-world theories. In the Emperor's New Mind, Penrose posits that consciousness is a non-algorithmic invoking Godel's incompleteness theory, theory suggesting that due to limits of the incompleteness theorem, mathematicians must be using some non-computable process, most likely the waveform collapse. Stuart Hamrove, after reading Penrose Emperor's New Mind, informed Penrose of the possibility that microtubules might be the mechanism that consciousness utilizes for the waveform collapse. In 1994, Penrose wrote Shadows of the Mind, updating his theory with Hamrove's suggestion, creating the Penrose Hamrove hypothesis, objective orchestrated reduction, positing consciousness is based on non-computable quantum processes performed by qubits on microtubules amplified by neurons. Decades later, Penrose Hamrov is one of the leading models of consciousness, with countless researchers adding new discoveries every year. Despite the best efforts of great minds, the explanatory gap remains, and the hard problem of consciousness is unanswered with regular progress is made solving some of the easy problems. The nature of consciousness studies requires interdisciplinary studies, and a few places dedicated to consciousness studies try to bring together experts from diverse fields, many times housed in medical schools, usually related to anesthesiology, sleep studies, or neuropsychology, fields that require accurate understandings of consciousness using the scientific method. However, historically, consciousness is a subject of philosophy and theology. Our lexicon describing consciousness comes from a dualistic heritage focusing on the mind-body problem, assuming that consciousness derives from the soul and is not limited to the restraints of natural law. Theologians and religious scholars have a long tradition of conscious studies, prayer and meditation that predate the scientific method, more based on introspection and sage wisdom. Advancements in our understanding of consciousness uses the best of all approaches and an integrated approach. Difficulties arise in the extreme expertise required to understand the subdisciplines such as quantum mechanics, neuroscience, brain anatomy, as well as the historical canon of philosophy and theology related to consciousness. In coming essays, I will go more into detail into some of the models of consciousness, the historical canon of wisdom, and how the multiple truth hypothesis can help students navigate all the various and sometimes mutually incompatible theories. Henry, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, so, yeah, New Mysterious Chomsky in uh, the idea of... Uh, that we're not going to solve the hard problem of consciousness, uh, but not in the sense that of the dualist or the spiritualist that said we're not going to solve consciousness because consciousness is not a material phenomenon, uh, but uh, possibly even if it is a material phenomenon, that, it, that it's not a hard problem, meaning problem meant to be solved, uh, but it's a mystery to be uh, in awe of. So, yeah, eventually probably before I get to my book. So you know, I'm going to 
finish up with my study of self and identity with my next essay, although there's more to that, even though this is going to be the longest essay I've written yet. And uh, then I'm going to move into expertise, and then I'm going to go back to physics and math, and then I'll probably do an overview of all of the current models of consciousness, just like I'm doing now with the psychological theories of self. And I'll probably have to wait till I do the physics review because the models of consciousness, uh, many of them are quite uh, mathematically and physics intense as unlike the psychological models of self and identity that I'm examining now in this uh, last and upcoming essay that um, models of consciousness are physics and math intense. So my next essay was cognitive dissonance. Um, and so I was trying to pump out essays rather quickly at the beginning because, you know, just Jennifer was encouraging me and I didn't have that much positive response. I think cognitive dissonance was the first essay that got quite a few views. So this one had 734 views. Um, you know, memory techniques, I see it's kind of poorly written. Maybe I'll rework that one. Science of consciousness, uh, you know, like I put, started putting the chess server. I was only getting a handful of views total on uh, um, the review on my Twitter, um, but, you know, just forwarding the research. So the next essay, I did cognitive dissonance, which at that point I considered one of the pillars of the multiple truth hypothesis. But looking back, I think that cognitive dissonance is going to be more in the framework of theories of self and identity formation. Although, like I mentioned, this essay, cognitive dissonance is one of the few early cognitive theories that has survived into the neuropsychological era with most recent testing and data backing up the theory. So of all the various early theories on identity and self and consciousness, cognitive dissonance is one that has held up the best. So memes, thanks for tuning in. If you want to uh, chat a few minutes, I, I think I put the link in the chat. So I'll read this essay. And then if you want to pop on, we could talk a few minutes. I'm, I'm reading through all my essays and, uh, you know, just talking through the current state of my research and where I plan on going through. But if you want to hop on after I read this one and give my voice a chance to uh, to rest, been going over an hour nonstop, although I've done streams for five, six hours of just me rambling. So uh, I hope my voice will hold up. Cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is one of the best-known psychological theorems with explanatory power into the basic motivations of human behavior. Unlike the majority of early psychological theories, cognitive dissonance has survived the advancements in neuroscience and advent of the heart problem of consciousness with modern neurological studies verifying CD and being incorporated into many of the top theories of mind. My own multiple truth hypothesis relies on cognitive dissonance as one of the central precursor theories. In this essay, I will explain the fundamentals of cognitive dissonance trace the origins of cognitive dissonance within the greater framework of psychology to the present day, including the neural correlates of CD, and go over a few recent theories of mind that have incorporated CD. Cognitive dissonance originated with Leon Festinger. Festinger studied religious movements and false prophets, going as far to embed himself within a cult of personality uh, to personally witness people with their when their predictions failed and publishes findings in When Prophets Fail, 1956. As you'll see in my upcoming essay, uh, Fester actually published a theory of identity in 1954 before he came up with cognitive dissonance. Fester posited based on historical analysis of a similar groups dealing with the fallout of failed prophecy that despite the evidence, people in the cult would not admit they were duped, but instead doubled down on their apparently obvious wrong beliefs. The following year, Festinger published The Theory of Cognitive Dissonance, 1957, with a comprehensive psychological model explaining the phenomenon which could be applied to general human behavior, belief, and motivation. Cognitive dissonance is a form of stress caused when there is a mismatch between a person's action and cognitive phenomenon, 
such as feelings, ideas, beliefs, values, and environmental perception. Fessner borrowed the term from music distance, referring to disharmony of sounds, to emphasize the distance between mind and action is normal as opposed to stronger language like hypocrisy. Dissonance simply refers to inconsistencies and constants like in music, the resolution of the dissonance returning to a state of consistency. Cognitive dissonance lends to more scientific interpretation with a mathematical interpretation where CD can have a magnitude and be seen as a ratio between the sum of dissonant cognitions divided by the sum total of dissonant and consonant cognitions, or sometimes just the ratio of dissonant and to consonant elements. The magnitude showing the amount of dissonance of the various cognitions to actions representing the inconsistencies we face, signifying a measure of how much stress a particular dissonance causes a person to reduce the stress cognitive dissonance reduction, the person must choose between a few options. So one can attempt to change behavior or change the cognition, both difficult tasks. More common is for people to justify the action or cognition by changing or adding new behaviors or cognitions that at least temporarily reduce the distance, or one can fully ignore and reject information that conflicts with previous held beliefs. As mentioned, Fessinger developed theory studying religious cults and failed prophecy, but quickly adapted cognitive dissonance to general cognitive phenomenon, designing many ingenious experiments to demonstrate the phenomenon usually in a counterintuitive way, showing that people will justify illogical behavior to reduce distance. Cognitive dissonance in the 1950s was a pivotal theory in changing the paradigm of how we understand psychology and human motivation, and it stood the test of time in repeated tests and studies later further vindicated with neural correlates. In the 1950s, the dominant psychological theory was behaviorism, the theory that human and animal behavior can be explained in terms of conditioning without appeal to thoughts or feelings, and that psychological disorders are best treated by altering behavior patterns. Similar to Freud's psychoanalysis, cognitive dissonance focused on cognitive processes, including unconscious motivations. Cognitive dissonance can be seen as part of the larger cognitive revolution of the interdisciplinary studies of the mind and its processes that displace behaviorism. Fessinger, together with other great thinkers like Noam Chomsky, Universal Grammar, Marvin Minsky, Alan Newell, and Herbert Simon, chunking theory showed that cognitive processes affect behavior as much or more than conditioning. The 1960s saw as many tests and advancements on CD, but in the 1970s and 80s, other alternative cognitive theories became more popular than cognitive dissonance, such as Elliot Aarons's expectancy of self and Higgins' self-discrepancy theory. Although similar to CD, more focused on self-perception and dissonance from our self-concept, our behavior and the way we are viewed from others or perceive the environment. In 1983, Jerry Fodor published The Modularity of Mind, offering an evolutionary explanation for cognitive dissonance phenomenon, hypothesizing that the mind is composed of innate neural structures of mental modules which have distinct and established and evolutionary developed functions, hence push one in different directions causing dissonance which is moderated by higher order processing somewhere in the brain. Even though research started following different directions, many new theories built on cognitive dissonance theory and tests and experiments continued to confirm the cognitive dissonance phenomenon and the expression cognitive dissonance entered popular culture as an explanation for irrational decisions people, people commonly make to, due to conflicting beliefs. In the last few decades, cognitive dissonance made a comeback with new studies focusing on the neural correlates, using various methods to measure what happens in the brain while repeating classic cognitive dissonance experiments. A series of experiments using fMRI scans confirmed the neural basis to CD, showing changes in the stradium region of the brain reflecting people's change in beliefs when mismatched with various actions. Neural basis of rationalization, cognitive dissonance reduction during decision-making 2010 showed the neural activities of rationalization occurred in seconds without conscious deliberation on the part of the person, and the brain engages in emotional responses during decisions. Contributions from research on anger and cognitive dissonance on understanding the motivational functions of asymmetric frontal brain activity, Harmon Jones, 2004, correlated anger and emotions with decision-making and the dissonance reduction process. Further studies also showed neurocorrelates of CD in relations to guilt, envy, and embarrassment. Studies showed cognitive dissonance also functions in monkeys and young children. As tests continue to affirm cognitive dissonance, the neurocorrelates uh, and reveal the neurocorrelates, more advanced theories focusing on the exact neural mechanisms behind cognitive dissonance appeared. 
as seen in my previous essay on the Science of Consciousness Conference, in the last few decades as technology and neuroscience has advanced, so too have theories of mind some spec specifying mechanisms behind cognitive dissonance. Eddie Harmon Jones, an active-based, action-based model of cognitive dissonance processes, 2015 proposed psychologically dissonance occurs consequence to the stimulant simulation of thoughts that interfere with goal-driven behavior, extending the original cognitive dissonance theory by proposing a mechanism for how cognitive dissonance prompts dissonance and dissonance reduction. The action-based model focuses on cognitions, which with action implications conflicting with one another, making it difficult to act, often putting short-term decisions against long-term decisions. 2018, Rupas Kerry Kernan proposed the theory of predictive dissonance relating the cognitive dissonance phenomenon to theories of predictive coding around since the 1860s with Helmholtz on conscious interference but regaining popularity in the materialistic models of mind focused on the brain function of making predictions about our environment and how the environment will respond to our choices. Predictive processing presents a new take on cognitive dissonance with a unifying account of perception, action, experience, and expectation, providing a theoretical, possibly empirical account of a fundamentally embodied and environmentally situated mind with the larger predictive processing model attempting to fully explain the cognitive dissonance phenomenon. Cognitive dissonance is returned to the forefront of psychological research and a central place in new theories of mind. Cognitive dissonance theory has a rich history. Standing the test of time, unlike many psychological theories, cognitive dissonance has been vindicated by advancements in technology and neurology. The basic co concept of cognitive dissonance is well known to most educated people. Part of the common lexicon and coming up often in everyday conversation related to the peculiarities of human behavior and decision-making. At the same time, new studies in the neurocorrelates of the cognitive dissonance phenomena are helping to advance the understanding of the brain. And CD is an integral part of many of the leading models of mind attempting to incorporate the CD phenomenon into an integrated model of mind. Any model of mind must explain the well-documented CD phenomenon. My multiple truth model also incorporates CD helping to explain cognitive processes and decision-making in general. Future essays will go further into the nature of decision-making and how cognitive dissonance functions in many decisions where there is a cost to choosing one thing over the other. In upcoming essays, I'll return to chess studies and chunking theory, which also have close connections to cognitive dissonance and decision-making processes. As I further develop my multiple truth hypothesis, cognitive dissonance will emerge as one of its fundamental pillars. So if you see here in the 70s and 80s, self-concept became more popular than cognitive dissonance. So when I get into my current state of research um, on theories of identity, you'll see self-concept is one of the most written about of all subjects in psychology, uh, which is related to self-esteem, self-concept, self-esteem. And cognitive dissonance is seen as a process uh, but cognitive dissonance is going to be extremely important in the future of my research, multiple truth hypotheses, consciousness studies, because it's mathematical and it correlates to neural processes. So theories of self and identity are almost all based on introspection and psychometrics, as where cognitive dissonance more relates to the predictive mind. And uh, when I had written this essay, that was before I got involved with Active Inference Lab, so I didn't mention Carl Friston and Active Inference. So I mentioned the predictive mind and uh, um, Eddie Harmon Jones and uh, Karen in, re in relation to the predictive mind, because I hadn't read much of Friston. I mentioned Friston a week in review, and then I found active inference and got involved with them. So we're likely to go further with cognitive dissonance theory. Cognitive dissonance theory, if you look into, I have to maybe speak to Daniel about it, could probably be directly corporate incorporated into Friston's free energy principle. So I'm not sure if there's yet a study or relationship between Friston's free energy principle and cognitive dissonance, uh, but they're very related. Uh, you would know, say cognitive dissonance is formulaic. It could probably work with the entropy equations of Friston's uh, 
free energy principle, the uh, least action principle. And uh, so it'll be an interesting thing to look forward to in the future. So that was my fifth essay. So let me try to read three more of these. And then maybe if Jennifer wants to hop on, it'll give my chance to vo uh, rest my voice. So I'm going to try to get through Kotov, Candidate Moves. This one just broke a 1,000 views. So it's on the chess server. And it's you know this one's directly related to chess. And this where, as a chess player, I think I have possibly some greater in insights. Like Daniel, as a chess is like the Drosophilia of artificial intelligence and cognitive research in many ways. It's a, almost all of the cognitive theoreticians and artificial intelligence um, researchers study chess in its relationship. And this concept here of candidate moves and analysis trees is probably one of the main reasons. So, um, you know, this essay, I think, is my third most popular essay. And uh, it will probably give me a little niche when I move into expertise. Jennifer is not a chess player, but I think I pounded into her the concept of analysis tree and candidate moves. So, like, all serious chess players know the concept of candidate moves and analysis trees because in order to improve at chess, uh, you have to be able to really do this. And, and uh, you know, even the, the value of it is disputed among chess coaches, but the concept is familiar to all, all serious chess players. Outside of chess, not so much. I think Jennifer is starting to get it. So I, I, we did the Thursday night debate prep and flowing, and I was trying to explain the concept of argument mapping that would have the same structure as chess candidate moves and analysis trees where argument mapping would also use this concept of candidate moves and analysis trees. So uh, let's look at this essay on Kotov, chess candidate moves, analysis trees, and general decision making. Russian chess grandmaster Alexander Kotov, Think Like a Grandmaster, 1970, although one of the most well-known chess books is little known outside of chess. Kotov was a former Russian chess champion, but also recommended, remembered as an author advocating the Soviet-style play that dominated chess for most of the 20th century. The ideas of Think Like a Grandmaster are relatively simple. I read the book at my father's recommendation in grade school. Think Like a Grandmaster goes over many basic principles of chess psychology and gives insight into the thought process of chess grandmasters. One of the most notable ideas in Think Like a Grandmaster is the concept of candidate moves and analysis trees. With Kotov's recommendation for how to find the best move and mentally examine as many of the possibilities as the human mind can manage in an organized fashion. Although Kotov's method is controversial among chess trainers today, almost all the top players are aware of the concepts and the study of chess often centers around finding the best candidate moves and composing mental analysis trees. In this essay, I will give a brief explanation of what candidate moves and analysis trees are and why they are, are so important to advance chess play. From there, I will give a historical context in relation to mathematics, economics, cognitive psychology, to where Kotov's ideas arose and why these thought processes are important to a larger theories of mind today. I include Think Like a Grandmaster as not only one of the greatest chess books ever written, but possibly one of the greatest books ever whose ideas can be applied to meditation, mind improvement, and mental techniques. Candidate moves and analysis trees are relevant to a vast area of interdisciplinary studies and is a pillar of my multiple truth hypothesis. Candidate moves and analysis trees are some of the most important concepts that children learn from chess, helping to develop stronger thinking skills and useful in basically all mental activity and fields of study. Although the concept of candidate moves and analysis trees is simple enough for a young child to understand Similar ideas are sparse in other fields that most people will never come across them, may, possibly making chess worthwhile just to master the concept and help make better decisions of life in general. I'll trace the origins of general theories of decision-making, the various disciplines which they arise, and why analysis trees became the underpinning of computer intelligence and theories of predictive mind 
hypothesizing that human mind is subconscious, subconsciously might operate using similar methods to candidate moves and analysis trees. Within chess, it is likely that many players intuited the concept of candidate moves and analysis trees, but it's hard to find pre kotov origins. Adrian Groot's famous thought and choice in chess, 1946, has all the precursors necessary for the concept but falls short in the formulation, focusing more on examining the thinking out loud of top players and test of players of various strengths, calculating ability more related to the development of chunking theory. <coughs> a candidate move is simply moves which upon initial observation the, of the position seem to warrant further analysis. A given chess position might have tens of possible legal moves from which a player will choose a small number of pl plausible options to analyze in greater depth before choosing one by discarding potentially poor moves and giving further mental effort to further analyze potentially good moves. The analysis tree arises from the exponential structure of each candidate move that could lead to multiple possible replies by the other player, which in turn leads to multiple moves the player would plan on their next move, leading to an expansion that appears similar to a tree in branches, hence the name analysis tree. People commonly assume top chess players calculate many moves in advance, but with exponentially expanding analysis trees, that is oversimplified. Kotov explains this process with examples. He gives specific advice for orderly thinking process of thoroughly going through one branch and then the next without jumping back and forth. That recommendation is the subject of larger dispute among chess masters and experimental data of how the mind actually works, which I will return to in future essays. Another key theme is how to recognize which candidate moves warrant deeper thought and which ones can be quickly discarded. Although Kotov gives many other useful insights into the thinking process, basically all relevant to normal thought processes, the idea of the candidate moves and analysis tree is the most important and applicable to the general decision making. The concept of decision trees has a long history, appears in many diverse fields, and can be abstracted to the theory of mind and help advance understanding of consciousness. Decision trees are found in different forms in ancient esoteric spiritual writings, such as Kabbalah and Karma, related to free will, action, reaction, including decisions on the meaning of games, including chess as a form of divination, but I'll leave that for a topic for future essays. Ancient concepts of logical proof, the method of exhaustion, and theories of mind do not seem enough to have produced a simple concept that can now be taught to children. About eight to 900 years ago, tree diagrams became po very popular, including the Kabbalistic tree of life. Decision making arises in more in the field of mathematics, economics, and game theory, including chess. Probably the most similar theory to analysis trees is expected value utility theory. Luca, Picchio, Luca Pocchioli, Pacchioli, a contemporary of Leonardo da Vinci, is best known for the first writings on double ledger accounting, discuss expected value, which was crucial in the development of banking and insurance. Risk assessment, especially determining insurance prices, requires charting various possibilities, candidate moves, and the likelihood of those occurring is a precursor to decision trees. Pacioli also talks about expected value in relationship to game theory and using mathematics to determine the best course of play in games and gambling. Choices in simple games can be mapped onto game trees that exhaustively examine all possibilities. Expected value as a discipline of mathematics was further developed by Blaise Pascal and Pierre de Fermi related to the problem of points, a popular game of the time. The Bernoulli family of mathematicians further developed the mathematics of in the expected utility hypothesis in relationship to the St. Petersburg paradox. Expected value utility is a statistical method to estimate the likelihood of possibilities in terms of a value of zero to one. Value uh, between zero and one a percent likelihood or a monetary amount related to financial decisions. Within economics, the mathematics of decision-making has been a centerpiece of research for hundreds of years, using game theory to decipher what the best decision is in various situations with the expected value, the calculated average of all possibilities to a single number of the average, the most likely outcome. Many techniques and statistical methods have been developed in the last few hundred years, like Boolean algebra and Markov chains of Bayes' theorem, one of the most widely used today. Bayes' theorem is at the center of many materialistic models of consciousness and computer intelligence. 
Bayesian decision theory is a statistical approach based on trade-off qualifications among various classification decisions based on probability and the cost associated with the decisions. Future essays will go more into detail about these statistical methods at the center of theories of consciousness, but in relation to Kotov's Think Like a Grandmaster, suffice it to say the Russian chess school was surely familiar with these precursor ideals. In relation to psychology, Western thinkers like Descartes and John Locke, as well as ancients like Aristotle, hypothesize models of mind and how ideas are acquired, remembered, and manipulated. However, theories of mind were not subjected to the scientific method till the rise of psychometrics in the late 1800s, like Ebbinghaus and his experiments on memory. One of the fathers of psychometric, Gutoff Fechner, wrote Elements of Psychophysics, 1860, measuring sense perception and the ability of people to decipher small difference. Fechner, as a colleague, Weber, devised the Weber-Fechner law, making use of Bernoulli's expected utility principle. They abstracted their psychophysics theory to economic decisions in what has become the field of behavioral economics, one of the main fields utilizing decision trees. As mentioned in the last essay, Cognitive Dissonance, most psychometricians were behaviorists and did not focus on cognitive processes, but on the mathematics of the hypothetical best decision, believing people could be conditioned to make optimal decisions. Kotov can be considered part of the larger cognitive revolution of cognitive dissonance, published, uh, publishing just years before Chase and Simon's Chunking Theory, 1973, focusing more on cognitive processes than behavior. Behavioral economics combines mathematics and economics with psychology, not just determining what is the best choice people should make, but understanding and modeling irrational human behavior and economic implications, often using cognitive dissonance to explain people's irrational economic choices. The most significant precursor to Kotov's idea of candidate moves and analysis trees is computer programming and circuit logic. Alan Turing developed an algorithm called Turbo, TuroChamp in 1948 that used a system of analysis trees by analyzing all potential moves and opponent replies in further considerable moves. Turing died before TuroChamp could be implemented, but a similar program was used in the first computers with vacuum tubes in the 1950s with a method similar to Turing. In 1958, McCarthy, Newell, and Simon developed alpha-beta pruning algorithms similar to TuroChamp by using an expected value and only analyzing variations with high expected values. This method was first part pioneered by Arthur Samuel, for checkers, a game tree like decision trees goes back hundreds of years and is an exhaustive method of creating an analysis tree for all possible variations capable of solving simple games. Chess with too large a number of variations cannot be solved even by today's most powerful computers and requires a method of deciphering which variations are worthy of analysis. It took the 1980s for computers to reach master level. In the early 1980s, the top chess computers could analyze 1,500 moves a second. By 1966, the Soviets and Americans had chess computers that competed against each other with ratings around 1,500. My hypothesis is that Kotov's Think Like a Grandmaster was a reverse anthropomorphism, mapping computer algorithms onto the human mind. Think Like a Grandmaster was written toward the end of Kotov's life. He was already in his late 50s, and 1970 was more than a decade after the advent of the first chess computers. Although the Russian chess greats likely went through the intense training and mental exercises to maximize calculating ability, it is likely that the concept of candidate moves and analysis trees was reversed and compromised from computer science to the human mind, drawing from the best of all fields of decision-making, mathematics, logic, computer science, behavioral economics, and more. The thinking tools recommended in Kotov's Think Like a Grandmaster are not unique to chess. Chess is one of the simplest forms these complex ideas could be learned. Most of the other fields of advanced mathematics, computer programs, psychology, economics, philosophy, and more are not part of the common curriculum, so most people won't come across until advanced university studies, if at all. But through chess, the simple concept of candidate moves and analysis trees can be taught to and mastered by young children, and the essential concept is quite simple. As a chess coach, I try to teach children basic decision-making skills that can be applied to all aspects of life, from analytical thinking for math and science to karmic principles of action-reaction. In regular dealings with others, we have many options to choose from that will elicit a reaction and then other plethora of options in response. In difficult life decisions where options are limited, cases of uncertainty and risk, the concept of candidate moves and analysis trees is useful to navigate life, probably one of the reasons of the popularity of the game of chess. In future essays, I will go into more detailed chess studies, in-depth models of decision-making processes, chunking theory, and more. 
I'll also abstract the concept of candidate moves and analysis trees to theories of mind, most specifically the predictive brain models of consciousness, where possibly all mental processes can be understood to arise from this process. We will also return to statistical methods, computer intelligence, behavioral economics, Kahneman Tversky's prospect theory, game theory, and more, especially how the concept of candidate moves and analysis trees can be used in my multiple truth hypothesis. It's a lot of stuff just looking back. It was only a few months ago, but uh, you know, a lot of stuff to look at in uh, the future. So this is my third most popular essay. And uh, next I did an essay on 3D printing and added manufacturing uh, related to conferences. Next month, I'll be start going to conferences. I'm not sure there's any conferences in uh, um, August that I'll be going to, but uh, yeah, next month I'll, I'll start uh, going to conferences and streaming them. So uh, hi, T, welcome to the chat. So I plan on doing further science writing, just analyzing technology and going to conferences. Um, and uh, so I'm glad I wrote this essay. I think this was a pretty good essay. In fact, I think it got uh, relatively good views, over 500 views on uh, the chess server. Three D printing and additive manufacturing. This week, I attended the Society of, Ma of Manufacturing Engineers Rapid TCT conference in Detroit. And you know, in terms of multiple truth hypothesis and science, this would more, more be as memory mental technique for understanding different ideas or even methods. So here, you know, the three D printing and additive manufacturing. You'll see that there's multiple methods being developed at the same time that apply different strategies towards the technology and engineering, you know, usually or almost always there's multiple ways to go about solving a problem that all have different cost benefit analysis. Um, also like Kotov analysis tree, candidate moves and decision trees, uh, that general thought process uh, that, you know, is generally learned from chess, probably one of the best benefits of playing chess is, you know, this idea of, candidate moves and analysis trees, and then add to that the multiple truth hypothesis for understanding different um, engineering methods. So let's look at this. 3D printing and additive manufacturing. This week I attended the Society for Ma Manufacturing Engineers Rapid TCT Conference in Detroit. I've attended the Society of Manufacturing Conferences in the past and closely followed 3D printing technology for over a decade now. I remember going to one of the first strategist distribution centers in Metro Detroit in 2013, hosted by the Michigan Israel Business Bridge and many other early technological demonstrations of 3D printers. I took a training course in the now, at the now bankrupt tech shop on how to work a 3D printer before they were widely available. And remember when the University of Michigan Engineering School got the first 3D printer. The concept was incredible and I almost sought employment as a 3D printer salesman. In my work as an engineer over the past 10 years, 3D printing is a sector that I personally witnessed the fastest growth from its first appearances to a now major conference completely dedicated to the field. Prices have radically dropped to hundreds of dollars from the tens of thousands of dollars, as well as new capabilities such as metal printers. In this week's essay, I will explain the basic technology behind 3D printing, additive manufacturing, the major different methods 3D printers use, trace the origins of the 3D printer technology from early conceptions and first patents to commercial introductions for industrial use for research and development to the more widespread use over the last few years. Finally, I will cover the main uses of the technology in its future direction. 3D printing or additive manufacturing is the process of making three-dimensional solid objects from a digital file. The term 3D printing can refer to a variety of processes where material is deposited, joined, or solidified to create a three-dimensional object. The process can be use a variety of materials from plastics liquids, powders, metals, foods, concrete, biomaterials, and more. Common technologies 
to accomplish 3D printing are fused deposited modeling, stereolithography, selective laser centering, and binding, binder jetting. Added manufacturing is simply expansion of the regular two-dimensional inkjet printing to the third dimension. Fused deposit modeling is done by feeding in material, heating the material to melt, and pushing through an extruder that deposits the melted material in a computer-controlled head that goes up and down the XY plane, depositing the material as per the model layer by layer. The layering is usually on a platform that lowers after each layer is finished, but different machines use, utilize various methods. Stereolithography, instead of extruding a material, focuses a laser on a powder bed of material, causing it to fuse with a platform that lowers or raises after finishing a layer. Similar to stereolithography, selective laser centering uses two or more lasers and is more common for metal additive manufacturing. Binder jetting, instead of using a laser, uses a liquid binding agent on a power bed, requiring less energy and often being more cost effective. The general concept of 3D printing is simple and intuitive. Sister technologies to 3D printing are 3D scanning and modeling software. 3D scanners can create computer image by scanning an object, which can then be printed a form of reverse engineering. Added manufacturing technology is dependent on 3D modeling software such as CAD, computer-aided design, that is communicated from a computer to the various type printers directing the shape to be made. Experts break down the history, historical development of 3D printing into three eras, the era of early ideas prior to around 1985, the era of the first commercial printers before the widespread acceptance through around 2010, and now the modern era of mass adaption. adoption. The concept of 3D printing existed over 100 years ago in the fields of topography and photosculpture, science fiction novels in the 1940s and 50s by Murray Leinster and Raymond Jones speculated about hypothetical devices. The inkjet printer was introduced in the 1950s and the concept of 3D printing was not hard to extrapolate, but the needed technologies did not yet exist. In the 1970s, early patents were filed. And in 1974, British scientist David Jones wrote about the concept of 3D printing in The New Scientist but it was not until the early 1980s that the technology to create a working 3D printer materialized by various researchers in America, Japan, and Europe. In 1984, Chuck Hall patented the stereolithography method in the U.S., which had previously discovered and abandoned in France together with the company STL Digital File Format. Hall went down to found 3D Systems, one of the first companies to market 3D printers in 1987. In 1988, Scott Crump developed an alternative method of fused deposit modeling and founded the company Stratasys, which marketed their first printer in 1992. These earlier machines cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Concurrently in Europe, Dr. Hans Larger created the company EOS in Germany and developed the laser centering method. Throughout the 1990s, 3D printing was available at high prices, mostly used for rapid prototyping. The term 3D printing was popularized by MIT scientist Emmanuel Sachs, founder of the Z Corporation, another early innovator in the field of additive manufacturing. The late 1990s also saw the first biomedical printing. In 2004, EOS marketed three metal 3D printers, highly expensive and largely limited to industrial use. 3D printing technology were extremely expensive and therefore limited until around 2010. In 2005, Dr. Adrian Boyer of the University of Bath developed RepRap, project replicating rapid prototyping with the goal of developing affordable self-replicating 3D printers. RepRep was a nonprofit and open source organization. Some of the early members of RepRep founded MakerBot, maker the first affordable 3D printers marketed as a do-it-yourself kit. MakerBot was acquired by Stratasys in 2013. 2009, some of the original patents on additive manufacturing technology expired opening the markets to competitively priced 3D printers. Many important technological technologies important to additive manufacturing, like lasers and 3D scanners and modeling software, were further developed at the same time. 2012, 3D Systems released a popular desktop 3D printer for $1,200. Cheaper prices allowed 3D printers to experience exponential growth. 3D printers first gained mass media attention in 2012 with the controversy around 3D printed guns and publicly available files from which anyone could download to print a working gun. The U.S. government was involved in 3D printing from the beginning. The National Science Foundation had partially funded four out of six of the first major 3D printing processes. 
offering over 600 grants in excess of $200 million in the 1980s and 90s. 2012, President Obama created the National Additive Manufacturing Innovation Initiative and mentioned 3D printing in his 2013 State of the Union address. The Obama administration also helped found America Makes a Public-Private Partnership for Additive Manufacturing Technologies in Education, helping to popularize 3D printing and advance its use in industry and education. 3D printing has seen rapid growth, doubling nearly every three years with double-digit growth rates. Now hundreds of thousands of consumers are buying personal devices and tens of thousands of industrial printers are sold every year. 2019, over 1.1 billion was invested into added manufacturer startups with hundreds of new related patents filed every year. Over 50% of the 3D printing market in the, is in the United States of America and increases are expected to continue for decades. When 3D printing first became viable in the 1990s, it was used almost exclusively for rapid prototyping. Rapid prototyping are techniques used to create a scale model of a physical part using 3D computer design and 3D printing or additive manufacturing. Historically, to create a prototype was very costly and time consuming, either having to mill the part through subtractive manufacture or creating a mold to cast the part. Early 3D printers were almost exclusively in the research and development laboratories of major manufacturing corporations. The extremely high cost of the first printers was worthwhile because the high cost and time involved in using traditional methods to recreate prototypes. 3D printing also became economically viable for low run parts and for highly variable parts like medical implants, surgical implants need to be specific, specific for the pat patient and can't be mass produced. Thus dentistry was an early adapter of 3D printing where dentists could 3D scan the patient's teeth and print the implant instead of casting a mold uh, making even early, extremely expensive 3D metal printing economically viable. In the last few years, rapid improvements in the 3D printing has made 3D printing economically viable for industrial manufacture, but the 3D printing process is still relatively slow and parts need finishing after printing. It is unlikely in the near term 3D printing will displace traditional injection molding for mass runs. At present, it is only useful for highly configurable parts and small runs. 3D printing has also made a large impact in biomedical engineering, creating regenerative tissues capable of mimicking and replacing damaged tissue. 3D printers can be fitted with biocompatible ink, synthetic and natural polymers such as gelatin or collagen. Another interesting development is 4D printing, similar to 3D printing, but the resulting 3D shape is able to morph into different, different forms in response to environmental stimulus with the fourth dimension being time, creating a programmable matter. Currently, 3D printing accounts for less than 1% of global manufacture, but is predicted to keep growing now, doubling each three years, possibly in the future, accounting for tens of percent of global manufacture. Now, most research and development laboratories, universities, even libraries, and high schools have 3D printers, and a person can buy a 3D printer for just hundreds of dollars and download millions of designs from the internet. However, it is unlikely that 3D printing will soon displace traditional manufacture methods and will continue to mainly be used for rapid prototyping, highly configurable parts, such as surgical implants and small production runs. Also, the most common business models outsourcing the printing to specialty businesses that do the 3D printing, as 3D printing remains slow, expensive, and difficult. Even though many companies have a 3D printer to meet their printing demands, might require various machines, making it cheaper, quicker, and more efficient to outsource to a company that specializes in 3D printing. I broke from my regular essays on cognitive science through the Additive Manufacturing Conference this week and hope to return the next few weeks to cognitive science. However, I've been following 3D printing technology now for a decade and believe it is one of the great emerging technologies of the 21st century. So they have an advanced manufacturing uh, expo in Grand Rapids this weekend. It's only like a two and a half hour drive, but uh, not going to go. So the next essay was critical theory. Also uh, got over 500 views on the chess server. And this one I, is important because of you know the social connotations. And you know, it's pretty well known. And its role in uh, you know the cognitive revolution. So uh, putting all these together, you know, now now I'm looking through and reading through them to see how these all tie together. So I'm not sure if Jennifer's there. If, after I read this, if someone wants to come on and chat a few minutes, give my 
voice a chance to rest before I do uh, my last three essays. And then I have my uh, recent research into uh, the self. So let me go through this one quickly on critical theory, um, the Frankfurt School, and the cognitive revolution. Critical theory is an important theory related to consciousness and the cognitive revolution and another precursor to my multiple truth hypothesis. Unlike most of the other ideas I, I am covering, which are more theoretical, critical theory is a controversial idea at the forefront of current cultural wars such as critical race theory and intersectionality. Different from most theories, critical theory questions the role and purpose of science and knowledge, suggesting that ideas should change society and help emancipate people from falsehood, causing critical theory to be a driving force behind many of the global cultural changes in the last century with continued influence today. At the heart of critical theory is philosophical ideas applicable to all the social sciences and early attempt of an interdisciplinary approach to research, providing a unifying force in the cognitive revolution. In this essay, I will explain what critical theory is, the origins of the Frankfurt School and its current offshoot movements today, and the wider implications of the cognitive revolution and culture wars today. The Institute for Social Research was founded by Carl Grunsberg Grunz 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 in 1923 as an adjunct organization to Goethe University, Frankfurt, Germany. Grunberg was a Marxist professor of law at the University of Vienna, who found funding through a wealthy student, Felix Weil, a Marxist organizer. Weil organized the first Marxist work week, gathering leading Marxist thinkers in Frankfurt, many who joined the Institute for Social Research. The Institute focused mostly on promoting Marxism and published Marxism and Philosophy in the History of Class and Consciousness in 1923. In 1930, after the departure of Grunberg, Max Horkheimer became the director, and the Institute for Social Research became a multidisciplinary center for the integration of the social sciences, promoting a new form of Marxism. Hawkheimer recruited prominent intellectuals from various fields, such as Theodore Adorno, philosopher, sociologist, musicologist, Eric Fromm, psychoanalyst, and Herbert Marcuse, as most of the members of the Institute for Social Research were Jewish. After the rise of the Nazi party, the Institute relocated in 1933 to Geneva and found a new home in 1935 in New York City, housed at Columbia University. At the same time, Franz Boas was a leader in the field of anthropology and cultural relativism. The Institute reached its height of scholarship in America, but because its German origins was referred to as the Frankfurt School. In 1937, Hockheimer established the concepts of critical theory in the first manifesto tradition in critical theory, and over the next decades, the disciples of the Frankfurt School fully developed critical theory where the ideas reach wider audiences and application to social movements and is a leading factor to the cognitive revolution that changed the understanding of social science and cognitive research. Critical theory is better understood as a philosophical school, the Frankfurt School, and a cultural movement, but with some well-defined ideas at the center. Although the original members were mostly interested in advancing Marxism and critiquing other major philosophical schools of their day, some main ideas can be abstracted and applied towards general thought. The main precursors to critical theory are Hegel, Marx, and Kant, also influenced by Popper, Freud, and others. <coughs> the critical and critical theories is meant in the way used by Immanuel Kant, not in the negative sense of criticism, but a methodological practice of doubt from the original Greek meaning of the faculty of judgment, with a critique as a method of discipline, systematic study of discourse. Immanuel Kant in the late 18th century wrote a series of books, Critique of Pure Reason, 1978, Critique of Practical Reason, and Critique of Judgment, 1790. Kant's use of the term critique refers to reflective examination of the validity and limits of human capacity or of a set of philosophical claims. The critique can be extended to a systematic inquiry into the conditions and consequences of a concept theory or discipline attempting to understand their limitations and validity. George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel brought in the use of critique to the systematic inquiry into the limits of a doctrine or set of concepts. The Frankfurt School was responding to the tradition of German idealism, which attempted to bridge the gap between rationalism, holding knowledge can be attained by reason alone, and empiricism, holding knowledge can be arrived at only through the senses in line with David Hume. Kant's, Kant's critiques seek to rebut Hume, accepting that even though we depend on objects of experience to know anything about the world, we can still investigate the forms of our thoughts take 
and determine the boundaries of possible experience with reason. Hegel, recognizing the limits of abstract thought, sought to connect thought to historical realities, adding the elements of history and interaction with others to trace the formation of self-consciousness. Hegel is known for the Hegelian dialectic, a three-stage process of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. The thesis gives rise to a reaction leading to an antithesis, which contradicts the thesis, and the tension between the two is resolved by means of a synthesis. According to the Hegelian dialect, although the Hegelian dialectic is attributed to Hegel, Hegel used the terms abstract, negative, and concrete. Karl Marx adapted the Hegelian dialectic to the study of historical materialism, purporting to be a reflection of the real world created by man that could examine personal, social, and economic behaviors. Marx's dialectic is the direct opposite of the Hegelian dialectic, which examined the process of ideas and object of thought as an independent object. As per Marx, the idea of the material world reflected by the human mind translated into forms of thought. Dialectic materialism emphasizes the primacy of the material way of life, social practice over forms of consciousness, and focused on class struggle to comprehend the dialectic contradiction between mental and manual labor. The Frankfurt School rises in the tradition of Marx in opposition to German idealism, seeking not just to advance an understanding of mind and social structures, but to transform them. The Institute for Social Research was created as a vehicle to promote Marx's ideas, drawing on the traditions of Kant and Hegel, but also critical of the current state of capitalism and communism. One of the main movements to which the Frankfurt School arose in opposition to was logical positivism, which held that only statements verifiable through direct observation or logical proof are meaningful in conveying truth value, information, or factual content. The Frankfurt School sought to create special studies as a guide for human action aimed at producing enlightenment, enabling agents to determine true interest. They disputed the positivist empirical account of natural science attempting to objectify natural science. The early Frankfurt School sought to rehabilitate reflection as a category of valid knowledge and focused on ideology and forms of consciousness. A critical theory is a reflective theory which gives agents a kind of knowledge inherently productive of enlightenment and emancipation. Horkheimer was critical of positivist chaotic specialization of the science, claiming science fails to grasp its relationship with the very society which shapes its existence and future direction. Positivists disconnect science from society, creating facts devoid of context and destroying the potential for human emancipation. Max Horkheimer, as director of the Institute of, for Social Research, helped structure the basics of critical theory. In tradition critical theory, Horkheimer defined critical theory as a social theory oriented toward critiquing and changing society as a whole, in contrast to a traditional theory oriented only toward understanding or explaining it. Theories are critical in that they seek to liberate human beings from the circumstances that enslave them. Liberation is done through focusing on ideology and forms of consciousness. Forms of consciousness are socially necessary illusions to be understood in the historical context in which they are created to stabilize society, but eventually enslaving us to false ideology. These social structures repress people to create stability, often frustrating preference to a greater extent than needed to maintain or reproduce stable social structures. Ideologies are held with more confidence than the evidence warrants creating mass delusion, false consciousness, from which critical theories seek to emancipate. Radical criticism of society and its dominant ideology is the ultimate goal of social research, not just for the sake of moralizing, but the search for truth, and is a cognitive enterprise a form of knowledge. However, critical theory differs from the natural sciences and cognitive structures requiring basic changes in epistemological views we have inherited from traditional experiences. Scientific theories have instrumental use based on empirical confirmation and logical structures, whereas critical theories are reflective cognitive structures, part of the domain they describe, which allow people to become aware of hidden corrosion free from delusion. This puts us in a position to determine our own self-interest, employing critical theories as a vehicle of enlightenment emancipation. In America, Horkheimer and Adorno continued to develop critical theory, publishing Dialectics of Enlightenment, 1947, claiming enlightenment seeks to undermine myth by creating new myths and fully developed the method for, of critical theory. In 1950, Adorno and other thinkers changed direction from earlier Marxism and published the authority and authoritarian personality, trying to understand the Holocaust and causes of World War II and psychological motivations behind personality traits. 
the Frankfurt School was further developed by Herbert Marcuse into popular culture, applying critical theory to American culture, as were Horkheimer and Adorno's work, focused more on criticism relevant to pre-war Germany. 1955, Marcuse published Eros and Civilization, attempting to civilize, synthesize Marx and Freud, the title being a play on Freud's 1930 Civilization is Discontent. Marcuse questions Freud's claim that civilization is based on permanent subjugation of human instincts and applied what critical theory previously applied to class struggle and positivism to cultural challenges facing America, analyzing how advanced industrial society has created a fight against the repression of our instincts. Marcuse set the intellectual groundwork for social movements in the 1960s and made critical theory an integral part of the larger cognitive revolution in the 1950s and of interdisciplinary studies of the mind and its processes. In 1964, Marcuse published One Dimensional Man, fully applying critical theory to the cultural revolutions occurring in America, noting the decline in revolutionary potential in capitalist society and new forms of social control caused by consumerism. Consumerism has created false needs, integrating individuals into existing systems of production and consumption, diminishing critical thinking and oppositional behavior. Their critiques of society in one-dimensional mind are integral in the creation of the new left. Marcuse notes that dialectic thinking is capable of understanding contradictions, which constitute society and forces of dominion that sustain it. But modern consumerism has hidden the degree individuals are victims of the force of dominion, causing free acceptance of oppression and surplus repression, noting modern culture has a multiplicity of social groups seeking social change for varying reasons and a multiplicity of forms of oppression and repression that make revolution desirable. Full analysis of the effects of critical theory in the Frankfurt School on American and global culture is beyond the scope of this essay, but I wanted to trace the origins of critical theory to the creation of the Frankfurt School in Germany and its transplant into American society being part of the larger cultural revolutions of the 1960s. The modern effects of critical theory are seen most in critical race theory and intersectionality. Critical race theory is not directly based on the Frankfurt School, but is the application of critical theory to racial structures in the United States. Critical race theory has precursors in the American civil rights independent of the Frankfurt School, but can also be seen as a direct application of critical theory to racial dynamics and historical structures in America. Professor Tara Yoza describes critical race theory as a framework that can be used to theorize, examine, and challenge the ways race and racism implicitly and explicitly impact social structures, practices, and discourses, a definition largely in line with critical theories, Hegelian Marxist dialectic, and the goal of emancipating people from false forms of consciousness. Critical race theory started to rise in America in the 1970s after the cultural movement of the 1960s, focusing on the efforts to desegregate American schools and the writing of Harvard law professor Derek Bell related to critical race theory as the concept of intersectionality introduced by legal study, to legal studies by Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. Crenshaw advanced Marcuse's adoption of critical theory to American culture. Intersectionality is an analytical framework for understanding how aspects of a person's social and political identities combined to create different modes of discrimination and privilege, identifying multiple factors of advantage and disadvantage, such as gender, caste, sex, race, ethnicity, class, sexuality, religion, and more, with these intersecting and overlapping social identities capable of being empowering and impressing. Critical theory in the Frankfurt School are important both for understanding modern culture and the rapid changes occurring, but also a philosophical theory of mind and part of the larger cognitive revolution in a similar way to intersectionality drawing from the philosophical tradition of critical theory. The multiple truth hypothesis also can be seen as a philosophical tradition of trying to understand the multiple factors at play in our quest for truth. The Frankfurt School rose largely in opposition to positivism and how we understand science and created the groundwork for our modern understanding of the social sciences. The Frankfurt School was an early center for interdisciplinary studies, focusing on ideology and forms of consciousness that paved the way for the cognitive revolution in the 1950s, although critical theory did not adapt to the rise of neuroscience and computer science. Unlike cognitive dissonance that has been adapted into most modern neuropsychological <laughs> Models of consciousness of the predictive mind it is unclear whether critical theory has applications to the hard problem of consciousness, but the social ramifications of critical theory are possibly more relevant today than ever through advancements in intersectionality that has expanded the interdisciplinary approach the Institute of Social Research in originally proposed, used to promote Marxism in Frankfurt 
in the 1920s. Okay, so that's see if Jennifer, you want to hop on and uh, give my chance a voice a chance to rest. Okay, there she is. So, uh, you there, Jennifer? Hi. Can you Congrats. hear me? Yeah, you're fine. So, uh, I'm not sure if you were listening to all that. Skyworks, thanks for tuning in. Hi, T. Um, Captain, I think I've got a, got a minion here. And uh, it was interesting for myself just to go over this and think about these kind of semi-divergent ideas that are... Um, uh, I'll call. I don't know how to how to put it, but uh, you because there you know the multiple theories that have overlap, but are somewhat independent. So just reading through them was uh, you know somewhat enlightening. I watched the video also, and uh, you know just trying to advance my work. If you want to just uh, you know give a, a recap on you know, my first uh, seven uh, eight essays uh, while I uh, check my phone and get another drink. I'll I'll give it a shot. Nice to see everyone in the chat. Well, uh, Duvid's blog started out with a post on psychological theories of. Sorry, I'm at the wrong end of it here. Started out with a uh, memory techniques and chunking theory. And I think that's good. That was on April 17th. And I originally um, mentioned uh, the idea about writing as sort of a justification for another writing on a memory technique. Because talking... Taking something that you understand in a practical sense and expressing it, not every, not all practical knowledge can be expressed like systematically or axiomatically or however you want to say it. But uh, I sort of suggested these as a corpus to sort of build up to. A justification for well look at all this uh it's a it's a set it's a bunch of anecdotes that substantiate the position that well this memory technique is really awesome because it's kind of hard to say like <laughs> it's one thing to say hey i have a memory technique um that's another to say i can tie it directly to my success so uh that was what the first article was and then it led into covering the uh, Science Consciousness Conference, uh, which I was appreciative that Duvid paid for my attendance for, as well as an article on cognitive dissonance, which I appreciated because it's always, you know, nice to have uh, this. <laughs> I, I mean, it's a pillar in my at least psychological models. And uh, for those of you who follow my work, I've seen that cognitive dissonance comes up in a lot of topics, even if we're not explicitly discussing psychology. Then we had Kotov's chess candidate moves, analysis trees, and general decision making, 3D printers, and additive manufacturing, where the writings took a decisively uh, technical turn. Uh, veering back into a little bit more uh, sociological studies, we have critical theory, Frankfurt School, and cognitive revolution. Uh, dipping more into Hindu stuff, we have Ahimsa Principle, Mystical Approaches to Meaning of Chess, and then sort of threading back to psychological theories of self and identity. So I like that it hasn't been just one topic. It's been sort of threading a topic shirt. And... That's going along with what I had originally seen it as, which was like this 
still a good idea in itself, but ultimately a foundation for like a stepping off point to, for actually doing something which would not only be beneficial for humanity, but also probably for yourself, because that process of actually going through and like not just uh, expressing the MTH in words, which I, you know, support that, but also your own memory technique or techniques. So hopefully I gave a good uh, summary there. You're back. I don't know if you want to interject uh, or if I talked enough about uh, the individual articles, like uh, probably didn't give enough of a, you can just make me tiny because I'm not on the camera there. You can full screen yourself. I won't be offended just so you know, I'll let you take over if you want to. Yeah, no, I'm actually, I'm using uh, the my, my old PC to screen share from. So, so when I do it, it makes you the big one. So that's fine. Um, yeah, I mean, thanks for encouraging me to write. So like it's twofold. There's one I want to publish a book on the multiple truth hypothesis. But, uh, you know, if I get more into writing, I, I'd like to just write about all types of interesting things. Um, you know, like I said, the first essay I did on the hero's journey in music and culture. So like to put that to, uh, your know, writing's a lot of work. And uh, you have an audience, so you know. I'm gonna try to stream a little more. Um, I have to do a lot of research. I want to accomplish something. So just like writing articles that hardly anyone reads, I think I'm better off focusing on my bigger research because I'm still in a, you know, like a more research phase than a publishing phase. Um, but yeah, I'd like to be at a point at some point, you know, maybe in the next few years, where I, I would pump out, you know, maybe even. To, you know, two articles a week on just random uh, various topics. Uh, you know, that could be science, technology, culture, uh, music. Uh, but, you know, the overall, overall goal, like I said, uh, you know, I'm a goal-directed per person, and I, I want to move forward towards publishing my book. You know, hopefully, you, you know, you're moving forward, or, or you know, us as co-authors in a scientific paper, and... So there's a two twofold function for you know me publishing my book on multiple truth hypothesis. Um, I'm still doing a lot of the research, like because reality, I have to do a lot of research still, um, and so I'm just sharing some of that research because it's interesting, at least to you know to Jennifer or, or some audience. And then there's the due diligence for the historical background for a scientific paper. So any of these ideas, like if I wanted to, you know, publish a book quality for a scientific journal, it would have to have the due diligence of the historical background analysis, where you really have to exhaustively know the similar and competitive ideas that are out there, and, that, and it's it's a uh, you know, like PhD level. You have to have a PhD because like you know PhD is you know close to ten years of university. If you're like you know five years. Uh, you, you know, your first undergraduate, but like five years of postgraduate studies, you could be expected to have read all of the important literature on your topic, which, uh, you know, could be thousands of books, you know, even to, that, you know, to at some point, like uh, where you're a master in the field, uh, you could be expected to know all the major stuff. So, you know, trying to be exhaustive in, uh, you know, so looking at these, there's a lot of overlap in these ideas and you know writing about it and how I structure that. So it's good to talk this out and think through. And uh, you know, now I'm researching self and multidisciplinary studies. Usually like the critique of critical theory is most disciplines are distinct and only use the precursors in their own field. And you could bring in multidisciplinary things and then just reading through it, like, oh, that's kind of similar, uh, like, you know, like critical theory to psychology, but critical theory is more in the realm of uh, um, anthropology or sociology than psychology. So, you know, if you social psychology, so a lot of the stuff on identity and self doesn't actually mention critical theory. So just putting that for myself, um, Samish too, if uh, if you want to hop on, Samish, uh, the link is in the chat, and uh, you know talk about a little bit of my research and my essays, and 
you know, so just trying writing in general, plus my research, and I'm going to, uh, you know, I have three more essays to review that uh, the Ahimsa principle and mystical approaches to the meanings of chess that were the most popular. And then my last one, psychological theories on self and identity formation. And then I have uh, um, over 10 pages of note on self and uh, identity, you know, identity formation. So I was going to go over some of that, just trying to put it together. And, you know, so there's a whole bunch of theories and a lot of them are concurrent coming out at the same time, have similar axioms, have conflicting axioms, uh, you know, trying to answer certain questions or have different purposes. Some of them are pure uh, theories of mind and your know, personality psychology. Some of them are more therapeutic theories that have a use. Some of them have been empirically tested through psychometrics and longitudinal studies. Uh, you know, some of them are purely introspective. And so for, you know, this essay I'm going to write is just going to be historical review. But when I eventually come through with the multiple truth hypothesis, I'm going to try to say something unique and new, and I'm going to try to use the multiple truth hypothesis through the historical analysis of current theories in order to take, so to say, the you know the best the best of uh, the current theories, and recognizing that there's different schools of thoughts with conflicting axioms. You know, like like I said, critical theory and cognitive dissonance and theories of self and behavioralism, um, you know, all might have useful things to, uh, to add. So I'm, I'm not sure, uh, you know, yeah, I, if, you know, Jennifer, I'm a pretty technical writer also, like, you know, so I'm much similar to Jennifer, like I'm an INTP, uh, Myers-Briggs. Um, my writing's pretty dense and technical, you know, like, but, but I, I've developed, you know, like the first essays on the hero's journey, and the narrative arc, you, you know, developing the narrator's voice. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to encourage Jennifer to try to develop some sort of narrator's voice, hero's journey, so where she can have an eye that is explaining stuff to people in a value proposition, but it could kind of be completely impersonal technical information, um, but it's very hard and difficult to read just impersonal technical information but at some level i actually like textbooks and impersonal technical um information but i think you know that's part of what's holding up my writing like it, like i have to si uh, systematize the ideas in my head and then i have to find my narrator's voice for like the hero's journey of the eye that is explaining it and you know so jennifer Maybe some of her ideas are systematized and she could put in a technical form. Some of her ideas, she still has to systematize more. Um, some there's, you know, there, there's due diligence that even if you're an impersonalized uh, textbook informative uh, for a scientific writing or publishable standards, you have to do the due diligence of the historical review and uh, place the ideas within the current context of information. And then, you know, the actual narrative arc of the hero's journey, who is this I that did all the hard work of gathering and synthesizing this information to give it over to other people. So uh, if you actually want to ramble another few minutes, I, I just popped in a TV dinner. So hopefully eating that will <laughs> allow me to uh, get ready to uh, re read some more. So you'll be reading about your... Uh self notes well I, I actually if i can i'm going to read all of uh self notes i'm going to read all of my essays so i have three more to read and these are actually longer than the other ones then i'm going to read my notes so it'll probably take me you know i might even go for another like two hours but uh you know if you just stick around a few minutes so i can eat my tv dinner you want to stick around you can but uh, or, or come back later to go over the self notes after i read or comment on um my last three essays but we just want to ramble like a five minutes while i pound down this uh, tv dinner sure hi everyone i know you came here for duvet and unfortunately you're getting the 
um, I don't even want to say discount version because that's not really it either. I feel like a, in a lot of ways, dude and I have complementary um, skill sets, which is why I think the show has, you know, it's not always performing at 100%, but I think it has the potential to be <laughs> something special. Samish says uh, MTH uh, presupposes some kind of relativistic point of view. Critical theories of Marcuse and Habermas, as well as Hawk. Heimer reject all other theories that attempt to analyze capitalist modern societies. So I've been saying for a while uh, that the self is, a, I don't know how you could possibly talk about that in an essay form. You'd have to qualify it in a way that made sense, and then just the, to me, the mere um, act of qualifying it was sort of seemed to be more information than you could fit in a book. So I'm, you know, I support the idea of writing, even if I think that it's unrealistic to encompass a topic in a short uh, essay in any uh, realistic sense. It's, it's just awesome to see where it goes because I had no idea that there was this much work that had gone on into various uh, theories of self. And I really uh, study pretty much just physics, so to have a systematized, uh, short form, systematized summary of other fields where I don't think you can just make everything physics, but I think you can make a lot of things better with physics, uh, namely calibration of measurements. So. Well, I'm going to circle back to the mathematics and physics and the essential formulation of multiple truth hypotheses will be in mathematical language, maybe similar to uh, you like the structure of the free energy principle or active inference. And so, you know, hopefully Jennifer will help me with that. And as I'm going to pivot back to the Schrodinger wave equation, um, multiverse and a logical algorithmic production of the multiple truth hypothesis. So, uh, you know, said so that you know, like critical theory applied to um, social phenomena and theories of mind, but also have a pure logical structure of you know, maybe like a Bayesian type analysis of uh, just breaking down you know, like the, the truth discovery function would, that would break down axioms and have an algorithm that would be able to uh, uh, take various axioms of different systems and attempt to create a truth, uh, a, a truth function or an estimated value. So that that would be the basic level of the multiple truth hypothesis. But I'm going to have to circle back around to that. So I'm going to like as of now, it's probably half a year away till I get get back into uh, the math and physics of it and uh, but, but uh, it's definitely going to have that aspect to it also and Jennifer will probably be most help uh, when, when I pivot uh, you know when I circle back to that and uh, you know the correspondence of our work but at least she finds interesting you know because most of it you know related to theories of mind and consciousness even if it's more psychological uh, introspective than uh, mathematical or, or physics. I think it's awesome that you think you're going to get to that point in half a year. Uh, you've been talking about MTH for a while. You haven't written anything about it. So it might end up being one of those things that is actually maybe not 100% writable about. Well, Just from my own experience. Like MTH it has will have to be an equation, a mathematical algorithm. So I, I could write a book called Multiple Truth Hypotheses and just analyze a whole bunch of things and write out this common thread that there's uncertainty and as opposed to looking for the truth and trying to find out what's right among the uncertainty, that the truth is uncertainty in multiple truths. Um, and so, you know, worst case, I'll, you know, hopefully I'll write the book and that, that would probably be the theme of it, you know, Multiple Truth Hypotheses, and I'll examine... Uh, these various uh, 
fields where it appears that you know, like the new Mysterians that uh, that uh, we're never going to get to the bottom of it. But there's these multiple possibility solutions to it, and uh, you know, just keep circling around the and how to deal with that. Um, but you know, so if there is a heart to the multiple truth hypothesis, it would have to be in some sort of uh, mathematical, logical, structured equation, which doesn't mean you're going to be able to solve, and it would still just be theoretical. They're saying it's a multiple truth hypothesis because the speculation is there is no singular truth. You know, like the people in the chat, you know, like making fun of Duvid for being a Hindu Jew. Um, you're saying you can't be one or the other. Saying, well, there's not one truth. It's not like you're going to, there's, you know, one or the other. It's going to be uncertainty and uh, mystery from now till forever. And therefore, the best we could do is to structure the uncertainty. And that's what multiple truth hypothesis is aiming to do. But as I said, like the basis of it is going to have to be some sort of uh, mathematical basis. And I don't need to circle around like, like six months. You can talk separate. about your thing as long as you want. I think it's great. Um, I have well, similar I mean, the, the, the ideas. Six months, I meant that in terms of the essays that you know, like my research in term and pu putting out the information that uh, you know, I'm doing self now. Then I can move into expertise, and then I might do a few other things that, uh, you know, half a year from now, I'm going to go back to, hopefully I'll, 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 I'll circle the round, or I'll start coming back to overviews of, uh, you know, logic, math, and physics, at least in my weekly writings. Why are you putting it off? Um... It's just the, I mean, I could be doing, because it's a lot of work, a lot of research, and, and uh, the math and physics is more technical, so I could be doing, like, the history of math and physics, uh, but, you know, the actual formulas is very difficult, and I may not, uh, you know, be able to really uh, grasp it on that level, and, and I think that it's, uh, as a theory of consciousness, um, I think I have the most advancements to help that the value proposition will be in a theory of expertise. So with regards to MTH? Yeah, it's saying as a memory technique and the memory technique will be more properly housed as a theory of expertise in cognitive psychology than um, like neurology or something like that. So I'm gonna focus now, like, cause there's a value proposition more to the theory of expertise than my writing on math and physics because I think I have, um, I mean, I'll be able to write, I'm pretty uh, confident, uh, you know, God willing, useful overviews and uh, historical analysis of math and physics, but I'm not really sure I have anything to offer. I don't, not, I don't think I'm going to like come up with some new mathematical or physics I theory. I wasn't, well, you said you wanted but, to but write. But I do think I'm going to be able to come logic. up with was I do think I'm going to be able to come up with new theories and expertise and possibly chunking theory. So but I'll be able to formulate. did you say you wanted to write MTH as an equation? I do want to write it as an equation. Okay. I'm not sure that that's going to have advancements in like the study of mathematical logic as where I do think specifically the field of expertise okay. is where that's I'm going to have the most advancements where I'm saying is the most unique and most important to the current state of research. So that's why I'm going to pivot back around and first get to expertise because there I think I'm going to be pushing the current state of knowledge forward as where I'm going to try to formulate the multiple truth hypothesis as a mathematical logical theory, but I'm not sure that I'm going to advance uh, you know, the, the field of math or logic or physics. Well, it's very hard to do that. But now I think I see what you're saying and i agree because expertise is um expertise like the fact that okay there is very little to draw as a common thread between expertise domains except that they might admit some what could be described as an axiomatic decomposition so in that sense the visual of being able to and I don't know if it's exactly what you're seeing it as, but like rank axioms arbitrarily. 
and say, well, in this domain, like this axiom is sort of the, these three axioms are the most important ones, but then we go over to this one, well, it's, it's these four, you know, something like that. Anyway, I, uh, I didn't, I guess Stuvid is still eating, so he probably wants me to keep rambling. And he's got a delicious um, vegetarian treat. I don't know if they have Amy's near you, but just Amy's uh, TV dinners that are vegetarian and kosher. Um, I have not had a TV dinner in quite a while. When I need something quick, I usually go for um, pasta. That's about 10 minutes. So yeah, the uh, the MTH, uh, I mean, I don't know how much math you need to research or whatever background, like, you'd need to research to actually formulate it if you see it primarily being applied to expertise, which kind of doesn't seem like what you said, you're not going to be pushing forward anything new in physics or math. So you'd just be, um, your attitude on math would just be like utilitarian. So like what math do we need to use to substantiate the position or does substantiating the position uh, necessitate math, I guess. Something to that effect. So I think this is going to, this is going to take a really long time. That's why I had the intermediary goal of like, cause to me, your memory technique and MTH, those are different things. Are you telling me they're one and the same or like not? Did I misunderstand that? I think I'm going to call my memory technique MTH also. Because I mean, now, that's, if that's, it's not the same thing, why would you give it the same name? Because like this is pretty dang confusing stuff. I'm not just saying that. Well, I'm saying all memory techniques are a form of chunking. So I think you could argue that. that. My unique memory technique is a form of chunking, but it's a different form of chunking, like a like a schema template form that I think I'll still call multiple truth hypothesis, but uh, it might better have a more technical feel uh, name of some sort of uh, – schematic chunking what about but, simul uh, chunking well i think i'll i think multiple truth hypothesis will applicably describe as a memory technique that uh, that uh, that uh, you have that you're having multiple schematic chunks and that you know so as a memory technique that the the concept is is applicable to you know the basic understanding of multiple truth hypothesis where there's schemas and conflicting schemas and as a memory technique um the the idea is to have these multiple schemas that are conflicting and the reason it works as a memory technique is because you could chunk data to the relevant schema so if you have conflicting data that usually causes issues in a person's memory but as a memory technique the idea is that you could still chunk conflicting data. So you, usually the cognitive dissonance of the conflicting data makes it hard to remember. But if you just have conflicting schema in your head, then you don't have to resolve the dissonance. You could just chunk the data to the relevant schema. And you know, so if there's one conflicting piece of information, I'll chunk that to uh, the schema where it's not conflicting and uh, in order to, you know, so that's how it would work as a memory technique and why it makes sense to call it a multiple truth hypothesis. Um, I don't want to get an argument, but I don't think it's a good idea to give them the same name unless you truly believe that the manner in which you think can be described exhaustively by that. And uh, I certainly didn't get that, uh, that impression. Well, I do, because the memory technique... Uh, necessitates multiple truths that like 
if it's Hinduism and Judaism are, are just two things and they're conflicting. And so when you want to remember something, it's difficult to remember it because you want to reject one or the other. He's like, no, this is false and rejected. And therefore it's harder to remember. But you say, no, I have two different schemas in my head. And so when I have conflicting data, um, like a method of Loki, that you just chunk it to a different visualization, even though they're conflicting. So if you have two conflicting pieces of information, um, you could memorize them by chunking them to different schemas. And so it is a multiple truth hypothesis uh, memory technique because, the, because you could only do it by having conflicting schemas that are capable of chunking new information because generally it's, it's you can't chunk information that's conflicting to the schema you could only chunk information that fits into a uh, already worked out schema and so when you have contradictory information to the schema that ruins the ability to to chunk it because uh it makes the schema invalid well that explains why you're always bringing up group uh, group conflict theories because you could basically describe what you're describing as sort of modeling on that basis, but understanding that the models are sort of, they're necessarily incomplete. What Samish said, this is, MTH can't be reduced to a mathematical equation. This, this idea that like only certain classes of facts or whatever you want to call them can be made equational or procedural or whatnot. I give the simplest, like on a given person, like let's say, oh, the, you know, I have a schema of Jennifer and there's two people giving me conflicting information, one negative, one positive, and maybe even opposite piece of information where one person is saying the opposite of what the other person is saying. So if you have two different schemas in my head, like, you know, the good Jennifer and the bad Jennifer schema, that way I don't, you know, not just one schema of, uh, you know, one uh, unified uh, Jennifer, then it become difficult. So if two people come with conflicting information, I won't be able to chunk it to uh, one unified picture because it's conflicting. But if I have two different schemas in my head, schemata in my head, then I will be able to chunk the conflicting information to the two different schem schemata that have conflicting axioms. And there's also a reduction, this occurs to me, that there's less of an expectation that fact patterns have to conform to any particular set of axioms. Because by using multiple axioms, you're sort of assuming, or it's structurally implicit, that neither is the correct answer. And so there's maybe a double, a doubling in the efficiency of the model. Because we've got to remember, like, what is this ultimately coming back to is, um, well, it doesn't, it's not just about this, but improving memory is a big part of it, a very big part of it. So basically anything that can improve that, I'm in favor. Anyway, welcome back, David. I was just uh, saying how uh, this other I, possible argument for your position is that by taking at least two axiom sets, you know, if you're going to say reduce reasoning to axiomatic inference models and presuppose at least two, the presupposition of a simultaneously processing like that is that neither of them is absolutely true if you need two to create a composite. I don't know if that totally made sense, but it made sense in my head. <clears throat> yeah, well, I was saying that if the you're from like a multiple truth perspective as a truth value, so like, okay, maybe it makes sense. It has a level of making sense, and that could be chunked. So you chunk the information of saying, well, not like, okay, was it true or false? And if it's false, it wasn't worth storing. Uh, but it's saying it has a relative value, and then it could be chunked together in a schemata 
and uh, so I have to work it work it out more and go more in detail into uh, chunking theory. Uh, but you know, the because I mean, memory techniques are basically all a form of chunking. So uh, you know, within that aspect, I think multiple truth hypothesis could be used to explain memory and then to improve the use of memory. Um, and then if that was demonstrable as a technique where that, that, uh, that in a said it makes sense to call it multiple truth hypothesis. Cause like the reason you're having a hard time remembering is because of your insistence on assessing things as true or false, as opposed to just, uh, forming schemas and attaching the information to the relevant schemas. Or, or even I'm like a. Or do seeing where this goes because I think uh, it's a great benefit to humanity to have something that technical written for a lay audience. Okay, so why don't I uh, keep on reading? So, what's what's your schedule? If you want, you could stay on, and I'll read these next three essays. Or if you want to say something after I read them, and then and then we could go over uh, the notes for what I'm planning for the next one together. Or if you if you have to go, you could go. So it's up to you. I'll hop off and then listen in the chat, and can come back later. Okay, so I'll probably be like 45 minutes, 30 30 minutes maybe. If, to an hour going over these three essays, and I'm going to try to go over uh, my notes. I mean, if you want, you can just stay on and mute yourself, or you can hop off, doesn't matter. Okay, I'll stay on. Okay, so this next essay, The Ahimsa Principle, is my most popular essay. 255 hearts, over 7,738 7, views on the chess server, it was the most popular um, popular blog on the chess server for like a week, and it was in the top few for like almost a, almost a month. And uh, so, and it came from my appearance on Jai Davies. You can see I made uh, this uh, PowerPoint presentation that uh, appeared on uh, Jai Davies' show and you know, living living according to the Hemsa principle during uh, times of conflict, and because I had already did the work to make the PowerPoint, um, it was uh, um, I mean, it still took some work, but but it was relatively you know easy to put that into an essay form. So and then uh, you know like the Hemsa principle is important and. People don't know that much about it. It's like Judaism is very controversial. In fact, like I had so much positive feedback from Hindus and Indians from the Ahimsa Principle article. Like, God forbid, I never get positive feedback from Jews for like talking about Torah or Judaism because it, like it's a different nature to it. So like even like you know, occasionally people thank me for my YouTube channel or my content, um, but like there's a lot of uh, sectarianism among Jews and I don't get much positive feedback for uh, you know, trying to explain Judaism, even though my ask the rabbi series, is probably my most popular thing on YouTube. Um, and I, I plan on continuing with that, but I, I think, you know, the Himsa principle is very important. It's not well known. And it's something I talk about often. And, um, you know, me and Jennifer hopefully are going to go into more, Vedic psychology soon, but like so, I'm gonna have to finish with my next essay and move into expertise, and hopefully concurrently after I finish um, the self, then I'm gonna move into expertise. But at the same time, I'm also gonna move into Vedic theories of self, and um, maybe those will be well, but more well received. Maybe I'll try like Kabbalistic uh, um, conceptions of self or like uh, Hasidic psychology but like god forbid there's a lot of sectarianism within judaism 
and uh and like you know i don't get much positive feedback it's unfortunate so that, that so you know, like that's something i know a lot about and be interesting like uh you know to do work on uh you know cassitic psychology uh or something like that but that's also another possibility so the ahimsa principle one of the central tenets that guides my life is the ahimsa principle the ahimsa principle comes from dharmic religions rising in india namely jainism buddhism and hinduism Ahimsa is mentioned in some of the earliest texts known to man. Ahimsa means without harm. In Sanskrit, the A at the beginning of the word is a negation, and himsa means harm or violence. This is similar to the word Hamas in the Bible, which also means violence, Genesis 6.11. The simplest understanding of the Ahimsa principle means a life free of violence. In Dharmic philosophy, Ahimsa is not only a moral principle, but a central theological concept of the functioning of the material and spiritual worlds and the purpose of life. In this essay, I will trace the origins of the Ahimsa principle from the first mentions in Vedic texts to widespread applications today in the modern world. I will also examine some of the larger philosophical implications of the Ahimsa principle related to karma, the self-improvement process, and the outlook for understanding the meaning of life. The earliest Vedic texts, such as the Rig Veda, Manu Smriti, Dharma Sastras, and more, include Ahimsa as a central tenet and moral precept to live by. The Manu Smriti includes Ahimsa as the first of five restraints, uh, for personal behavior among truthfulness, non-stealing, coveting, purity of mind and body, and control of the senses. Ahimsa is singled out as a precept applicable to all people regardless of caste. Almost all the Dharmic texts name Ahimsa as one of the most important principles, as in the famous statement of the Mahabharata, Ahimsa Prama Dharma, Ahimsa is the highest moral virtue. The Bhagavad Gita mentions Ahimsa four times in lists of essential character traits. In Buddhism, Ahimsa is the first of the five precepts all Buddhists are expected to live by. On a basic level, Ahimsa is understood as the reason for vegetarianism, as the Ahimsa principle applies to all of creation, fellow humans, animals, and the environment, prohibiting killing animals for meat due to unnecessary harm. Ahimsa also serves as a general guideline for all decisions in life, with a general standard of minimization of harm to be factored into all actions. The concept of Ahimsa is central, most central and detailed in the Jain religion, not only being the main moral precept to live by, but a fundamental principle of creation. Before turning to Jainism, let's look at the role of Ahimsa principle in Krishna consciousness. In Krishna consciousness, bhakti, love, or devotion is the main principle, but Ahimsa is still an important principle, clearly mentioned four times in the Bhagavad Gita and lists the main tenets. The Sriman Bhagavatam states, a candidate for spiritual advancement must be nonviolent, must follow in the footsteps of the great Acharyas, must always remember the pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, must follow all the regulative principles without material desire, and while following the regulative principles, should not blaspheme others. A devotee should lead a very simple life and not be disturbed by the duality of opposing elements. He should learn to tolerate them. Sri Prabhupada, in his commentary in this verse in Srimad Bhagavatam, writes, the devotees are actually saintly persons or sadhus. The first qualify, qualification of a sadhu or devotee is ahimsa or nonviolence. Persons interested in the path of devotional service or going back to God, back home, back to Godhead, must first practice ahimsa or nonviolence. A devotee should be tolerant and should be very compassionate towards others. For example, if he suffers personal injury, he should tolerate it. But if someone else suffers injury, the devotee need not tolerate it. The whole world is full of violence, and a devotee's first business is to stop the violence, including the unnecessary slaughter of animals. A devotee is the friend not only of human society, but of all living entities, for he sees all living entities as sons of the Supreme Person of Godhead. He does not claim himself to be only son of God and allow all others to be killed, thinking they have no soul. This kind of philosophy is never advocated by a pure devotee of the Lord. Sudra Sarvam Dhanam, a true devotee, is the friend of all living entities. This is called ahimsa. Such nonviolence can be practiced only when we follow in the footsteps of the great Acharyas. We'll examine soon the role of violence in Sri Prabhupada's dispute with Gandhi over pacifism and the true meaning of ahimsa, but clearly ahimsa is of primal importance in Krishna consciousness. Devotees of Krishna focus on bhakti, love of God, seeing ahimsa as a derivative principle of bhakti. The path of speculative knowledge and renunciation is not essential for devotional service. Indeed, good qualities such as nonviolence and control of the mind and senses automatically accompany a Lord, a devote of Lord Krishna from Sri Chaitanya Kirtamrita Madalila. But the concept of ahimsa is clearly a primal, primary directive 
and meaning behind sudra sarva danam, a meaning a devotee is a friend to all living beings. However, in Krishna consciousness, ahimsa is be achieved through bhakti, love and devotion, not austerities as in Jainism. Although the theological connection between karma and ahimsa is largely the same, only different in focus and method. The ahimsa principle is most fully developed in the teachings of Jainism, uh, being the fundamental principle of the Jain religion. People might be familiar with Jain monks sweeping the path before them to make sure that not to kill any insects, but within Jainism, the Ahimsa principle is not merely a fundamental moral principle to live by, but a theological concept that helps explain the purpose of creation, origins and destinations of the soul, and the inner workings of the spiritual and material realms. As in most Dharma traditions, Jains believe in karma, action, reaction, result of all past and present activities, samsara, cycle of birth and death, moksha, release from samsara, and varna ashrama, duties and stages of life. Deeper understandings of the soul and karma center on the ahimsa principle. The jiva is the formless eternal soul, and the ajiva, the temporal living material form, and karma is the dust that covers and weighs down the jiva into samsara preventing moksha. Violation of the ahimsa principle causes the accumulation of bad karma. Following the ahimsa principle is the main method of not accumulating bad karma. In the classic Jain text, Expositions of Explanations, there are eight types of karma, four harming and four non harming. The four harming types of karma are delusory attachment to incorrect views, knowledge obscuring, interfering with both intellect and senses, perception obscuring, blocking mental and intellectual capacity for perception and sense organs, and obstacles, blockage of energy force inherent in the jiva. The main practice is of Jainism are vows of austerity, all centering around the ahimsa principle and a voluntary renunciation of activities with the goal of limiting harmful activities. The goal of the vows of austerity is to shed accumulated bad karma through sacrifice and the cessation of acquiring new bad new karma leading to enlightenment and eventual moksha these austerities include not just action but in speech and thought purifying not only the body but the heart speech and mind although certainly seizing harmful actions is a first step enlightenment comes from eventual purity of mind another important jain concept is anekanantavada and uh, without one side many sidedness a Jain doctrine about metaphysical truths that is an ancient precursor to my multiple truth hypothesis and related to Ahimsa. In future essays, I will turn to a deeper analysis of Jain theology, but Ahimsa is not only the central doctrine of the Jain religion, but the fundamental concept to understand the origins and destination of the soul the, and purpose of creation and the Ahimsa principle's central tenet from which other tenets derive. All Dharmic societies are based on the Himsa principle, including the foundation of the modern state of India. One of Mahatma Gandhi's main slogans was Ahimsa Prama Dharma, and meaning Ahimsa is the highest moral virtue. Gandhi's main philosophy is Satyagraha, uh, holding firmly to truth, is based on the two principles of truth and Ahimsa. Regarding the Ahimsa principle, Gandhi referred to Ahimsa as the bedrock of Satyagraha, the irreducible minimum to which Satyagraha adheres, and the final measure of its value. Besides, is a moral virtue to live by, Gandhi held Ahimsa to be a scientific principle to which law and governance of society could be derived. However, many Hindus disagree with Gandhi's position on Ahimsa as an absolute value leading to pacifism, but a relative principle where violence in many cases needed. The main idea is that the totality of violence be reduced for the Ahimsa principle to be upheld. As in the Mahabharata and the Battle of Kurusetra, where Arjun is advised by Krishna to go to war, uh, Krishna returns to restore Dharma, even using violence in order to restore society back to proper dharma while minimizing violence in totality. Many interpret the Ramayana in terms of just war theory and the Ahimsa principle where violence is the last resort, but justice must be restored and vanquished in the wicked ultimately reduces suffering. But even in cases where violence is required to reduce the overall level of violence, the Ahimsa principle is always the main guiding principle that dictates action, especially on the battlefield as using violence even to ultimately, ultimately reduce violence should be the option of last resort. Although the Himsa principle derives from Dharmic religions, is applicable to all peoples. Many Western movements are greatly influenced by the Himsa principle. Utilitarianism has parallels to the Himsa principles, but usually formulating the opposite terminology of maximization of benefits for the majority as opposed to minimization of suffering. The non-aggression principle in modern libertarianism also parallels the Ahimsa principle more related to limited government and personal freedoms, but formulated on the logic of minimization of harm. Dr. Martin Luther King based much of his civil rights activism on the principle of nonviolence. 
crediting Gandhi and Dharmic traditions. Dr. Martin Luther King himself made pilgrimage to India in 1959 and credited Gandhi Satyagraha as a large influence. Without directly tracing the origins of Western movements to Vedic origins, they can still be interpreted as applications and derivatives of the Ahimsa principle. The word Ahimsa has only entered the Western lexicon to a limited extent, but the concept has become increasingly popular in response to constant war and damage to the environment. Often the biblical traditions put man at the center of creation and tend towards interpretation of a fight of good versus evil that normalize constant struggle and damage to the environment. Vegetarianism is spreading rapidly in response to increased awareness of unnecessary suffering caused to animals, negative health effects, and damage to the environment. The movement of universal humanism is also spreading in response to constant warfare group struggles and awareness of the unnecessary suffering of fellow humans. Many connect increased vegetarianism and universal humanism with dharmic religions, but even seen as independent movements can still be understood as derivatives of the Ahimsa principle. The more the Ahimsa principle spreads, we can hope to decrease suffering and negative aspects of society, and people can openly factor the minimization of harm into governance of society. The Ahimsa principle is not simply a principle that governs actions, but our hearts, speech, and mind, uh, but is important for internal purification and character refinement. Although many people may not be familiar with the long history and deep theology of Ahimsa, the elimination of unnecessary pain and suffering is an obvious and altruistic and worthy goal. We have a tendency for selfishness and to amplify our own suffering and diminishing the suffering of others, hence the need for a larger principle to understand the role of suffering and noble goal of reducing suffering. In future essays, I will return to Dharma principles, but due to the importance of primary to Ahimsa, started with Ahimsa, of all our actions, thought, and speech can and should be guided by the Ahimsa principle, Gauging whether it's harmful or not, the realm of action is the most important to start as we can cause extreme harm to ourselves and others through action, but ahimsa should be equally applied to speech, which can also cause great harm to ourselves and others, and eventually applied to thought, purifying the nature of our own minds. The dharmic traditions not only provide great guidance for the governance of our actions in society, but the purification of our own minds and hearts and possibly possibility of liberation. So thank God this is my most popular essay by far, uh, June 19th, almost two months ago. I hope to uh, do more in that realm. Welcome to Tinkle and uh, more. Um, so building on the popularity of the Himsa principle, you know, on the chess server uh, was actually the most popular article. I wrote the next one on chess and mystical approaches to the meaning of chess and that was also um well received only 88 hearts but over 5,000 views and uh you know these are topics i'm going to return to chess is going to be one of the main things like if i end up writing i could see being a popular chess author, I could see putting out like an article related to chess weekly. So you know, once I get through the self, also one of the reasons I'm going through self and then expertise is that I think once I do that, I could regularly put out chess articles that, uh, um, and I would like to also put out regular stuff on Vedic ideas, but there's a lot more research and, uh, you know, chess is something I could probably regularly put out stuff, but I need to finish my research on expertise. And so, you know, that's why I'm going to finish uh, th this uh, this essay in self and identity and then move into expertise. But here was a, a popular article I wrote on my second most popular article. Mystical approaches to the meaning of chess. What is the purpose of chess? Is chess more than just a game? These simple questions are actually quite difficult to answer, and there's no consensus among chess historians, scholars, coaches, or top players to its purpose. Global estimates are that one-fifth of humanity plays chess with small variations, being more or less popular in different regions. In the last 200 years, tournament chess has standardized the rules, the movements, names, and forms of the pieces. Competitive play focuses on determining and rewarding the best player. Pairings and rating systems were designed to pair players against each other based on level of play with the goal of figuring out who is the best. 
but is the goal of chess simply to win? This tournament plays main purpose to determine and reward the top player. Casual chess players may prefer their own conception with wide varieties of chess set styles found around the globe. Because the rules only focus on the way the pieces move and how the game ends, chess is symbolic, leaving one to conceptualize the meaning of chess pieces and goals of the game however one pleases. One is free to interpret the meaning as they wish as long as they follow the limited rule set of how the pieces move and what causes the game to end in a victory or draw. In this essay, I will examine the historical role of chess as a form of divination and representation of spiritual processes. Chess is a form of divination. The origins of chess are disputed among scholars with ancient precursor games and textual references all over the globe. It is beyond the scope of this essay to trace the history of chess, and I hope to return to a scholarly treatment of the history of chess in future essays. In this essay, I will exclusively examine the meaning and purposes attributed to chess. Most early variants of chess appear to have been a method of divination, the practice of seeking knowledge of the future or the unknown by supernatural forces. One early method of divination was dice, usually made of bone, often the bone of one's own ancestors. Dice with multiple sides could represent various choices a person can make, and the role of a dice, a method of contact and contacting supernatural forces to guide us in our decisions. Many early dice games are connected with ancestor worship, rituals designed to commemorate and venerate the spirits of one's dead, deceased forebears. Besides for venerating our ancestors, one may seek the counsel of our ancestors through dice and games, especially games of chance, where the chance outcome is interpreted to be communication from ancestral spirits. Using the bones of ancestors is an extreme form of divination and is unknown whether the first chess pieces were made of bones or at least played with dice made from bones. Whether or not the earliest forms of chess were a specific method of seeking counsel from our deceased ancestors, chess probably originally served as a form of divination. Games were not the only form of divination as people use shrines, sacred objects, pilgrimage sites, shamans, priests and priestesses, oracles, seances, mantras, and countless other methods to try to get guidance from higher forces or divine inspiration. But how did the game of chess help people with certain answers to their difficult questions or communicate with deceased ancestors and higher forces for help? One of the earliest known divination games with clear explanatory text is the Chinese I Ching, using sticks and patterns from which higher meaning can be deciphered. There are no similar ancient texts like the I Ching for chess, although we have many ancient artifacts and textual references to chess being used as a form of divination. In future essays, I hope to return to the available historical references and evidence, but in this essay, we'll focus on explaining how chess can be used as a form of divination. The purpose of chess as a form of divination was to help people understand what was likely to happen in the future and make the best available decisions to adapt. Chess was used as a method of divination through the symbolic interpretation of what the chess pieces and board represent. Most spiritual systems are dualistic in nature with a material realm and spiritual realm. Mind, soul, and higher forces are elements of the spiritual realm that interact, control, and influence the material realm. Various traditions and schools have different explanations and understandings of what consists of the spiritual realm and how spirit interacts with the material. As a form of divination, chess can represent the interaction of spiritual and material forces. Any dualistic system can be mapped onto the chessboard in pieces with various forces represented by the pieces and their positions on the board. Like the I Ching, meaning can be derived by the position and configuration of the pieces. One example is the capitalistic divisions of the faculties of man of the thought, speech, and action. The king and queen represent the faculty of action, the pieces the faculty of speech, and the pawns the faculty of thought. In Kabbalistic writings, thought, speech, and action are referred to as the garments of the soul, the method through which the spirit interfaces with the material. More complex Kabbalistic interpretations of chess parallel the pieces and their positions on the board to the four worlds and ten emanations, which is beyond the scope of this essay, but hope to go more in-depth in future essays. However, most historians agree chess originated in the East, and the Kabbalistic understandings of the meaning of chess is an adaption of earlier Dharmic traditions. Let's start with the most common and simpler Material version of chess is a method of divination. Dualistic systems with chess representing the interaction of spiritual and material realms can be significantly more complicated and difficult for people not used to understanding the mind in a separate spiritual realm. The most common symbolic depiction of chess is of opposing military forces like the Indian and Iranian precursor games Chaturanga and Shatraj. The pieces represent battalions and military leadership and their positions on the board battlefield arrangements. 
arrangements, the game representing war strategy. In earlier times, chess was not seen as a game of skill for people to demonstrate calculation ability, but a way to predict the future. The players represented opposing forces of group conflict, revealing what was likely to happen in future conflicts. As in the expression, we don't play chess, chess plays us. The two sides, often priests making the moves, were considered agents of higher forces or the group they represented. What happened in the game was viewed as a form of prophecy. In military forms of chess, the board and pieces could represent future battles, and the opposing players were oracles and fortune tellers that gave some special insight into the future. Chess was not understood as today a game testing mental abilities in preparation with the goal of determining who is smarter or superior player, but a form of divination about future events. The witnesses or sponsors of the event could base future decisions off the outcome. The understanding of chess applies even today. Many people who follow chess view players representative of groups, usually the nations they play for. The scale can vary from individual to group conflict. The chess game has meaning to spectators and participants for the predictions of what might happen should the parties enter conflict. The players may represent themselves, their larger groups, or just mercenaries for which they receive a small fee for their prophetic abilities. The conflict model of chess is the most common and straightforward interpretation of the meaning of chess. In a less violent take, the goal of chess is to help predict who will rise and fall from prominence. The historical analysis explains the tendencies among, tendency among chess fans and the wider public to understand chess players as representative of groups and the outcome of the game as an indication and insight into the rise and fall of leaders and like the outcome of future group conflict. Even though most chess players no longer believe the outcome is being guided by external spiritual forces, the tendency to interpret the outcome of larger issues can be understood as a modern form of divination. Chess is an inner spiritual struggle. On a deeper level, chess represents the struggle between the forces of good and evil, light over darkness, internal conflict, not group conflict. Metaphysically, the faculties available to us can be used for good or evil, and chess is representative in the internal battle for our hearts and minds. In Dharma traditions, the chess pieces can represent the powers of the soul, faculties of the mind, perception, and more in the battle for control over a person's decisions. Will a person act according to Dharma or give into the false ego? Can the conditions of the material realm and trappings of the mind be overcome? Chess is played as a game between two people, but representative of our internal struggles. The game is to be taught to kids as a method to teach them the laws of karma how to approach decisions in life, and to purify our thought processes. Self-improvement works best in groups because we all face similar internal struggles. Know thyself by playing chess. Chess helps us in the self-improvement process by being a window into our deepest desires and motivations that are revealed in play and can then be purified and prevent us from making future poor decisions. In various systems, the pieces can represent spiritual forces and the board physical locations and actions or the board and pieces can be a combination of spiritual and physical representations. One example is the Jain system of eight types of karma, the Ahimsa principle mentioned in my previous essay that can be mapped out onto the eight by eight board and pieces. Chess represents our eternal struggle against our own bad karma, the goal to overcome the false ego and limit suffering and achieve eventual liberation. As the expression, the eye see, the heart desires, the mind plots and the limb carries out. Chess represents the process of perception leading to desire to act, of which the mind develops a plan for the limbs to carry out. The purpose of chess is to represent karma, action, reaction, of the various ways we can react to our perceptions, desires, motivations, actions, and their consequences with goals such as limiting harm, ahimsa, and fulfilling our dharma duty. Today, chess is still most popularly used to teach children to think about the consequences of their actions, to think before they act. Most of the dharma traditions had a form of chess representing group conflict, helping plot are like the outcomes, but also a deeper understanding of chess representing the self-realization process, karma, and a way to purify our minds. Chess reinterpreted in the West. Chess historians agree that chess started in the East and migrated West through the Islamic Golden Age to the current form canonized in Europe. See George Dean's chess masterpieces, 1,000 years of extraordinary, extraordinary chess sets for a pictorial historical overview of how chess morphed into the form familiar today. Western mythology hypothesized the origins to King Solomon, a game of kings of biblical nature. Most players were unaware of the Eastern spiritual origins of chess. Chess became less a game of spirituality and internal transformation, focusing on the aspects of interpersonal or group struggle, the military nature switched more to a diplomatic nature, 
to help predict the rise and fall of personalities, kings and queens, even business interests. The pieces gradually shifted to be representative of the feudal system of Catholic Christian monarchs that dominated Europe. As the game of chess became more popular among the masses, the status of chess deteriorated into a simple gambling game. Early re Islamic rabbinic and Christian authorities in various locations and times forbade the game of chess for degenerating moral values and gambling. The Talmud debates whether people should be allowed to play chess, allowing it only as a better than being idle because it can sharpen the mind. Rabbi Maimonides ruled that professional chess players unworthy of serving in law courts, likely due to connections to gambling and fortune telling, and assigned the top chess players for, of the time were degenerates. Islamic authorities worried that playing chess would lead to sin and increase people's tendency to engage in forbidden activities such as substance abuse, telling lies, cheating, false oaths, and gambling. As chess traveled west, the original meaning was lost and started to develop a bad reputation. Jewish Interpretations of Chess Jews served as a conduit from east to west, and chess is a popular subject of early rabbinic poetry. Rabbis often used the game as a parable for deeper spiritual lessons, including the warnings of the dangers of sinful activity affiliated with the game. The Kuzari of Rabbi Yehuda Levi talks about chess as a game of kings and a metaphor for free will and decision making. These writings on chess and free will are an early precursor to Kotov's candidate moves and analysis trees and similar to early Dharmic conceptions. The focus of chess as an allegory to free will helped rehabilitate the game's deeper meanings of understanding karmic processes and each individual's personal struggle with life's choices. Later, rabbinic writings started recommending teaching chess to kids to sharpen their thinking skills and learn to contemplate the consequences of their action. Chess became so popular among Jews in Europe, it was codified in the High Holiday New Year's prayer service with the legends of Simeon bar Isaac and his estranged son Elkanon, who becomes Pope. When coming to make a request from the Pope, they played a game of chess and the Pope wins using a technique that the rabbi taught his son. From the unique chess combination, the rabbi recognizes that the Pope is in fact his long lost son. In the future essays, I hope to go more, much more into detail of Jewish history in chess and Kabbalistic conceptions. In many ways, chess served as an interface communication among Jews, Muslims, and Christians. Among the elite, chess was a game of diplomacy serving the original divination purpose, but to the masses, chess often deteriorated to just another gambling game. However, even in the degenerate form of chess, as a gambling game, the divination of future events and rise and fall of personalities can still be seen as the purpose. Another topic beyond the scope of this essay to return to in future essays is reincarnation in chess. In both Dharmic and Kabbalistic conceptions, one of the spiritual forces that can be deciphered from chess is the transmigration of souls. Common was the belief that great chess players were reincarnations of previous great personalities attempting to further their mission and struggles not yet completed from previous generations. Chess can be used to help people figure out our mission in life. In Kabbalistic terms, our Tegan Oilam, repair the world, the reason we are here, our greater mission that takes many lifetimes to accomplish. Rise of tournament and competitive chess. In 1851, Howard Staunton organized the first major international chess competition at the London Great Exhibition, the world's first, the first World's Fair. This led to the creation of tournament chess and a canonization of the rules, movements, names, and forms of the pieces of notation system. Competitive chess became a sport where the purpose became to bring the top players together to determine and reward the best, eventually leading to a world's championship. These pieces were standardized into the Western Christian feudal system we are familiar with today. Tournament chess operates without greater meaning other than competition. Competitors play to win purely based on the geometric patterns of the pieces, preparation, strategy, and mental skills. However, modern chess still retains the European system of Christian monarchs, consisting of a king with a cross, queen, bishops, knights, rooks, and pawns adapted to Christian Europe from the Eastern precursor forms of Chaturanga and Shatraj. Although some of the earliest chess work focused on strategy, till the advent of tournament chess, divination was the main role. Early authors focused on life lessons that can be learned from chess, using chess analogies to help explain spiritual lessons. Strategic ideas were generalized to a deeper understanding of the consequences of our actions and making better decisions in life than purely as a method to achieve victory over the board. After the rise of professional chess, less focus was put on the meaning of chess, but on winning strategy. Today, chess theory is almost exclusively dedicated to the best path to victory. These strategies are neutral in meaning, and a surprising majority of top players Today, insist chess has no meaning and is just a game or sport. Anyone talking about the deeper meanings of chess is unlikely a competitive player and laughed out of most serious chess clubs, ironically often relegated to coaching youth. Regardless of the symbolic nature remains, 
one can understand the meaning of the pieces and the purpose of the game as one pleases. The rise of cognitive science has switched the role of teaching chess to children more to general thinking skills than the historical role of karma, morals, and ethics to help children understand the consequences of their action. Chess in schools programs focuses more on mathematical reasoning than human reasoning. However, the majority of ca casual chess players and youth coaches still focus on the historical constant meaning of chess as a way to teach children basic thinking skills and help understand the consequences of our actions. The deeper meaning of chess remains open to all. Many spiritual leaders, such as the Lubavitch Rebbe, Rabbi Malcolm Mendel, share some blessed memory, frequently use chess metaphors to express spiritual concepts, words of inspiration, and examples of self-improvement process. In upcoming essays, I will go more into depth of the role of chess in Judaism and the historical role chess played in diplomacy and interfaith between Jews and Christians in Messianic theology. I will also further explore the Kabbalistic and Dharmic systems of how chess can represent the interaction between the material and spiritual worlds and help us in our self-improvement process to purify our hearts and minds and make optimal life decisions, minimizing harm and dealings with others. From there, we'll delve into the current research on chess expertise, intelligence, and decision-making from cognitive science and consciousness studies related to the predictive mind and how this all relates to my multiple truth hypothesis. So as mentioned, as I get further into my research, I will try, I will likely publish regular articles on chess because, um, you know, chess is a major part of my identity. So uh, this is my last essay. See, uh, back down to the type views of one of my first essays. I'm gonna close uh, the chess server there. But uh, you just see that I've been hosting these on the chess server. It's got a relatively uh, good uh, good site for blogging. So theories of self and identity formation. This is uh, the last essay I published a few weeks ago, and it was getting so long, got into seven pages. And uh, so I, I cut into part two, and just my notes for part two is already over 10 pages. So uh, it was looking good. Serious research has said if we move from here to expertise, expertise and uh, with that, I think I have serious research for two chapters like uh you know say I'm, I'm on the way to publishing my book on the multiple truth hypothesis so <coughs> pardon me <coughs> psychological theories of self and identity formation who am I? How did I become the person I am? What factors internal and external take part in the creation of our identities? How much control do we have in creating our own identity? In my last essay, I discussed spiritual meanings given to the game of chess and how chess can be used as a self-discovery method. Chess helps in the self-improvement process by being a window into our deepest desires and motivations, which are revealed in play and can then be purified and prevent us from making future poor decisions. Now I want to go deeper into understanding a self and identity from the perspective of psychology. Great thinkers of philosophy throughout history investigated the self, but major advancements came in the last 150 years with the advent of the field of psychology. Understanding of the self is crucial for the direction of my research into the field of expertise and consciousness, as well as practical applications of the self-improvement process. In this essay, I will briefly discuss Western philosophical precursors to understanding the self, the creation of the specialized field of psychology, early psychological theories of self, the cognitive revolution, and the modern field of cognitive science. Western philosophical precursors to the creation of the field of psychology. The Greek Stoics advocated for self-mastery, using self-control and logic to overcome the power of the passions. One of the three maxims inscribed on the Temple of Apollo Delphi was know thyself, a popular expression used by Socrates and many Greek schools. Plato understood a struggle between chaotic forces of desire and the unifying power of reason. Aristotle advocated the power of rational thought for self-mastery, recognizing the inner struggles versus the collective aims of the polis. A person can achieve the good life through self-knowledge. One's character can be refined to being moral by finding the golden mean between the extremes of excess and deficiency. Similarly, major traditions had understandings of the nature of self in a process for self-improvement, identifying the best 
character traits, and trying to correspond ourselves to an ideal behavior. Further advancement for the ancient Greeks on understanding Further advancements from the ancient Greeks on understanding the self was sparse till the Enlightenment over 1,500 years later. Through the modern era, the self was usually understood as immaterial in terms of the soul, psyche in Greek, and something unique about the person that controls the body and survives death. Till the rise of evolutionary psychology in the 19th century, the majority opinion was dualism, hypothesizing separate realms between mind and matter, usually with the self identified as the soul, a non-physical entity which survives death. The word personality, one of the few words derived from Etruscan, originally meant mask. As mentioned in the essay in Spiritual Interpretation of Chess, the Kabbalists referred to thought, speech, and action as the garments of the soul, like how the Greeks consider personality a mask of a person's true non-material self. In future essays, I will turn to the Vedic and Kabbalistic spiritual approaches to the self. Although most of the terms of modern philosophy and psychology derive from the Greek, the meanings of the words have changed over time with the change in understanding of the underlying concepts. The largest catalyst for the change was the application of the scientific method to philosophy, eventually leading to the creation of the subfield of psychology and specifically deal with scientific study of internal mental phenomena. Rene Descartes' dualist changed the emphasis to thinking processes in relationship to the mind and self, not just personality. In Meditations on First Philosophy, 1641, Descartes declares that the essential self is a thinking entity for Descartes' thinking self or soul is a non-material, immortal, conscious being dependent on the physical laws, independent of the physical laws of the universe. John Locke was the first philosopher, was one of the first philosophers to take an empirical approach to the self. In an essay concerning human understanding, 1694, Locke posited the mind is a tabula rasa, which is shaped by experience, with sensations and reflections as the two sources of all our ideas where Descartes posits self-reflection as a method to reveal the nature of self, Locke suggests one's self-conception constitutes the self. David Hume, in A Treatise of Human Nature, 1740, takes this further, suggesting there is no substantive self, using introspective awareness to show that the self is a non-substantive bundle of perceptions. According to Hume's bundle theory, an object consists of its properties, nothing more, including the self and personal identity, the application of the empirical method to mind, and the thinking process continued to advance the understanding of self. This empirical approach started making large advancements in the 19th century with advances in mathematics, science, and biological evolution. John Stuart Mill believed the human mind was open to scientific investigation, even if not exact. He proposed a mental chemistry in which elementary thoughts combined into ideas of greater complexity. Mill's mental chemistry is a precursor to my field of research, chunking theory, a process of cognitive psychology by which individuals, pieces of information are bound together into a meaningful whole. Using the scientific method on the output of mind leads led to the psychometrics movements. If we cannot directly measure the mind, we can measure the output of mind. Psychometrics is the scientific discipline concerned with the construction of assessment tools, measurement instruments, and formalized models that serve to connect observable phenomena to theoretical attributes. Early researchers like Gelton, Hemholtz, Fechner, Wundt, and Ebbinghaus measured sense perception and memory. Behaviors focused on measuring human physical behavior. As earlier philosophers used the empirical method of mind through introspection, the psychometricians' movement collected large amounts of data, measuring outputs of minds and the differences between people. Psychometrics reached its peak at the beginning of the 20th century with the creation of intelligence and personality test. Towards the end of the 19th century, with the rise of psychometrics and evolution, the field of psychology and sociology separated from the field of philosophy, creating the social sciences. The specialized field of psychology applied a scientific approach towards understanding mind, self, and identity. Ironically, the field of psychology from the Greek, the study of the soul, takes an empirical and materialistic approach to the workings of the mind and questions of self and identity. William Wundt and his student, Edward Tickener, created the structuralist approach to psychology, focusing on the study of structure of the mind and consciousness, using introspection as the main method. In response to structuralism, American psychologists advanced the functionalist approach to psychology, focusing on the purpose of the mind to an individual's use, in line with Darwinian evolutionary thinking. The 1889 World's Fair in Paris held a meeting of 400 leading psychologists, including William James. 
1890, William James published his influential Principles of Psychology. Although James is considered one of the founders of the functionist school, his approach is more middle of the road between functionalist and structuralism known as pragmatism. Approaches to self and identity parallel larger advancements in the field of psychology. This essay will focus on the psychological approach to self and identity, starting first with historical review and then an analysis of some of the main historical psychological theories of self and identity formation. William James was one of the first psycho psychologists to take systematic approach to self. James 1890 Principles of Psychology includes a chapter on the consciousness of self, emphasizing the continuity of mind and multiplicity of selves. One of the main roles of self plays is to provide a per person, a person continuity over one's lifetime, even though the self may change over time. James distinguishes between the I and me. The I represents the private, internal sense of self based on introspection, and the me is more empirical, representing the apparent visible identities that arouse a person uh, a response in others. The I is indivisible, a constellation of the entire confederacy of selves around unifying characteristics. The me can be divided into material, social, and spiritual selves. The material selves consist of what belongs to a person, such as the body, family, and possessions, as an extension of the self. The social self is who we are in specific social situations, changing our actions, thoughts, emotions, words, and mannerism based on the current social situation or people with whom we are interacting. This creates a plurality of self, which James famously says, there are as many social selves as there are individuals who recognize him. The social self is a selective industry of the mind. The spiritual self is who we are at our core, including our personality, values, and conscious, and typically remains relatively stable throughout our lifetime. Contemporary William James, James Mark Baldwin, took an interdisciplinary approach of biology, psychology, sociology, and philosophy, Darwinian evolution, Hegelian idealism, and dialectic to the development of self. Baldwin understood self to slowly grow in a social context and developed one of the first theories of identity forma formation, stressing the interdependence of individual and society. Another early related theory is Charles Horton Cooley's Looking Glass Self in Human Nature and the Social Order, 1902. Cooley describes three main components of the lo looking glass self. We imagine how we must appear to others in a social situation. We imagine and react to what we feel their judgment of the appearance must be, and we develop our sense of self and respond through these perceived judgments of others. Social interaction acts as a mirror or looking glass through which we help, through which we create our identity. Cooley and his colleagues at University of Chicago, George Herbert Mead, helped create symbolic interactionism. In Mind, Self, and Society, 1934, Mead hypothesized the emergence of mind and self from the communication process. Symbolic interactionism focuses on the development of self and the objectivity of the world within, social, within the social realm. Mead insisted the individual mind can exist only in relation to other minds with shared meanings. Like Baldwin, Mead considers the self as a social process, where a series of thoughts that go into the mind help formulate one's complete self. For Mead, the Mead is the social self, the I is the response to the me. Unlike James, the I is the response of an individual to the attitude of others, the self as subject, the me is the me, the self as object. The I is the knower, the me is the known. The mind, a stream of thought, is the self-reflected movements of the interaction between the I and me. James Cooley and Mead are part of the philosophical school of pragmatism, considering words and thoughts as tools best viewed in terms of the practical uses and successes. Another important early psychological thinker is Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis. In Freud's The Ego and Id, 1923, outlined his theory of the id, ego, and superego. That acts according to the pleasure principle, demanding immediate gratification, gratification in its need regardless of the external environment. The ego emerges to realistically meet the wishes and demands of the id in accordance with the outside rule, adhering to the reality principle. The superego is the conscious and inculcates moral judgment and societal rules upon the ego, forcing the demands of the id to be net, not only realistically but morally. According to Freud, the self is a function of the ego which negotiates comp compromises among conflicting forces of instinct, superego, society, and reality, creating a healthy adaption to life through the functions of learning, memory, perceptions, and synthesis. The self can be understood as functional, trying to meet the needs of the person within the constraints of society. 
as the field of psychology developed, behaviorism was still dominant into the 1950s, focusing more on stimuli and response than cognitive mechanisms. Behavior was conditions as demonstrated by Ivan Pavlov's famous experiments and research focused on methods of conditioning human behavior. James Watson was integral in establishing the psychological school of behaviorism, publishing Be Psychology as Behaviors Views It in 1913. Watson held that only physical events of motor behaviors of an individual can be objectively observed, acknowledging that thoughts and feelings exist, but are not part of the science of behavior. B.F. Skinner built on Watson, including private events such as thoughts and feelings as part of the science of behavior. However, Skinner held that internal events were also conditioned and controlled by environmental variables in the same way as observable behaviors. Skinner largely rejected the importance of self, arguing the phenomenon of self-awareness is produced in large part by those social contingencies that reinforce the organism's own behavior. For Skinner, self-knowledge is of social origin, and it is only when a person's private world becomes important to others that is made important to him. Behaviorism can be seen as a precursor to modern illuminist materialism. For behaviorist, self-concept serves as a function, purpose towards the goal of the organism. Thoughts and feelings are determined by conditioning, not cognitive processes. Another important school leading into the cognitive revolution is humanistic psychology, led by Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow, who popularized the idea of self-concept. Humanistic psychology adopted a holistic approach with special attention to the such phenomenon as creativity, free will, and positive human potential, viewing ourselves as a whole person greater than the sum of our parts. Maslow thought that Skinner and Freud were too deterministic and focused on mental conflict and negative traits rather than positive motivation. In a theory of human motivation, 1943, Maslow proposed a hierarchy of needs in the shape of a pyramid with the largest, most fundamental needs at the bottom. Individuals' most basic needs have to be met to enable a person to focus on higher level needs. Basic needs include physiological and safety needs, once met allowing one to focus on psychological needs uh, of belongingness and love, and then esteem needs. The highest needs at the top of the pyramid are self-fulfillment and self-actualization, achieving one's full potential, including creative activities. Carl Rogers developed a person-centered approach to psychotherapy, focusing on understanding personality and human relationships, seeking to facilitate a client's self-actualization, recognizing inbuilt proclivity towards growth and fulfillment. Concurrent with psychological developments in self and identity were theories of personality. As mentioned, personality is of Etruscan origin, meaning mask. For example, in the early Greek dramas where characters wore masks to exemplify certain character traits. In modern psychology, personality is a dynamic and organized set of characteristics possessed by an individual that uniquely influences their environment, cognition, emotions, motivations, and behaviors in various situations. Trait-based personality theories define personality as traits that predict an individual's behavior and behavioral-based approaches define personality through learning and habits, personality psychology examines personality and its variation among individuals. An early pioneer of trait theory was Gordon Alpert in Concepts of Trait and Personality, 1927. Alpert states traits and habits are habits possessed of social significance and become very predictable. Traits are a unit of personality and are the single most unique things about a person. Traits can be cardinal, central, or secondary. Cardinal traits are ruling passions, obsessions that are rare but dominate and shape a person's behavior. Central traits are basic building blocks that shape most of our behavior, but not as overwhelming as cardinal traits influence, but not determining behavior. Secondary traits are seen only in certain circumstances, such as particular likes and dislikes, and provide a complete picture of human complexity. Albert also had a theory of childhood development and personality. Another important early, important early theory of personality is Carl Jung's in Psychological Types, 1923, Jung proposed four main functions of consciousness, two perceiving functions of sensation and intuition, and two judging rational functions of thinking and feeling. These functions are modified by two main attitude types, extroversion and introversion. From three dualities with people inclined one way or the other, Jung described eight outstanding psychological types. In 1944, Myers and Briggs added another duality of judging and perceiving and created an early personality test with 16 major personality types. More widely accepted today are the big five personality traits initially advanced by Tuvis and uh, Crystal and 
1961. The five identified factors are openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Many psychologists develop theories of personality with later focus on personality formation. Studies and testing of personality traits show how they vary among the population and change over time. Cognitive revolution and a new era of psychology. Through the 1950s, behavioralism dominated psychology as behavior can be readily measured and well-defined as where internal thought is only accessible through introspection. The field of psychometrics has been testing the output of mind for 100 years by the time of the cognitive revolution in the late 1950s and 60s. Intelligence and personality tests were widely accepted and used by many institutions in the West. Leading psychologists had advanced theories of the self and identity formation, but a method to study the influence of the inner workings of the mind was unclear. The cognitive revolution refers to the creation of a new field of cognitive science using an interdisciplinary study of the mind and its processes. The main field that uni united to create cognitive science were psychology, linguistics, computer science, anthropology, neuroscience, and philosophy. Interdisciplinary studies were not new, as mentioned in my essay on critical theory in the Frankfurt schools. Advancement in computer science allowed a new direction in theories of mind not fully dependent on introspection and psychometrics. The Cognitive Revolution started at a Symposium of Information Theory in 1956, held at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where George Miller, Noam Chomsky, Alan Newell, and Herbert Simon presented papers on psychology, linguistics, and computer science. Miller, the father of chunking theory, with his article, The Magic Number 7 Plus or Minus 2, 1956, recalled leaving the symposium with a strong conviction, more intuitive than rational, that human experimental psychology, theoretical linguistics, and computer simulation of rational cognitive processes were all pieces of a larger whole and that the future would see progressive elaboration and coordination of their shared concerns. Noam Chomsky helped create the field of linguistics, advancing universal grammar, uh, proposing principles of the structure of a language are inherited and present in the mind from genetics. In review of B.F. Skinner's Verbal Psych Behavior, 1959, Noam Chomsky critiqued behavioralism. Defining psychology as the science of behavior was like defising, defining physics as the science of meter reading. If scientific psychology were to succeed, materialistic concepts would have to integrate and explain the behavioral data. Ellen Newell and Herbert Simons and Elements of a Theory of Human Problem Solving, 1958, used advances in information theory and computer science to reverse anthropomorphize problem-solving methods used by computers to the human mind. Multiple advancements in field, various fields changed the direction of psychology away from behaviorism to a greater focus on cognitive processes. With a new interdisciplinary approach, George Miller, together with Prebaum and Galanter, published Plans and Structures of Behavior 1960, reverse anthropomorphizing computer planning methods to the human mind and cognitive processes. They proposed all skilled actions based on a plan, defining a plan as a set of rules for ordering and reordering stimulus response relations. A new approach to mind was made possible by applying computational methods of computer science to the human mind. In 1960, George Miller, together with Jerome Bruner, an educational psychologist, founded the Center for Cognitive Study at Harvard to promote the studies of higher mental processes. In 1967, Erlich Niesner, sometimes referred to as the father of cognitive psychology, published Influential Cognitive Psychology. Niesner defined cognition to refer to all the processes by which the sensory input is transformed, reduced, elaborated, stored, recovered, and used. Cognition is concerned with these processes, even in the absent of stimulus, and is involved in everything that a human being might possibly do. Every psychological phenomenon is a cognitive phenomenon. The cognitive revolution and rise of cognitive psychology also changed the approach towards self and identity. In the future, I hope to dedicate a full essay to the cognitive revolution, as the cognitive revolution has a wide implications for many fields. Today, almost all fields use a method of interdisciplinary studies for the purpose of theories of self and identity formation. I will use the cognitive revolution to divide theories historically before and after the 1950s and divide my essay into part one up to the 1950s and part two picking up in the 1950s with the psychological advances of theories of self and identity formation with the influential theories of Eric Erickson through the modern era. Conclusion. With this background, we can have a stronger basis to answer the question of self and identity formation. 
The terminology can be confusing because many concepts are not well-defined and different philosophers and psychologists understand concepts differently or use terms interchangeably. Various philosophical presuppositions can imply different conclusions, leading to the creation of various schools of psychology. Higher levels of uncertainty due to the difficulty of directly measuring the mind allow for many models of self and identity formation. Advances in computer science created machines capable of performing complex computation that mirror human cognitive processes. This has allowed cognitive scientists to reverse anthropomorphize computer science processes onto the human mind and develop more complete models for the inner workings of the human mind. Better understandings of the brain and neuroscience allow us to correlate cognitive activity to brain activity. However, the essential problem of directly measuring the mind remains. Psychometric data is widely available with large amounts of data collected from cognitive processes and personality over a lifetime to correlate various theories of avail to available data or collect new data specific to new testing to testing new models. The higher problem of consciousness persists and the true nature of self remains elusive with many still clinging to the dualistic understandings of a material soul that survives death and others hopeful that new discoveries will show how the self arises from processes in the brain. Like critical theory in the Frankfurt School, psychology can be seen just as just a search for truth and to describe truth for the truth's own sake or a purpose-driven pursuit to change society. Understanding the self and identity formation is important for all aspects of our life, including successful interaction with our peers, development of expertise, the self-improvement process, and a well-functioning society. The self is central to cognitive processes, including expertise and mental phenomenon, as well as our identity and personality. In part two, I will bring us to from the cognitive revolution to the present with the major theories of self and identity formation, including narrative identity and the developments of neuroscience. I will then move into the developments of my field of research, consciousness and the science of expertise, with a goal of publishing a book on my multiple truth hypothesis. Okay, so there you go. There is all of my essays up to the current point. So not sure if, uh, Jennifer, if you're still there, maybe uh, you let me get a, a break in, and then I'll go over my notes. I got 14 pages of notes, although a lot of these are just definitions or um, 14 pages of note on identity for my next essay. And so hopefully I'm going to get this out by the end of next week. So I have a few more books I'm reading on identity. And uh, basically, I've covered most of the theories. And uh, it's probably going to be my longest essay it will be at least 10 pages. And it's already, you know, part two. So I said, like, this is all chapter in a book that I have on self and identity, just the historical review not even my own stuff or how the multiple truth hypothesis would apply to it. But, you know, I have a whole, you know, chapter, like uh, 15, 20 pages probably uh, on self and identity. And uh, so I'm going to put the link in the chat again. If someone wants to come on and uh, give me a chance to uh, rest my voice a few minutes, then we'll go over these notes. Uh, Tinkle will do it at multiple books on the multiple truth. I poss poss possibly let me worry about one first. And you know, do I prefer writing essays or going on YouTube? I, I think it's both. So if you're here, Jennifer, you're on. So I, I think you could just talk. Oh, I had to add her. Yeah, you just had to add me there. I dropped out before because, uh, you know, this. Uh... This app is really a resource hog. Is there something you, I can talk about in particular? Because I'm not sure what, uh, how I can. You want me well, to just talk to give the a, chat? Just a, a quick response to my first essay on self, and then we'll look at these notes. I just got to get a drink and stretch my legs a minute or two. So, uh, you know, I guess anything relevant to the topic of self or identity or the chat, I'll be back in a minute or two. Although I'm listening, I can hear you. Great. Well, I think it opens well. Um, I don't think there's really any 
definition given, unfortunately. So this is sort of the pro what I was uh, saying was the problem with self and writing about it is that uh, it's hard to define because then when, by the time you actually can define it, you have to sort of define something that presupposes it in a way that it's like, what does that mean? Like I, you know, I'm glad that you put this together. I just, and I think there's a lot of interesting stuff in it, but is this actually about the self? I would say it's more about a history and uh, getting close to a narrative but it's not really anywhere near a narrative because psychology comes into it in a way that is really unclear. You know, this is more just my due diligence and your know, multiple truth hypothesis. I'm going to be trying to say my own thing and sure. using it to analyze the data. So this is, you know, the historical analysis and the due diligence of, you know, a pretty exhaustive, uh, survey of the precursor ideas to my idea and the current ideas on the market so uh you know that that one just got me up to the 1950s and you know mentioning like self is many ways understood as consciousness and is only obtainable through introspection as opposed to identity is our social role, how we're presented or perceived by other people, so that uh, people don't have access into yourself, they have access to your identity, and self can only be measured through introspection, you know, possibly psychometrics, as where identity is uh, more factual. And, you know, so psychology, the first psychologist, as psychology was separating from philosophy focused on the self and then after eric erickson in the 1950s almost all the researchers on identity although still have like the word self-concept uh, self-esteem and uh so uh why don't i just start a lot of the stuff i covered i, I kind of organized it the first two pages i hear are just just definitions. I, I probably read through them pretty quickly, and then if you want to, uh, you know, comment just some like precursor definitions, and you know, they'll probably fit these into my essay. I just put them at the top of my notes. Uh, I had these interspersed. So over the last few weeks, I've been reading some of this on Week in Review, and so I've kind of put them together in my notes. Identity. Properties of sameness and distinction that link the interior world of psychological experience and exterior world of language and categorization, the self interior world of one's perception of it, consciousness. McAdams says identity is one aspect of self. Identity is how self is presented to the world. And the modern self, a reflective project that the individual works on, multi-layered, possessing inner depth, inner depth seeks temporal coherence so after identity theory in the 80s we call the you know the modern self is uh, you know like a project and we'll, uh, we'll look in depth about narrative identity we've talked about already psychosocial construction uh, constitutive meaning within culture culture's set of meanings belief and practices that guide the formation and maintenance of social institutions creation of social products and developments of its members Beliefs of nature of persons and ideal person. Identity politics. Self-understandings are linked to political forces that attempt to control and regulate persons' bodies and mind. Self-construal. Enduring characteristics, traits, and habits categorize a standalone individual and partners in relation to a collective, central, important, and central. Identity motives. Tendency towards certain identity states and and uh, which guide process of identity definition and enactment, identity processes, exploration, commitment, meaning-making, self-evaluation motives, accuracy, valence, and consistency, 
six self motives self esteem, distinctiveness, continuity, belongingness, efficacy, and meaning, self enhance, normative self aggrandizement, memory selectivity, partisan reasoning, triad motives, uh, positive illusions, own merits, level of personal control, future prospects, self handicapping, discounting, um, self evaluative maintenance model, self esteem, self esteem contingency, base billing of self worth on external sources such as performance outcomes, acceptance, achievement, self-esteem, discrepancy, implicit, explicit, automatic, non-conscious, learn through repeated association over time, threat detection, defense strategies. So these were kind of random. Most of these are connected to theories. If you want to hop on also, Sammy, you can. Um, the link's in the, in the chat. Um, as I mentioned, like, there's tens of thousands of paper on psychology. You could attach hundreds of different words to identity and self. You like self-esteem, self-knowledge, self-concept, uh, self-efficacy. Uh, and all of those are fields of study within psychology and also in like terms of identity. There's hundreds of words that are attached to identity, uh, identity formation, identity. Um, and, and uh, there's studies and theories around what they mean and like what's a comprehensive theory of self. We'll look at a few of the main theories. So like the, the, I said, the comprehensive theory of self is more in lines with a theory of mind and consciousness as where identity is a social, uh, is a psychosocial construction. And so psychology focuses more on identity than self and self is still somewhat more around it's part of psychology but more philosophy so here self-determination theory um motivations intrinsic and extrinsic and personality within social context concerned with relative assimilation of goals values and identity identities we wear differ from being forced onto us by contingencies of our social context Growth-oriented tendency, alignment with self, self-innate natural processes guide one towards more integrated and optimal function. So th these are all random things. You're going to have to look up more and organize. Like maybe I'll mention in my paper, maybe I won't. There's definitely a few more important ones that are, are going to be, be put in. Self-comparison, aspiration level, highest level of function a person believes is possible. So a perceived level where one believes they presently stand in relation to interest. Objective level, actual standing. Tolerance level, lowest point one can accept with regard to interest before engaging in strategies to advance towards acceptable level. Temporal comparisons, past and present statuses, possible future selves, intrapersonal, intrapersonal comparisons. Self-worth, contingency of self-worth is a domain of category of outcomes in which self-esteem is staked. Self-esteem depends on perceived successes, failures, or adherences to self-standards, and that domain contingency of self-worth increases uh, motivation, but uh, create self-esteem vulnerability, uh, a trade-off. Your self-esteem is based on other things that uh, you could lose self-esteem if those things aren't met. Self-protection, managing potential threat, negative feedback avoidance, strategic information search, bracing for negative out outcomes, defense mechanism, self-verify, develop self-conformity to social environment, selectivity, interaction, identity cues, creating allies, interpersonal prompts, biased information processing, strategic, uh, self-consistency, a theory of personality, lackey, 1945. I don't have anything on that. So th those were kind of just random things I had towards the beginning. Um, so now I have more major theories and, you know, possibly... I think it's great to put that list at the beginning. Because even though you're probably never going to use that in your actual final thing, it just helps. Like, did you find it helped organize your thoughts a little bit in terms of perceiving definitions like as connected entities? Yeah, so I, I have to find my narrative arc for how I'm going to write it. And, you know, I have to have, like, you know, the hero's journey, the I that worked hard to gather this information that's presenting it to others. And... Uh, than the bulk of the information. So, uh, you know, right, you know, but it's so much I have to work on kind of like a flow chart. So uh, 
you know, some of those may I might include or might not. Um, you know, as we're now, you know, so these are some of the major theories that uh, you know I'll probably cover in depth. So the social identity theory. So social identity, individuals' knowledge of belonging to certain social groups with some emotional value significance. Social identity theory of uh, Tejfel, distinction between collective self, social identity, which is associated with group membership, group processes, and intergroup behavior, and the individual self, personal identity, which is associated with close personal relationships and idiosyncratic attitudes of person, commonalities among people within group and differences between other groups, in-group bias and categorization, those aspects of individual self-image that derive from social categories where he perceives himself belonging associated with positive negative value connotations. Uh, Tashville's theory focuses on intergroup competition and social chance, uh, social change as consequence of identity-related behavior, experiences of we compared to experiences of me. So the, it's elements of group identity. So there's self-identity and then there's group identity and social identity is based on what groups you're part of so tajbel got for is a holocaust survivor and he focuses on like in groups and out groups and uh, so there's a concept of depersonalization viewing one as having attributes of a category interchangeable what does it mean to have a trait in personality in a sense that if you have a character trait for that aspect, you're interchangeable with someone else who has the same character trait. Or if you're part of a group, you're depersonalized in the way that relative to expectancy of behavior, that group members are interchangeable with the others, that the expected behavior from one member of the group is the same to other members. And that also applies to traits in general, that uh, if a trait is predictive of behavior, then someone who has the same trait um, could be interchangeable with someone else. So Tajville has self-categorization theory. Social identity is part of a self-concept corresponding to knowledge of group membership and value and emotional significance of membership, normative designed to explain social change. So Turner advances on Teichville's theories, self-categorization theory, many selves for many contexts, identity salience, why and when a particular self becomes relevant, personal and group identity as different levels of self-categorization, stereotypes, unlike self-identity theory, not just about out-group, but the self and in-group, where intergroup dimension becomes salient, depersonalization, interchangeability of salient category and stereotypical dimensions, Turner focuses on cognitive processes that create a collective sense of self-making possible group-level phenomenon, such as social stereotyping, group cohesiveness, ethnocentrism, cooperism, cooperation, and altruism, emotional contagion, and empathy, collective action, shared norms, and social influence processes. Taijil focuses on intergroup, uh, which complements Turner, which is intragroup. Depersonalization produces intragroup behavior, produce production of we, collected of identification. Um, and there's another symbolic interactionism, which I mentioned in my first essay, Mead and Bloom. Uh, the core self out of stable meanings give relative stability to personality, continuity to interaction, predictability to behavior, uh, creativity and behavior, core self and role-taking processes and self-control. Barry... I really I should have put these uh, up top with the other definitions. Barry, acculturation, assimilation, separation, integration, marginalization, cultural shedding, cultural distance, and cultural confusion. So, uh, so these are somewhat out of order, so I, I didn't have enough time to order it. So the, they're just kind of main ideas that are going to go into the essay that these are basically the mainstream psychological theories on identity. Eric Erickson is really the first person to use the word identity and the switch from self to identities in the 1950s. And uh, he talks identity crisis and role confusion, stages of life formation, first use of identity theory, eight steps, crisis commitment of uh, eight different stages of uh, 
so to say, identity crisis, uh, it's psychosocial commitment in relationship to context perceived by world, continuous interaction between person and context, identities and agreement between person and world at stake in every interaction. So Erickson wrote Identity Formation, 1950, process and outcome of human development, the identity is identity configuration, integrates constituent parts of multiple identifications into single identity, identity synthesis, reworking of childhood identifications of larger and self-determined set of ideals, values, and goals, identity confusion, inability to develop a workable set of goals on which to base adult identity. Here's some quotes, Erickson, 1963, identity is a configuration of the self that integrates a person's talents, identifications, and roles such that a person comes to feel and accrue confidence that the inner sameness and con continuity prepared in the past are matched by the sameness and continuity of one's meaning for others. 1958, identity rises from the selective repudiation and integration of childhood identifications and their absorption into a new configuration, which in turn is dependent on the process by which society identifies the young individual, recognizes him as someone who had to become the way he is, and who, being the way he is, is taken for granted. 1963, Erickson wrote Psychosocial Theory. In 1966, Marcia Identity Status Paradigm, which is uh, what I was mentioning last week in review, is uh, one of the mainstream understandings of identity formation built on Erickson. Um, and it's an empirical study uh, that has been many longitudinal studies of identity where they've uh, studied tens of thousands of people in various locations throughout their whole lifetimes, questionnaires. Um, and he has identity status theory, which has achievement, moratorium, foreclosure, and diffusion of the two elements of exploration and commitment. Exploration is a period of rethinking, sorting through, trying out various roles and life plans, commitment, degree of personal investment, individuals expressed in course of action and belief. And so achievement is constructed, explored, moratorium, struggling for commitment from between alternatives, prelude to achievement, foreclosures conferred, not explored, diffusions, no commitment or exploration. So basically the different uses of exploration and commitment is the identity status of uh, where you are in the exploration and commitment uh, process. Bandura has self-efficacy theory, 1977, towards unifying theory behavioral change, self-efficacy beliefs about ability to organize and execute the course of action required to produce given attainments, what we can do with competencies under challenging circumstances, competencies are quality and range of the cognitive construction, behavior enactments of which an individual is capable, ability to construct diverse behaviors under appropriate conditions. Goffman, 1963, theory of stigma, 1959, dramatical theory of self-presentation. Um, the, the self is presented. Um, impression management, we mentioned this on Week in Review, goal-directed activity of controlling information in order to influence the impressions formed by an audience. Self-presentation, how people try to shape the attitudes and behaviors of an audience through the presentation of self-relevant information. Automatic processes, outside conscious awareness in familiar and secure situations. The controlled, requiring effort, draining, inconsistent qualities with self-image and personal characteristics. Ego identity, subjective sense of one's own situation, own continuity. Social identity linked to social role and status and informs interaction with people and groups. Personal identity, aspects of biography that are shared or available in social interaction, product of intentional self-presentation, three paths to identi identity, social definition of roles, statuses, and category, individual self-presented biography, subjective sense of self. So this was Goffman's idea of the self as a, like, like an actor of presentation. Uh, Jones, 1964, self-presentation conforms to a target performance when dependent on target audience for desired outcome. It said Proteus is the Greek God takes whatever forms and qualities life situation demands. So these notes are pretty haphazard because there, there's not really a unified theory of self or identity. There's a whole bunch of like mini theories and they're all useful. So that's, you know, when I put the essay together, I'll have to, you 
create like, my own. Think business. about it. What's the agreed upon framework to refer to this thing that we agree we can't refer to? There isn't a framework. So you're, that's why I sort of, I applaud that you're trying. I do think you're going to create something good and worthwhile, but uh, as far as reaching the goal, it's a big, it's a big one. Well, so I, for my essay, I'm going to systematize it. So that's why it's so complicated because that's what I'm a, saying is like, how do you systematize something that exists on that level of ambiguity? Um, well, the multiple truth hypothesis. So, um, I mean, the multiple truth hypothesis okay. would just be demonstrated by my ability to write an essay on this, and you know, for and you know, just to give a review of the main theories in a systematic, uh, uh, organized fashion. So there's multiple ways to systematize it, you know, chronologically, uh, topic wise. And, uh, you know, like I, I've read like now at this point, like 20 books, like they're like over 10,000 pages on the, on these topics. Like there's, uh, and, and there's really more and more. And, uh, you know, so I'm only on page four of the notes. So, uh, let me keep on going. This stuff's pretty interesting now. Role identity theory, 1966, McCall and Simons. Intentional action to achieve some end. Character and role, the individual devises an occupant of a particular social position. Role identity, character and role that an individual devises for himself as an occupant of a particular social position. Individuals carry out the broad dictates of social positions, role reflected by the me, but do so with improvisions and flourishes that make the role performance expressive of personal character and idiosyncrasies, identity reflecting the I. Allowing considerable latitude for creativity, individualized performance, people organize multiple role identities in hierarchy that reflects ideal self. Prominence of any one role depends on reward value, situational role identities, intricacies of obtaining role identity support, from alters who are also attempting to sustain their own valued role identities, working compromises must be negotiated between egos and alters. So I mentioned Proteus, the Greek god that takes whatever forms and qualities life situation demands. So a role could be specifically just between two people, and it's basically saying anytime you're dealing with another, you're you're playing a role. So like uh, James quote that there's uh, there's as many selves as there are people that recognize them. So people develop roles, and it's a psychosocial process where the person you're interacting with is also trying to play a role. And so your acceptance of the other person's role is mutually negotiated. And, uh, and you know, then there's social structures. So, you know, looking back to, like, the Marx, uh, Marx material dialectic, where he's taking social structures as a given, um, you know, like here... With uh, you know, like, like T jump or, or the guy quantum, focusing on a product of mind. So social structures have to arise from you know the, the materialistic uh, psychological structure as joint products of mind, and uh, so this next theory is even more interesting in terms of uh, you know probably what me and Jennifer have been talking about quite a bit. Um, and you know, so this was based on Mead, earlier symbolic interactionism, but Stryker, 1963, structural symbolic interactionism, choices people make in situations in which they have the possibility of an active alternate alternative. Role related actions self-cognitions and internalized role expectations attached to positions. Society shapes self, which in turn shapes social interaction. Self mediates processes. Agency meets I maintained through concept of identity, commitment, and role choices in specific interactions. Symbols provide a share view of the world, providing names and objects and categories relevant to social interaction, along with names Symbols provide shared meanings, responses for objects and categories, forming a basic expectation for behavior of others, forming ongoing patterns of interaction, social structure, validation, and reinforcement. So in the same way that language um, 
is negotiated. They say behavior expectations are negotiated and that forms roles and roles expe expectancies. So Stryker's social identities, 1982, reflexively applied cognitions in the form of answers to the questions, who am I? Identity answers refer to positions and organized structures of relationships which are attached sets of behavioral expectations of roles. Stryker's primary goal is to build social structure into symbolic interactionist explanations of the self-structure, identity commitment, in terms of the number of social ties and effective importance of the social ties upon which each identity is predicated, uh, commitment hierarchy, higher in commitment hierarchy, more stable identity, identity salience, probability of invoking a particular identity across a variety of situations, higher the salience of a particular identity, more time and effort invested in enactment, more dependent self-esteem on that identity, more identity performance will reflect shared values and norms. So these two, role identity theory and structural symbolic interaction are very interesting and uh, you look at it kind of like a chunking theory of social structures and how mind creates society. And, and you know, just like language is a inexact negotiation of shared meanings that social structures are based on an inexact shared understanding of behavior expectancies. And those, you know, we'll refer to as roles and the more behavior expectancies lead to larger organizations and social structures. So I, th I thought that was pretty interesting. And so, you know, I have to think about how to, you know, put that into the essay and then for future research. I'm not sure if uh, you find those theories interesting. What I find interesting is anything that can be systematized. And so something like this, I would be looking at it as like who basically defined a term the most coherently out of the bunch. Um, but I admit that's like a physics, very much. A, it may not apply so much to this endeavor, which is why it's so interesting to be a witness to this process. Okay, identity exploration, growth event, 1987, problem-solving behavior aimed at eliciting information about oneself and one's environment in order to make a decision about an important life choice. Um, five steps, initial expectations and belief that guide exploration process, hypothesis testing, and behavior conducted by individual, degree of energy, effective investment in existing commitments, degree to which competing alternatives are judged attractive or presence of counterbalancing factors, that discourage further exploration. Interim evaluation of one's progress is a way of determining whether further exploration is necessary. Identity control theory, Kerperman, 1997, target microprocesses that drive exploratory and identity development. It's exploration of depth, introspective mechanisms, gathering internal and external information, or various identity alternatives, taking, talking with others to evaluate commitments. Identification with commitment, degree of security and certainty experience with regard to one's existing commitments and how well these commitments fit with one's own standards and wishes. Identity style paradigm, Brzezinski, 1989, information processing, information style, self-reflection, seek out broad information on strengths and limitations of alternative identity options, show strong commitment only once choice is made, normative style, selective and in information they seek, Primary focus on social norms, what's expected of them by significant others. Diffuse avoidance styles, avoid identity decisions. Don't seek out information, lack of any commitments, prefer to take things as is. So these would be data collected that demonstrate personality types that, uh, you know, there, there's large longitudinal studies. Some of these have studied tens of thousands of people over their whole lifetime. And, uh, you know, like the personality traits where we see the personality is stable over a lifetime. And so a lot of these theories have been semi well tested and uh, at least psychometrically where they've measured huge amounts of people in different places over their life lifetimes to see different, uh, you know, styles of identity formation or approaches to identity formation. 
So then at 1980. I don't know if you want to answer the question in the chat. I doubt it. Um, it's about how MTH relates to consensus reality. That sounds just a bit too vague to field right now, but I thought I'd give you the option. MTH is a method. It could be, it could relate to anything. It's more a method. I mean, so I mean, you could call it a theory, but like a method. So even saying just apply that, like MTH could be applied to anything. And MTH largely doesn't apply to a single issue. MTH applies to comparing multiple issues. So like if it's just, how does MTH apply to one theory? It doesn't necessarily apply to one theory. It applies to uh, comparing and contrasting multiple theories. Dennett used a, you know, the self as a center of narrative gravity. So Dennett of the heart problem, uh, no, that's Chalmers. Dennett, uh, another main theory in consciousness, also has theories of narrative identity. So we talk quite a bit about this. It's going to be a big part of the essay. Um, so McAdams, one of the main people in narrative identity, identity as a product identity itself might be conceived as an internal story or personal myth that a person begins to formulate in the late adolescence years, internalized and evolving tale with main characters, intersecting plots, key scenes, and imagine endings representing how the person reconstructs the personal past, anticipates the future. I, me, I represents processes of internal, a personal narrative construction. Me represents personal narrative as an object of product. Theme, goal-directed sequences, agency, characters, episodes, clearly defined person by choices, ideology, life story, function to provide a sense of unity, purpose, and coherence with tone, imagery, structure, form, thematic content, causal roles, and normative roles, plausibility, and coherent. Big stories, continuity, coherence, provide understanding and meaning, understanding similarities and differences with others in social context. Small stories, who one is at current moment in associated context, understand motives of others in current events, uh, taking or avoiding responsibility within context. Ideological setting, evolve with a person over time and place. Possible identities, future self, part of self-concept, focused on self one might become, working theories of who one may become based on current assessment of one's own strength, weaknesses, talents, and characteristics, assessment of possibilities for people like oneself, future-oriented perspective provides an evaluated context for making sense of present and motivating and incentivizes future-oriented action, amended, reviewed, and dropped depending on affordances and restraint. Master narrative, shared cultural stories, that organize people's lives and guides their meaning-making experience, self-defining memories, affect content specifically, and meaning makers. Um, so I'll have to reorder this later. Ethnic identity, culture of origin associated with specific cultural values, attitudes, and behaviors, component of overall identity of uh, varies in salience across individuals. Finney, adding to Erickson Marcia, exploration increases one's understanding and exposure. Resolution or commitment sense of understanding what individual's group membership means to them and extends play important role, affirmation, uh, social identity theory, positive or negative feelings about ethnic group membership, their prejudice, group conflict, realistic uh, conf uh, conflict theory, intergroup attitudes reflect relationship conflict between groups, material interest, relative deprivation theory emphasizes subjects of value and disadvantaged group comparison, social dominance theory assumes societies are structured as group-based hierarchies that distinguish between dominant subordinate groups, individual level, um, and institutional mechanisms mentally reinforcing each other, produce and sustain group-based social hierarchy dominance, asymmetric effect, denial of recognition, uh, theory of genocide, moshman, dichotomization of identity, force that process, dichotomization of identities, dehumanization of other, destruction of other, and then denial to preserve a subjective moral identity. So I mean, if we reorganize these, I'll print this out, and then I'll organize this uh, a little bit better than the subject, and then I'll probably be able to start writing. So I have a few more books I'm going to read. I'll add a few more pages to my notes, and then I'll organize my notes and that will basically be an outline for me to start writing. So hopefully by the end of the next week, uh, by next week in review, I'll have uh, uh, I would say not this week by the, by not this week in review, but the one after, 
I'll have the essay ready because it's a really quite a bit. So we discussed this was pretty interesting. Um, and a lot of these overlap. So these are like competitive theories of identity from different theoreticians. And a lot of these have been tested in longitudinal studies and have uh, empirical support that they're informative or, you know, correlate to uh, various things. Um, so the eudemaic identity theory, self-discovery, somewhat based on Aristotle, discover personal potentials, changing one's purpose in life, finding opportunities. Um, you know, from the Eric and Marcia self-construction, selection from among array of possibilities, particular elements deemed valuable. So hedone, like hedonism, is belief one is getting important things one wants and certain ple pleasant effects, as opposed to eudemaism, which is like fulfilling of the potential. The diamond in the Greek means the true self, self-realization. Another word, like entelechy, uh, Maslow, 1968, self-actualization, ongoing actualization of potentials, capacities, talent, fulfillment of mission, fuller knowledge of accepting a person's intrinsic value, uh, nature, unity, integration, synergy with a person. Uh, Maslow, 1968, peak experience, most intense choice, moment of life, at one with self. So eudemaic theory flows, goes into the theory of expertise because uh, eudemaic identity theory is based on the self-fulfillment. And so self-fulfillment is like a maximization of potential and has to do with expertise. So we've talked about flow. Uh, it's a Hungarian name. Sika, you know, merge. So flow, 1990, a famous book. We've talked about a few times and we can review. Merging action and awareness, clear goals, feedback, concentration at take, task at hand, loss of self-consciousness. Transformation of sense of time, feeling of control, situation with objective risk, consistent predicator of flow, situations with high level of challenge to which a person has a high level of existing skill. So eudemaic identity theory uh, flows right into um, theories of expertise. Waterman, 2011, four steps, identify one's best potential, dedicating effort to developing potentials and to actual skills and explicit values, identify goals to which skills should be directed, identify opportunities afforded within social context. Steps require active eye, making decisions and taking actions. Potentials are latent, implicit aspects of me, not automatic recognitions, external agents. So this Aristotelian understanding of eudema eudemaism and like the happy life of recognizing one's intrinsic potentials and fulfilling them is also a current theory of identity that's most related to theories of expertise. So here it was deliberate practice, Erickson, different Erickson, Andres Erickson, the expertise expert. Um, practice alone, activity rated very high on relevance for performance, high in effort and comparative low on inherent enjoyment. And then Chase and Simon, 1973, Chunking Theory of the 10-Year Rule, 10,000 Hours, Any Skill Task Result of Vast Amounts of Knowledge and Pattern-Based Retrieval Acquired Over Many Years of Experience in the Associated Domain, uh, DeGroote, uh, 1946, Pattern-Based Retrieval, Bloom, 1985, uh, Universal Progression to Expertise, Several Stages for Development of International Level Performance, Child Play, Recognition of Talent, Regular Practice and Coaching, Major Commitment, Master Teachers, mastered what elite coaches have to teach, to search for own innovative contribution to field. Um, I mentioned 1964 EPAM, elementary perception and memory. So this eudemaic theory related to Maslow uh, hierarchy of needs is interesting because from this understanding that you fulfill your purpose by maximizing your potential, and that's by developing expertise of what you have natural proclivity for. So it's that's a you know interesting theory related. You know, say the expertise is related to a theory of identity, which I've been mentioning. We can review now for a few weeks now. I'm sure, if you have any comments, I'm just listening in for the time being. Okay, so I'll keep keep on pounding away. Get get this through. Been over four hours now, so try to wrap it up. It's down to a handful of viewers. Block 1971, variable and personal centered approaches, variable concepts or variables, 
unity theory, construction, and statistical analysis, interchangeability between people and homogeneous population, uh, person, individual dynamic systems of interwoven components, whole system approach, ergodicity. So this is implying to, to research methods of personality. So if personality traits are true, then people with the same personality traits should be interchangeable. So like obviously me and Jennifer are very different people, but if we have a same character trait that would be predictive of a certain behavior, you could predict that me or Jennifer would act the same in that given situation. And so it's important for research methods and uh, verification of theories. Relational self, Chen Boucher, 2006. Self-knowledge linked to memory of Sid Nickman and others. They say this, that self is like a reflection of your relations to others, that you don't really have a self, you have a relational self. Self-knowledge linked to memory of significant others, multiple levels of specificity, can be contextually or chronologically activated, comprised of self-concept and self-aspects, motives, regulation, strategy that characterize self when relating to significant others, self within relationships, transfers of aspects of past relations, ships, resurfaces, encounters with new others, mental representations stored in memory, activated in encounters with new persons, expectation, acceptance, or rejection, self-discrepancy, aware of actual ideal ought selves of significant others, attachment theory. So all these theories are going to move into like chunking in the predictive mind and saying that self is like a form of chunking, either on an in interpersonal level where a person forms their self or where self is formed through social interactions and uh, like the schematic understanding of chunking theory where interactions cause people to have schemas and these schemas form predictable ways that people interact like uh, role identity theory. Uh, but as we move you know, closer to the modern era, some of these will be able to be tested with neuroscience and theories like the predictive mind. Discourse and identity construction. There's three essential dilemmas. Agency control. I is the subject who constructs the world or the me is an undergo undergoer that's constructed by the world. Difference and sameness, me and others. Uh, so you know, am I different or am I the same? These are three uh, dichotomies. Constancy change, same in face of constant change. Diagnostic identity theory, great meaning within context of social world, contextual to unique social situation. Postmodern social construction theory, new technology interconnectedness. So more recent theories on the postmodern self where like social identity is connected through relationship through the internet and technology as opposed to uh, historical social structures. Rawls is political theory, uh, political identity. Theory of justice, individuals secure own conception of good. Korsgaard, um, Kant's imperative, source of normativity, morality rises from reflective self, consciousness, integrity comes from unified self. A recor is a, another important thinker, a more related political thought. And hermeneutics, some, uh, like the role of language, semantics in action, chronological succession to causality, time and narrative, action, structural, symbolic, temporal. Aristotle defines narration as an imitation of action. So record 1999, imputation, designate the act of holding an agent responsible for actions which themselves are considered to be permissible or not. Life plans, moving back and forth between far off ideals made precise, way advantages and disadvantages, vulnerable others, Entity assigned to agent care, summons to responsibility, the I who has been called upon. So the difference of uh, you know, like the moral self, the ethical self, the, the self in relation to uh, your politics and society. It mentioned the body image on last week in review. I'll skip that, uh, but you know, just other aspects of the self, you know, it's like the material identity. Um, McAdams, personality, narrative perspective, dynamics, and, per and developing system, 
biologically and culturally shaped three distinct levels of functioning, dispositional traits, characteristic adaption, and narrative identity. Um, this might be similar to, I think, Alpert's uh, personality in the 1920s. Dispositional traits, basic traits are stable dispositional differences in pattern of thought, feeling, and behavior. The big five, uh, you know, mainly of the dispositional traits like extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism, and openness that permeate all aspects of a personal situation. Characteristic adaption, the doing side of personality, motives, goals, plans, strategies, values, virtues, schemas, self-images, mental representations of significant others, developmental tasks, motivation, social, cognitive, and developmental concerns. Level one basic traits, transcendent of context. Level two manifested within specific roles, contexts, and domains in which identity becomes invested through process of exploration and commitment. And level three is the narrative identity fully emerged and task of lifelong narrating a coherent, meaningful self defining a life story. And the autobiographical reasoning process of thinking about the personal past that involves arguments that link distant elements of one's life to each other and to the self and attempt to relate the present self to one's personal past and future. For the Habermas, Erickson, individual versus belonging, psychosocial identity, synchronous self sameness versus flexible adaptions to situational requirements, self sameness versus change, agency, feeling at home in one's body, self esteem, identity diffusion, not being, not belonging or being no one special, clumsily not adapting to situational demands or changing from situation to situation, being frozen in time, depression, or feeling disconnected from one's past, feeling helpless and controlled, living in a strange body, being worthless. Uh, McIntyre, 1981, the explicit link, unity of life to a narrative quality quest for good life, prototypical narrative plot, like uh, you to make theory. Uh, record, 1992, sameness, prime instance, keeping one's word, past self who gave word and present self who kept word, narrative links, permanence of character between present narrator and past protagonist, for whose action narrator is res responsible. Gap between action and responsible narrator creates self-sameness, self-continuity. Uh, Locke and James, role of memory creating self-continuity. James, sameness in me, not I. Khan, uh, Clay Dellen Pierce, 2000, hierarchical nested autobiographical knowledge base with motivational states and personal goals. Select and distort personal memory to render consistent with personal goals to increase personal sameness in time. Conceptual self consisting of convictions about stable traits of self and future self. Conceptually self linked and self defining memories, typical of central concerns and conflicts of individuals. Highly stable core emotional relationship patterns of an individual, stable or instability of material self. Role transition, role lost, instability of social relations and environment. Exemplifications, Schutze 1984, persuades listener of a general claim by providing specific instances, personality, substantiated evaluations of people, extended time periods. Lynn 1993, a simulation of specific episodes in the lasting personality trait, not me event linking past, present comparison, uh, parallels between specific episodes and other episodes, formative influence, link specific episode to lasting aspect of personality, events causing personality change, biographical background consequence, Reevaluation life circumstances, the not me event, where you know person I acted out of out of line with my normal character, and I could prove that by you know this is just a one time occurrence as opposed to uh, you know the narration of many different instances where I didn't act like that. Um, trait themes, embodying narration, relational position, I mean, uh, past apathy, ident uh, a question of narrative identity. Identity is a problem that needs to be solved. Identity needed for meaningful relation bonds. Narration rare. Autobiography really maintains bonds despite substantial personal change, making life story into identity not enough for identity. Uh, trait themes. Interpersonal relational orientation with narrator's identity. Body there and then narrated by body here and now. Emotions evoking connecting narrator must provide sufficient time, place, and participant context. So actually, narrative identity has been tested in terms of psychometric taking uh, narrations, uh, longitudinal studies of many people over long periods of time. I've said on the spiritual level, we have a 
that's like a uh, karmatic if there's a factual recording of everything I ever did, said, thought, all the desires of my heart. So if there's factually you had all of the information from the moment I was born till today, uh, you know, till I die, all of uh, everything I ever thought, said, did, uh, desired, emotion I ever had, um, versus the weave narrative, and and even the question of personality traits, whether you could, uh, whether there is such a thing as a personality trait, if you took you know the, over a whole person's life to say that uh, you know there was consistencies of personality, um, and so narrative identity. Uh, to say that identity is formed by trying to create this continuity that, you know, the earlier lack people talked about continuity of self, um, that it's done through forming a narration internally, who I think I am, and then the stories that we tell and, you know, the roles. Uh, so you know, it's pretty interesting, a lot of information here. Um, just a few more. Did, anything you want to say real quick? No, it's all good. I'm just uh, listening in and looking forward to it. the conclusion. Yeah, I appreciate helping my research. I mean, just you see how much information there here. This year, uh, you know, I said I'll organize my notes and and uh, put the stuff that belongs together together, and then hopefully by the beginning of next week, I'll have it organized where I could start actually writing. You know, once I have my notes uh, structured, well, I'm happy to do it for sure. I think. Uh, it's an awesome opportunity to uh, to do this kind of stuff because it's not just writing; it's it's a lot more, you know. Yeah, I mean, the writing is just that the final product. But I'm mean, saying, you know, the research, and then you know, taking notes from the research, and then organizing the notes and putting a structure to it. And once that's done, the writing is actually kind of easy. But that's why it's taken so long because really there's so much information just to organize. It doesn't it. actually work like that with all domains. Like what I study, even though if I understand it very well, it still takes a very long time to be able to write about it because the knowledge is not in the form of words. So that probably won't be much part of what you know we talk about. But I do think that there's types of things that just can't be expressed in words and that's important to mention. So family, Lewin 1951, group one dynamic whole, different from some of members, it's dynamic importance, interdependence, and connectedness to one another, field theory relationship between parts and whole. So Lewin examined the family one well, of the first uh, you know, is basically a small group. Post Lewin dissatisfaction with the family is a small group, two main difference, functional dimension, uh, the efficiency and productivity development of its members, the development a family as entity unto itself in the temporal division, unlike most groups, short term families, past, present, and future. Family systems theory family as a whole, irreducible features and exist only when its components interact with subsystems or in the relational symbolic models. Kigolian Scabia, 2006. Distinctive characteristics both of family as a system and subsystems, organization, family organized system with internal hierarchy that permeates its relationships, particularly intergenerational relationships. The family relationship, the primary, binds people together over time, even without awareness, refers to what has been established explicitly or implicit uh, with regard to values, meanings, rituals, and role assignment, interaction, ordinary exchange between family members, family identity, true nature, family potential, legalizations would represent the best fulfillment it is capable of, symbolic dimension, qualities make family bond properly human, the function well, Erickson, uh, family dimension of trust and hope, relational, symbolic, effective, and ethical, identity belonging to a specific family, and specific role identity in different family subsystems. A mutual differentiation process, dialectic process of individuals and families freeing themselves from each other and remaining emotionally related. So, it said, uh, according to James, family identity is part of material identity, uh, the, uh, the material self, as opposed to the social self. Occupational identity, clear, stable, and coherent picture of one's career goals, interests, and abilities. Holland, 1985, personal environment fit theory. Adolescence, increasing differentiated among preferred activities, interests, 
competency and values, Erickson Marcian identity status dealing with salient identity issues characterized by exploration and decision making crisis and personal investment and commitment achievement strong commitment to self chosen occupational goals and value acquired through occupation and exploration. Um, according to Erickson, uh, your career formation is one of the largest aspects of adult identity. 2007, Shorkov and Vondrick, qualitative and quantitative change in the structure and form of identification with the role of a worker that occurs as the result of the interaction between the epigenetic unfolding of the person's capabilities and learning through self-chooses and socially assigned vocational, educational, leisure activities, the occupational identity influenced by relevant significant relations and societal norm, expectations, economic and technological chains, intrinsic and extrinsic motivations, occupational identities, agency control over career development, principal cognitive structural controls, assimilation and integration of self and occupational knowledge allows logical and systematic career decisions. Social identity theory, uh, Tajpil and Turner, um, individual knowledge of belonging to certain social groups together with some emotional value significance group membership, group membership internalized, fundamental contribution to sense of self, self-categorization, self-member class category, stimuli, depersonalization, um, self-perceived categorically interchangeable of group uh, in-group members. I mentioned that earlier, but that, you, that could all be applied to work identity. Material identity is enabling achieved identity, acquisition, ownership, and consumption of material goods, like James calls possessions an extension of the material self. Work identity, Mortimer, role identity and self-conception, anticipating, learning, and carrying out behaviors oriented toward fulfillment of role expectations are usually accompanied by shifts in identity such that one's very self-concept becomes linked to role. Identity reference character traits linked to role-related behavior. Occupation identity, conscious awareness of oneself as a worker, represents complex structure of meanings which individual links motivation and competencies with acceptable career role. As where a job has a lack of long-term perspective and sense of uniqueness along with passive adoption of ascribed identity, a career marked by active construction of occupational identity and focus on long-term career prospects and occupational success. Uh, striker, we mentioned struct symbolic structural identity, identity salience, hierarchy of identities, role identities supported by greater commitment, rise in hierarchy of identities, commitment increases, identity salience enhanced, behavior choices increasingly privileged role-related enactments, constellation of work-related character traits, interest, abilities, groups, and values. So earlier mentioned social group identity theories related just to work and occupation. We discussed this last uh, we can review development intervention, positive youth development um, of, uh, so maybe I'll skip this part because we talked about this just uh, last week in review about uh, organizations and trying to change identity formation by interacting within the environment. Um, moral identity, we also discussed that. Um, well, this is more relevant. So moral identity, constructive intersection of moral development and moral identity formation, source of moral motivation, linking moral reasoning to behavior. So cognitive development theory, Kohlberg, 1969, moral reasoning capacity to make judgments about whether certain actions are right and wrong, needs moderators and mediators of links between moral reasoning and action. Moral identity involves salience of morality into people's identity hierarchy. Character perspectives, personological trait-like individual differences and degree to which morality is central to one's identity and unified with one's personal values and goals. Blasi self-model, 1983, gap between understanding and action. Three components link understanding to action. Judgment of responsibility, action is seen as moral but necessary of an individual. Moral identity criteria stem from structure of self. Individual differences, self-consistent desire to live consistently with self-concept. Identity formation, further Blasi, based on Erickson, ego development. People differ both in terms of issues around which we base identity, identity content, and which we subjectively experience our identity, identity structure. Identity matures more based on internal psychological content than external. Colby and Dannon, 1992, moral identity unity between self and moral goals. Moral commitments not seen as self-denial because self is defined with moral central. 
center. Carl and Staub, moral identity is altruistic personality. Altruistic personality is set of other oriented tendencies or traits, such as empathy, social responsibility, and moral reasoning, which motivate pro-social behaviors and mitigate antisocial behaviors. Narrative moral identity, McAdams Pratt, essence of moral identity may be extent to which moral themes woven through fabric of self-narrative. Social cognitive perspective, Mandora 1986, personality dynamic systems of cognitive affective processes that interact with situational influence. Moral expertise, Navarez and Lapas, 2005, with chunking. Moral identity as a chronically accessible moral schemas. Accessibility of moral schemas allow individuals to be more sensitive to moral aspects of situations and to interpret and respond to situations more quickly in light of moral commitments. Moral identity as self-important social identity, social self-schema relation to group-based and role-based identity um, from Marcia's status paradigm to moral identity. Values, says Schwartz, 2004, mentioned we can review. 10 universal values in terms of motivational goals. Um, they vary among people, but they say that all peoples tend to recognize these 10 universal values. Achievement, hedonism, stimulation, self-direction, universalism, benevolence, conformity, tradition, security, and power. Spirituality is mostly recognized but wasn't universal. Values situated in moral space are cognitive emotional frameworks underlying self-perception and social interaction. Stable properties that allow conceptualizations of self as unified yet situationally enacted with space for change across life course. Symbolic tool that reinforce our experience of coherence across social and group identities as well as social situations. Values are empirically measurable potential to measure moral self over time, moral value consistencies, and more outlet shaped feelings, perceptions, and action with interactions and as cognitive emotional signposts in novel situations, repeated observations or actions and consequences contribute to narrative self understanding that in turn frames future situations. Taylor, 1994, values are hyper goods, meta-analytical schemata for adjudicating about social reality, way we decide which of two goods is best. So quite a bit of work has said like a... Um, so appreciate Jennifer sticking through this and helping with my research. So hopefully, you know, I said I'm going to a few more books to read and uh, um, and then I'll start structuring my notes. And then from there, I'll probably be able to start writing. So hopefully um, by the week in review, the, the, by the, towards the end of next week, I'll start getting this essay out. So... Uh, Thank God I read all my essays from the very first one on the um, the hero's journey of music. And, uh, you know, see there, I have a lot of diverse interests, a lot of things that interest me. Um, you know, writing is an important skill. So as I improve my writing, you know, hopefully I'll be able to write more on various topics. And, if, you know, as we see the multiple truth hypothesis, uh, at least for my book, Full Formation, there's still a lot of research. So just as I said, the main like fields of physics, math, logic, hard problem consciousness, self identity. Um, this is really a lot of research, but uh, you know, if I'm nearing, um, you know, chunking theory expertise. But uh, you know, a few months, you know, say so I'm nearing the end of uh, my research into self and identity, so I could see that uh, you know maybe. You know, said towards the end of next year, I'll be able to have my book out on multiple truth hypothesis, and uh, you know that uh, you know so the the work is slowly paying off, and uh, you know so appreciate Jennifer for encouraging me and uh, doing week in review, and uh, you know to all, anyone viewing, watching, following my research, uh, you know reach out, comment, happy to uh, um, you know discuss, and as I get this more worked out and better. Hopefully it'll be a little bit easier to put out regular essays that, uh, you know, there has to be a due diligence of research. And, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to get through this difficult phase right now of, uh, you know, the really exhaustive due diligence in my research. So I guess with that, the stream is going to almost be 
five hours. So I'll let Jennifer say any closing remarks and then probably wrap it up. I'm glad you're not discouraged by uh, the scope of the topic. Um, do you have any future essays you're, uh, you've picked out topics for? Well, I'm just looking at my previous essays and all the things I said I was going to write about in future essays. Um, in terms of the work on the multiple truth hypothesis, the roadmap is, you know, this essay on self and identity. And I could probably do more essays on this if there's interest, but uh, it didn't get that many views, the first one. So it's more just due diligence for my research. Then I'm going to move into expertise. Um, once I do expertise, I think I could pump out essays probably as quickly, you know, like one a week if I wanted to, related to chess. So, I, you know, this is this essay is kind of just tough work and due diligence in order that I could move into expertise because expertise has to be grounded somewhere. And expertise, you know, say it's grounded in theories of identity and so once I do the due diligence on, on theories of expertise, expertise is also connected to motivation. So I might do separately theories of motivation and theories of expertise. Um, what about something on uh, consensus? Like consensus theories? I'm not even sure that. I mean, for scientific consensus or, or for group theory or for... I'm just more thinking what's on the menu for consensus building. Like uh, engineering, what do they call it? Uh, you mean like consensus of experts or, or no, uh, paradigm? Um, not quite, no, like more uh, along the lines of uh, manufacturing consent, but more broadly. Um, well, I'm focusing on, I'm writing essays that will eventually help my publication of my multiple truth hypothesis. So that it's, it's a rather narrow. So if there's demand, like a value proposition, like people are actually going to read it or it's related to things I'm doing in my life, uh, you know, to help organize my thought, like I might write an essay on any topic. Um, but as of now, I don't have anything on the horizon. Like I could go back to stuff I said I was going to write about like in terms of uh, um, you know music, but I, I think I'm, I'm I'm trying like I said that I'm, you know in term, for the multiple truth hypothesis, I'm expertise is in chunk you know chunking theory, so I, I got to get from expertise, which will include uh, chunking theory, and I think once I do that, I'll be able to write regular essays related to chess, which will probably have a narrow audience, but considering my biggest audience is on the chess server, that's probably a good thing. Well, your latest one on chess, Mystical Approaches, has over 5,000 views. And the one on the self and identity doesn't even have 300 views. It's uh, 226. So I don't know if that's what well, you're yeah, publishing. This... You're posting it on a chess server. So, like, obviously that. Well, but I mean, then the Himsa one got, what, like, the Himsa one's up to 7,700 views already, so. Yeah, I mean, on Twitter, it only got like 15 views. So my, my last one on Twitter only got like 15 views. So I mean, this like, is I don't even know why you're putting that as a can like as the number of people. Like I wouldn't consider the number of people reading something to be that important. But well, I was saying if I have an audience, I'll write for my audience. So if I'm just doing, you know, really, I'm just writing for myself and my own research and due diligence and, and I'm not really getting any feedback and no one's really, uh, you know, glad that I'm writing it. Um, you know, so I have what I'm doing to, for my multiple, you know, saying to write a book. Well, I'm glad that you're doing it because I think that you have something to contribute to the world through your memory technique. And you're not the first person I've encouraged to do something like this. So, so I didn't get much. Are you saying you need more encouragement? Well, I mean, I need positive feedback. So if I don't get positive okay. feedback, I'm unlikely. To, I'm not going to write for nobody. So if I'm writing, well, really, my, the way that I'm sort of framing it is for you to become 
theoretically better version of yourself by getting the practice of uh, writing and thinking about your ideas in new ways. But you're saying that you care about how many people read your stuff. And it's like, well, it's hard for me to relate to that because I don't I really don't care how many people read my stuff. I consider a success like if there's a chance that there was something learned, that's a success, you know. 500 anti me comments on an evolution debate that's a success you know and well, you're saying right you want a positive you want positive feedback because that's and part of that is the number of people reading the the essay uh, i'm saying like writing is a public service so it's not a public service if there's no demand for it so saying i would do a public service if there was demand i would write on basically any topic if there was demand for me to do a public service, I would do the public service. So just like, oh, why don't you write on this topic? Is like, because like it's not interesting to me, and it's not no, and it's not interesting to anybody else. So it's a, uh, um, so it's like, no, I'm not going to write on it. So that's it's fine. Like, I'm just saying, if something is interesting to you and not anybody else, that's enough of a reason to write about it. That's all. And if you don't see it that way, that's cool. I just need to know. You know, I can give you better, so I, I mean, better if you don't coaching. Understand what I know I'm saying, your motivations better. Yeah, I'm saying that I'm to develop the multiple truth hypothesis. I'm doing continuing research. I'm going to write on these topics, regardless of any anyone finds it interesting or not, because it's you know part of my research. I'm sharing my research. It's specifically related to the development of the multiple truth hypothesis, and so there's different fields of that. And I'm saying that. I'm moving in from there. I'm going to move into the science of expertise and I'll be doing a lot of writing on chess. And likely I, I, I predict I'll have a audience for that on the chess server and maybe on my YouTube. And from there I'll do regular releases on expertise. Separate from that, I may write, Occasional something else is, although I'm not sure. Like if I if I research something, or you know, like maybe like the next Science of Conscious conference, or uh, but you know, in terms of like the hero's journey in music, I, I'm like I could try doing more of that, but I'm not sure. Like I, like you're saying, there's no demand for it uh, because writing is a whole bunch of work. So you know, research something and write about it, and if I it, I don't think it's particularly beneficial to myself and uh, no one else is finding it beneficial. I'm probably not going to do it. And so outside of the research for the multiple truth hypothesis and the science of expertise, as of now, I don't see anything in the near future that I plan on writing on. Um, you know, I, the Hinduism, Vedic concepts of psychology, I probably also, you could, I mean, because the Himsa guy gets so much positive feedback. It's interesting. I'm studying it. And if I get positive feedback, I'll publish articles. Yeah, I was just um, going to yeah. say, like, I don't see, there's no reason not to basically go through every single one of the uh, of the virtues. Because there's two sets of virtues, the restraints and the positive. So Ahimsa is a restraint. But you could go through all of them in theory. I mean, I don't know if that will be interesting enough to have a full essay on, but. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to write an essay for anything that there's not demand for. I, mean, I, I studied things. I meant, I meant it based on the previous success of your Ahimsa article that other articles in the same vein might be equally successful. Yes, yeah, so I mean, I'll see. I'll look into possibly once I finish on self concurrently with uh, the research on uh, expertise because uh, that, that might take longer than I mean, like, it might be like a whole month. You know, like expertise is a pretty big topic and it might you know and end up being like like this where i just have like tens of pages of notes of various theories although it might might i might uh try to just put out uh um so concurrently with that i'll probably do some research into vedic psychology and maybe you know try because the expertise might take longer it, it might end up like the self where, where there's really uh you know like just so many different theories and it's going to be hard to uh formulate or, or to put I'd be happy out. to talk about Ayurveda um, and from what I've learned in that I do have a textbook I've got tons of disparate stuff for psychology and that I've collected over the years from books but uh, yeah that would be fun yeah, I mean I mean it's basically all work and no pay so uh, to me that's my idea of fun because bringing uh, well, I, mean, I do but I was saying, like, is extremely uh, 
beneficial sometimes. Why well, I, I don't understand. I don't do it expecting them to be popular because if people have no idea what something is and then I put I say hey here have a look at this and they don't recognize it they're probably not gonna appreciate well, I it. I put this stream out, but I said like yeah, I mean, my my time is limited, and uh, you know so it's all work and no pay. And, uh, you know, this is what, what I spend my free time doing. So I'm putting it out there. I'm hoping to get some sort of uh, positive feedback. And even I get no positive feedback and negative feedback. I'll, I'll, well, one I'll, thing that would be I'll, helpful I'll for Duvid that it. I can't do, I cannot help Duvid with the music stuff. So if somebody else can step in there, that would be great. Because I'm basically just zero anything to do with music. I, I Past saying, oh, that sounded kind of cool. That's all. I can. I can't go into that. Doesn't interest stuff. me enough without positive feedback. I'm saying this. This stuff on the self and interests me enough with, without positive feedback. I would be doing it anyways. The stuff on music, if it's not interesting to anybody else, it's not interesting enough to me that I would put it out for myself. Like that, I, I would you know make stream or write about it. If it's not interesting to other people, so it's saying like I'm not. Um, I don't mind just. You know, time is limited. Just this is a, you know, a huge amount of time. So, uh, you know, I put it out there. I included it. I read it at the beginning. It's something of interest. We still talk about a week in review. But, uh, yeah, so uh, many of these things, it will be dependent on positive feedback. So if there's other people finding this interesting, you know, reach out. Let me know. And, uh, you know, try to make more content. Otherwise, I probably won't make more content. <laughs> All this stuff. All right, good to know, and uh, thanks for the show. Just shy of five hours. Nice. Okay, yeah, thanks for joining, and uh, we'll see you Sunday for uh, week in review. And keep it keep it going. You're saying, uh, you know, like looking uh, forward to it. Hopefully, uh, you know, maybe also, uh, um. You know, work on some of Jennifer's theories and putting them out as essays as she formulates some stuff that, uh, and, and even uh, publishable, you know, to uh, like a scientific quality, like her stuff on panpsychism or some of her other things. That uh, I think once once the writing process goes, gets going, that uh, you know, maybe we could, uh, you know, try to turn those into essays. And then the goal, you know, say I want to write a book, but to publish. Uh, scientific papers i was looking online you know i was driving with my parents and we're kind of like oh what happened with this person and this person and uh, like childhood friends and uh, this guy like a chess friend he went to mit as a kid i hadn't seen for 20 years and my mom you know mentioned no oh, whatever happened to him and like i don't know i haven't you know, even thought of him since the last time my mom mentioned him like 10 years ago and so i i looked up and i saw that uh you know, he graduated MIT and then got, uh, then went to Harvard for his MBA, and he has 300 patents and uh, you know, data, some sort of data, data structures, or something like that. But uh, you know, that he, that he has over 300 patents, and so, you know, like I'm a, I'm a gold-driven person, so, you know, like if it, if it was like publishing papers or scientific quality stuff, if we could get ourselves up to that level. Um, you know, like that, 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 that was also one of the goals we work on a week in review. Like, I want to publish a book on multiple truth hypothesis. And it's a Jennifer, you know, everyone's like, you got to publish, you got to publish. So, if she's not driven on that goal, but, uh, you know, when we work together, we would joint publish a paper. So, that's also something possibly in the near future that we could uh, try to get one of her ideas up to uh, par to, uh, you know, look into, uh, you know, you know, published paper, and that's why I, you know, look in this my my uh, high school chess buddy, uh, you know, like has three hundred patents. I'm not sure if he published three hundred papers with three hundred patents, mm. but you know, he probably you know whatever he got, he was a smart guy. He got the process down, and then he just kept on doing it. So you know, he's doing multi, you know, he's doing tens of them every year. That would be absolutely wonderful. And I said that you know, one of the doctor in my local synagogue published over 200 papers, you know, head of gastroenterology department at the hospital. And, you know, he just publishes a paper every few weeks. Um, even that guy from Amy Newman, who uh, was down on you, 
was down on us, said, there's no way either one of us will ever publish anything. Um, you know, he's published 10, you know, I don't know, he said 12 papers or something. And uh, his expert opinion was that we will fail, but uh, you know, keep at it anyways. Okay, yeah. so thanks for joining, and I'll see you Sunday. See you then.